The Perfect Matrimony The Doorway to Initiation Samuel Aun Weor Get the PDF version of this book from gnosisdr.com Copyright Today and forever, my dear brethren, I renounce, I have renounced and I will continue to renounce the copyright. The only thing that I want is that these books can be sold inexpensively, accessible to the poor, accessible to all those who suffer and cry. May the happiest citizen manage to get this book with the few cents that he has in his pocket. That is all. Samuel Aun Weor Pronouncement in the Congress of Guadalajara, Mexico October 29, 1976 Introduction I have written this book for the few. I say for the few because many people do not accept it, comprehend it, or want it. When the first edition of The Perfect Matrimony came out, it produced great enthusiasm among students of all schools, lodges, religions, orders, sects, and esoteric societies. The outcome of that enthusiasm was the formation of the Gnostic movement. This movement began with a few comprehensive people and became completely international. Many students of occultism studied this book, few comprehended it. Many of them, enthusiastic with the enchanting theme of the perfect matrimony, joined the ranks of the Gnostic movement. Those who did not leave the Gnostic movement can be counted on the fingers of one hand. Many swore loyalty before the altar of Gnosis. However, in reality, almost all violated their sworn oaths. Some seemed to be true apostles, which even made it seem a sacrilege to doubt them. Nevertheless, in the long run we had to realize with infinite pain that they were also traitors. Often, reading a book or listening to a new lecturer who had just arrived in the city was enough for these false brethren to withdraw from the Gnostic movement. Therefore, in this battle for the new age of Aquarius, which began on February 4, 1962, between 2 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we had to learn that the abyss is filled with sincerely mistaken people who have very good intentions. Perfect matrimony and the cosmic Christ constitute the synthesis of all religions, schools, orders, sects, lodges, yogas, etc. Indeed, it is unfortunate that so many who discovered the practical synthesis have left it to fall into the intricate labyrinth of theories. Tradition has it that in the center of the labyrinth there was a synthesis, that is to say, the labries of the temple. Etymologically, the word labyrinth originates from the word labyrinthus. The latter is a double-edged axe, a symbol of the masculine and feminine sexual forces. Indeed, whoever finds the synthesis commits the greatest foolishness when he leaves the center and returns to the complicated corridors of all the theories that form the labyrinth of the mind. Christ and sexual magic represent religious synthesis. If we make a comparative study of religions, we will discover fallacism at the essence of all schools, religions, and esoteric sects. Let's remember Peristera, the nymph of Venus' court, who was transformed into a dove by love. Let's remember the virtuous Venus. Let's remember the processions of the god Priapus from the august ancient Rome of the Caesars when the priestesses of the temple, filled with ecstasy, majestically carried an enormous phallus made out of sacred wood. With just reason, Freud, founder of psychoanalysis, said that religions have a sexual origin. The mysteries of fire are contained within the perfect matrimony. All fire cults are absolutely sexual. The Vestals were true priestesses of love. With them, chaste priests reached adepthood. It is unfortunate that modern Vestals, nuns, do not know the key of sexual magic. It is unfortunate that the priests of this day and age have forgotten the secret key of sex. We feel profound pain when we see so many yogis ignoring the supreme key of yoga, sexual magic the supreme synthesis of all yoga systems. People are filled with horror when they hear about sexual magic. However, they are not filled with horror when they give in to all kinds of sexual cruelty and carnal passion. In this book, dear reader, you have the synthesis of all religions, schools, and sects. Our doctrine is the doctrine of the synthesis. Powerful civilizations and grandiose mysteries existed within the profound night of the centuries. Then, the priestesses of love were never absent from the temples. 
those who became masters of the White Lodge practiced sexual magic with them. The master must be born within us by means of sexual magic. In the sunny land of Kem, there in the ancient Egypt of the pharaohs, whoever made the great arcanum, sexual magic, public was condemned to death. His head was cut off, his heart was torn out, and his ashes were tossed to the four winds. In the land of the Aztecs, men and women who aspired to become adepts caressed each other, loved each other, and practiced sexual magic for long periods of time within the courtyards of the temples. Whoever spilled the cup of Hermes during these temple practices was beheaded for having profaned the temple. All systems of intimate self-education have sexual magic as their ultimate practical synthesis. Every religion, every esoteric cult, has as its synthesis sexual magic, the arcana a zeta f. Naked dancing and ineffable things existed within the Eleusinian mysteries. Sexual magic was the fundamental basis of those mysteries. At that time, no one thought of perversities because sex was profoundly venerated. Initiates know the third logos works within sex. We have written this book with complete clarity. We have unveiled what was veiled. Now, whoever wants to self-realize in depth can rightly do so. Behold, here is the guide. Here is the complete teaching. I have already been harassed, humiliated, slandered, persecuted, etc., for teaching the path of the perfect matrimony. This does not matter to me. At first, treason and slander hurt me a great deal. However, I have now become like steel. Hence, treason and slander no longer hurt me. I know all too well that humanity hates the truth and mortally hates the prophets. Therefore, it is normal that they hate me for having written this book. We aspire towards only one thing, only one goal, only one objective, Christification. It is necessary for each human being to Christify himself. It is necessary to incarnate the Christ. In this book we have lifted the veil of the Christic mysteries. We have explained what the Christic principle is. We have invited all human beings to follow the path of the perfect matrimony in order to attain Christification. We have explained that Christ is not an individual but rather a universal, cosmic, and impersonal principle, which must be assimilated by each human being through sexual magic. Naturally, fanatics are scandalized by all of this. Yet, the truth is the truth, and we have to say it even if it may cost us our lives. The teachings of the Zend Avesta contain the Christ principle and are in accordance with the doctrinal principles contained in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The Iliad of Homer, the Hebrew Bible, the Germanic Edda, and the Sibylline books of the Romans contain the same Christ principle. All these are sufficient in order to demonstrate that Christ precedes Jesus of Nazareth. Christ is not one single individual. Christ is a cosmic principle that we must assimilate within our own physical, psychic, somatic, and spiritual nature through sexual magic. Among the Persians, Christ is Ormuz, Ahura Mazda, the terrible enemy of Ahriman, Satan, which we carry within. Among the Hindus, Krishna is Christ, and the Gospel of Krishna is very similar to that of Jesus of Nazareth. Among the Egyptians, Christ is Osiris, and whoever incarnated him was in fact an Osirified one. Among the Chinese, the cosmic Christ is Fu Shi, who composed the I Ching, the Book of Laws and appointed dragon ministers. Among the Greeks, Christ is called Zeus, Jupiter, father of the gods. Among the Aztecs, Christ is Quetzalcoatl, the Mexican Christ. In the Germanic Edda, Baldur is the Christ who was assassinated by Hoda, god of war, with an arrow made from a twig of mistletoe, etc., we can cite the cosmic Christ within thousands of ancient texts and old traditions which hail millions of years before Jesus. This invites us to accept that Christ is a cosmic principle contained within the essential principles of all religions. Truly, only one unique and cosmic religion exists. This religion assumes different forms according to the times and needs of humanity. Therefore, Religious conflicts are an absurdity because in essence all religions are only modifications of the universal cosmic religion. From this point of view, we affirm that this book is not against any religion, school, or system of thought. The only objective of this book is to give humanity a key, 
a sexual secret, a key with which every living being may assimilate the Christ principle contained within the essence of all the great religions of the world. We recognize Jesus, Jesus, Zeus, Jupiter, as the new Superman who totally assimilated the Christ principle and in fact became a God-man. We believe we should imitate him. He was a complete man, a true man in the fullest sense of the word, yet through sexual magic he managed to completely assimilate the universal cosmic Christ principle. Those few who are very comprehensive must study the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. There the devotee of the perfect matrimony will find pure and legitimate sexual magic as taught by Jesus. Obviously, the teaching is in code but the person who is knowledgeable will understand it intuitively. Modern humanity has committed the mistake of separating the great master Jesus from all his predecessors who, like him, also Christified themselves. This is what has damaged this present humanity. We need to increasingly comprehend that all religions are only one religion. Mary, mother of Jesus, is the same as Isis, Juno, Demeter, Ceres, Maya, etc., the cosmic mother or Kundalini, sexual fire, from whom the cosmic Christ is always born. Mary Magdalene is the same as Salambo, Matris, Ishtar, Astarte, Aphrodite, and Venus with whom we must practice sexual magic in order to awaken the fire. The martyrs, saints, Virgins, angels, and cherubim are the same gods, demigods, titans, goddesses, sylphs, cyclops, and messengers of the gods from pagan mythology. All the religious principles of Christianity are pagan, and when the present religious forms disappear, their principles will be assimilated by the new religious forms of the future. It is necessary to comprehend what the Immaculate Conceptions are. It is necessary to know that only with the perfect matrimony is Christ born within a human being's heart. It is urgent to awaken the fire of the Kundalini, or fire of the Holy Spirit, in order to incarnate the Christ. Whoever awakens the Kundalini transforms himself, like Ganymede, into the eagle of the Spirit in order to soar to Olympus and serve as cupbearer for the ineffable gods. It is lamentable that Catholic priests have destroyed so many documents and so many valuable treasures of antiquity. Fortunately, they could not destroy them all. During the Renaissance, some marvelous books were discovered by brave priests. Thus, despite the persecutions of the clergy, Dante Alighieri, Boccaccio, Petrarch, Erasmus, etc., were able to translate famous books like Homer's The Iliad and the Odyssey, true books of occult science and sexual magic. They also translated the Aeneid of Virgil, the Agony, and works and days of Hesiod, the Metamorphoses of Ovid, and other writings of Lucretius, Horace, Tibullus, Titus Livy Tacitus, Apuleius, Cicero, etc. All of this is pure Gnosticism. It is really unfortunate how some ignorant people abandon Gnosis in order to follow systems and methods that ignore sexual magic and perfect matrimony. We have investigated all the great Gnostic treasures, and we have delved into the basis of all the archaic religions. We have found the supreme key of sexual magic at the base of all cults. Now we deliver this treasure, this key, to this suffering humanity. Many will read this book but few will comprehend it. This is exclusively a book about sexual magic. Those who are accustomed to reading thousands of books out of pure intellectual curiosity will assuredly miss the opportunity to study this book in depth. It is not enough to race through reading this book. Those who think like that are mistaken. It is necessary to profoundly study this book and to totally comprehend it not only with the intellect but in all levels of the mind. The intellect is only a small fraction of the mind. The intellect is not the whole mind. The one who only comprehends this book with the intellect has not comprehended it. Only with internal meditation is it possible to comprehend it in all levels of the mind. It is urgent to practice sexual magic in order to attain Christification. The reader will discover the supreme key of intimate self-realization within this book. We are not against any religion, school, sect, order, or lodge because we know that all religious forms are manifestations of the great, cosmic, universal, infinite religion latent in every atom of the cosmos. 
We teach the synthesis of all religions, schools, orders, lodges, and beliefs. Our doctrine is the doctrine of the synthesis. Sexual magic is practiced in esoteric Christianity. Sexual magic is practiced in Zen Buddhism. Sexual magic is practiced among initiated yogis. Sexual magic is practiced among the Mohammedan Sufis. Sexual magic was practiced in the initiatic colleges of Troy, Egypt, Rome, Carthage, Eleusis. Sexual magic was practiced in the Maya, Aztec, Inca, Druid, etc. mysteries. Sexual magic and the cosmic Christ are the synthesis of all religions, schools, and sects. We teach the doctrine of the synthesis. This doctrine could never be against diverse religious forms. Our teachings are contained within all religions, schools, and beliefs. If the reader does a serious study of all the religions of the world, he will discover the phallus and womb as the synthesis of all mysteries. There has never been any primary religion or school of mysteries where the cosmic Christ and the mysteries of sex were absent. The doctrine of the synthesis cannot harm anyone because it is the synthesis of all. We invite devotees of all cults, schools, and beliefs to make a comparative study of religions. We invite students from all the diverse systems of intimate self-education to study sexual esotericism from all the secret schools of mysteries. We invite all yogis to study sexual yoga and white tantra from India, without which no yogi is able to attain total liberation. Whatever the name may be, sexual magic and the Christ are the synthesis of all esoteric studies, religious forms, or educational systems. The attacks of which we have been victims, the persecutions, anathemas, and excommunications, etc., are because of ignorance and lack of study. Any religious form or esoteric system enriches itself with the synthesis. The synthesis cannot harm anyone. This is the doctrine of the synthesis. We deeply love all religious forms. We know that all religious forms are the loving manifestation of the great, cosmic, universal religion. Supreme religious synthesis is found within perfect matrimony. God is love and wisdom. The ultimate synthesis of all lodges, orders, schools, sects, systems, and methods of intimate self-realization from the East, as well as the West, North, and South, is found within the Christ and within sex. Pause inferential. Samuel Aun Wewer. Chapter 1 Love. God, as Father is wisdom. God, as Mother is love. God, as Father, resides within the Eye of Wisdom. The Eye of Wisdom is located between the eyebrows. God, as love, is found within the Heart Temple. Wisdom and love are the two main pillars of the Great White Lodge. To love, how beautiful it is to love. Only the great souls can and know how to love. Love is infinite tenderness. Love is the life that beats in every atom as it beats in every sun. Love cannot be defined because it is the divine mother of the world. It is that which comes to us when we are really in love. Love is felt within the depths of the heart. It is a delectable experience. It is a consuming fire. It is divine wine, a delight to those who drink it. A simple perfumed handkerchief, a letter, a flower, provokes within the depths of the soul tremendous inner inquietudes, exotic ecstasy, ineffable voluptuousness. No one has ever been able to define love. It has to be lived. It has to be felt. Only great lovers really know that which is called love. The perfect matrimony is the union of two beings who truly know how to love. In order for there to truly be love, it is necessary for man and woman to adore each other in all seven great cosmic planes. In order for there to be love, it is necessary for a true communion of souls to exist in the three spheres of thought, feeling, and will. When the vibration of the thoughts, feelings, and volitions of two beings are in tune, the perfect matrimony is realized in the seven planes of cosmic consciousness. There are people who find themselves married in the physical and etheric planes but not in the astral plane. Others are married in the physical, etheric, and astral planes but not in the mental plane. Each one thinks in his or her own way. The woman has one religion and the man another. They do not agree on what they think, etc., etc., etc. 
There are married couples attuned in the worlds of thought and feeling but absolutely opposite in the world of will. Those married couples clash constantly. They are not happy. The perfect matrimony should take place in the seven planes of cosmic consciousness. There are marriages that do not even reach the astral plane. Then there is not even sexual attraction. Those are true failures. Such a marriage is founded exclusively on a matrimonial formula. Some people are living matrimonial life in the physical plane with a particular spouse, and in the mental plane, they live a conjugal life with a different spouse. Rarely in life do we encounter a perfect matrimony. In order for there to be love, it is necessary there be affinity of thought, feeling, and will. Where there are mathematical calculations, there is no love. Unfortunately, in modern life, love smacks of a bank account, merchandise, and celluloid. In those homes where there are only additions and subtractions, love does not exist. When love leaves the heart, it's unlikely to return. Love is a very elusive child. The marriage realized without love, based solely on economic and social interests, is really a sin against the Holy Spirit. This type of marriage inevitably fails. Lovers often confuse desire with love, and what's worse is they marry believing they are in love. The sexual act consummated, carnal passion satisfied, then comes the disenchantment. The terrifying reality remains. Lovers should analyze themselves before getting married to know if they are really in love. Passion is easily confused for love. Love and desire are absolute opposites. Whosoever is truly in love is willing to give even his last drop of blood for his beloved. Examine yourself before you get married. Do you feel capable of giving even your last drop of blood for the being you adore? Would you be capable of giving your life so that your beloved could live? Reflect and meditate. Does a true affinity of thought, feeling, and will exist with the being you adore? Remember that if that complete affinity does not exist, your marriage, instead of being a heaven, will be a true hell. Do not let yourself be carried away by desire. Kill not only desire but even the very shadow of the tempting tree of desire. Love begins with a flash of delectable affection, is substantiated with infinite tenderness, and it is synthesized in supreme adoration. A perfect matrimony is the union of two beings who absolutely adore each other. In love, there are neither schemes nor bank accounts. If you are making plans and calculations, it is because you are not in love. Reflect before you take the great step. Are you really in love? Beware of the illusion of desire. Remember that the flame of desire consumes life, and then the dreadful reality of death remains. Contemplate the eyes of the being you adore, lose yourself in the joy of their pupils. But if you want to be happy, don't let yourself be carried away by desire. Man in love, do not confuse love with passion. Analyze yourself profoundly. It is urgent to know if she belongs to you in spirit. It is necessary to know if you are completely in tune with her in the three worlds of thought, feeling, and will. Adultery is the cruel result of the lack of love. The woman truly in love would prefer death before adultery. The man who commits adultery is not in love. Love is terribly divine. The blessed goddess mother of the world is that which is called love. With the formidable fire of love, we can transform ourselves into gods in order to penetrate full of majesty, the amphitheater of cosmic science. Chapter 2 Son of Man God is love, and his love creates, and returns to create anew. Delectable words of love lead to the ardent kiss of adoration. The sexual act is the real consubstantiation of love in the tremendous psychophysiological reality of our nature. When a man and a woman unite sexually, something is created. In those moments of supreme adoration, he and she are really only one androgynous being with powers to create like the gods. Elohim are male and female. Man and woman united sexually during the supreme ecstasy of love are really a terribly divine Elohim. In those moments of sexual union, we are really in the laboratorium moratorium of holy alchemy. In those moments, the great clairvoyance can see the sexual couple enveloped in terribly divine splendors. We have then penetrated the sanctum regnum of high magic. With these amazingly divine forces, we can disintegrate the devil we carry within and transform ourselves into great hierophants. 
as the sexual act is prolonged, as the delightful caresses of adorable ecstasy increase, one feels an enchanting spiritual voluptuousness. We are then charging ourselves with universal electricity and magnetism. Formidable cosmic forces accumulate in the depths of the soul. The chakras of the astral body sparkle. The mysterious forces of the great cosmic mother circulate through all the channels of our organism. The ardent kiss, the intimate caresses, are transformed into miraculous notes that poignantly resonate within the aura of the universe. We have no way of explaining those moments of supreme pleasure. The serpent of fire is stirred, the fires of the heart are enlivened, and there upon the foreheads of the sexually united beings shine the formidable rays of the Father, full of majesty. If man and woman know how to withdraw before the spasm, if in those moments of delightful enjoyment they have the willpower to dominate the animal ego, and if they then withdraw from the act without spilling the semen, not inside the womb, nor outside of it, not to the sides, nor any other place, they will have performed an act of sexual magic. That is what is called in occultism the Arcanum A Zeta F. With the Arcanum A Zeta F, we can retain all that marvelous light, all those cosmic currents, all those divine powers. Then the Kundalini, the sacred fire of the Holy Spirit, awakens in us, and we become terribly divine gods. But when we spill the semen, the cosmic currents melt within the universal currents, and a blood-red light, luciferic forces of evil, fatal magnetism, penetrates the soul of the two beings. So Cupid goes away crying, the gates of Eden are closed, love becomes disillusionment, disenchantment arrives, and the black reality of this valley of tears remains. When we know how to withdraw before the sexual spasm, the igneous serpent of our magical powers awakens. Kabbalists speak to us of the ninth sphere. The ninth sphere of the Kabbalah is sex. In the ancient mysteries, the descent into the ninth sphere was the highest test for the supreme dignity of the Hierophant. Jesus, Hermes, Buddha, Dante, Zoroaster, etc., had to descend to the ninth sphere in order to work with fire and water, origin of worlds, beasts, men, and gods. Every authentic and legitimate white initiation begins there. The Son of Man is born in the ninth sphere. The Son of Man is born of water and fire. When the alchemist has completed his work in the mastery of fire, he receives the Venustic initiation. The betrothal of the soul to the Lamb is the greatest festival of the soul. That great Lord of Light enters her. He humanizes himself. She divinizes herself. From this divine and human mixture comes that which is so aptly called the adorable Son of Man. The greatest triumph of supreme adoration is the birth of the Son of Man in the manger of the world. The man and woman who love each other are truly two miraculous harmonious hearts, an ecstasy of glory, that which cannot be defined because if it is defined, it is disfigured. That is love. The kiss is the profound mystical consecration of two souls who adore each other, and the sexual act is the key with which we convert ourselves into gods. Gods, there is God. All of you who truly love know that God is love. To love, how beautiful it is to love. Love is nourished with love. Only with love are the alchemical weddings possible. Jesus, the Beloved, attained the Venustic initiation in the Jordan. At the moment of baptism, the Christ entered the adorable Jesus through the pineal gland. The Word was made flesh, and lived among us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. To the one who knows, the Word gives power. No one has uttered it, no one will utter it except the one who has incarnated it. In the Apocalypse, the saint of Revelation describes to us the Son of Man, the Son of our kisses, with the following verses. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, the word, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, the coccygeal magnetic center, and unto Smyrna, the prostatic magnetic center, and unto Pergamos, solar plexus located in the region of the navel, and unto Thyatira, the magnetic center of the heart, and unto Sardis, magnetic center of the creative larynx, and unto Philadelphia, the eye of wisdom, clairvoyant center located between the eyebrows, and unto Laodicea, the crown of saints, magnetic center of the pineal gland. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the Son of Man, 
clothed with a garment down to the foot, the white linen tunic of every master, the tunic of glory. The seven candlesticks the saint of Revelation saw are the seven churches of the spinal cord. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, always immaculate and pure, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, the human waters, the semen. And he had in his right hand seven stars, the seven angels who govern the seven churches of the spinal cord, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, the word, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Revelation 1 verses 10 to 18. When the inner Christ enters the soul, he is transformed into her. He is transformed into her, and she into him. He humanizes himself, and she divinizes herself. From this divine and human alchemical mixture comes that which is so aptly called our adorable Savior, the Son of Man. Alchemists say we should transform the moon into the sun. The moon is the soul. The sun is the Christ. The transformation of the moon into the sun is only possible with the fire, and this can only be lit with the amorous union of the perfect matrimony. A perfect matrimony is the union of two beings, one who loves more, and the other who loves better. The Son of Man is born of water and fire. Water is the semen. Fire is the spirit. God shines upon the perfect couple. The Son of Man has power over the flaming fire, over the impetuous air, over the boisterous waves of the ocean, and over the perfumed earth. The sexual act is very formidable. With just reason revelation states, He who overcomes... I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. Revelation 3 verse 12 Chapter 3 The Great Battle In Jeremiah chapter 21 verse 8 it is written, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Man and woman can use sexual contact and the delights of love and kisses in order to become gods or demons. From the dawn of life a great battle has existed between the powers of light and the powers of darkness. The secret root of that battle lies in sex. There is a correct interpretation of the mysteries of sex. White magicians never spill the semen. Black magicians always spill the semen. White magicians make the igneous serpent of our magical powers ascend through the medullar canal. Black magicians make the snake descend toward the human being's atomic infernos. Gods and demons live in eternal struggle. Gods defend the doctrine of chastity. Demons hate chastity. The root of the conflict between gods and demons is found in sex. The great battle takes place in the astral light. The astral light is the reservoir of all past, present, and future forms of great nature. The astral light is the Azoth and Magnesia of the ancient alchemists, Medea's flying dragon, the Christian Inri, the Bohemian tarot. The astral light is a terribly sexual fire emitted from the sun's nimbus and it is fixed to the earth by the force of gravity and weight of the atmosphere. The sun attracts and repels that enchanting and delightful light. The astral light is the lever of Archimedes. The old sage said, Give me a fulcrum and I will move the world. Semen is man's astral liquid. The astral light is in the semen. Semen is the key to all powers and the key to all empires. The astral light has two poles, one positive and the other negative. The ascending serpent is positive. The descending serpent is negative. When it ascends, it is the bronze serpent that healed the Israelites in the wilderness. When it descends, it is the tempting serpent of Eden. When we know how to adore and to kiss with infinite tenderness and supreme chastity, the serpent ascends. When we ardently enjoy lust and spill the cup, the serpent, inebriated with madness, precipitates itself toward the human being's atomic infernos. Beings who adore each other dwell in the region of light. Souls who become inebriated with the chalice of lust, and who, after getting drunk, spill the cup, live in the region of darkness. Those souls are consumed in the fire of their own lust. Earth is ruled by Christ and Javeh, who live in eternal struggle. Christ is the leader of gods. Javeh is the chief of demons. Javeh is that terribly perverse demon who tempted Christ on the mountain, and tempting him, said it Ababo. All these kingdoms of the world I will give you if you kneel and worship me. And Christ said, Satan, Satan, it is written, 
You shall not tempt the Lord your God, and only him shall you obey. Jahweh is a terribly perverse fallen angel. Jahweh is the genius of evil. Christ is the leader of the great white lodge, and Jahweh, his antithesis, is the chief of the great black lodge. The powers of light and darkness live in eternal struggle, and that struggle is rooted in sex. Semen is the battlefield. In semen, angels and demons fight to the death. Sex is the core of the great conflict between angels and demons. That is the problem. It is the root of all white and black doctrines. Christ has his program of action, Java has his. The chosen follow the Christ. The great majority of human beings fanatically follow Java. Nevertheless, they all hide behind the cross. In the astral light, columns of angels and demons fight each other. Facing each angel is a demon. Every human being has a double. Here we have the mystery of the twin souls. Lamas say Devadatta was Buddha's brother and rival. He is the king of hell. The double is similar to his double in everything. Doubles are analogous. They have the same tendencies distinguished by opposite analogies. Facing a white astrologer, there is a black astrologer. If a master teaches white sexual magic, his double will teach black sexual magic. The doubles are similar in everything, but antithetical. The physiognomy and body of doubles are similar because they are twins. This is one of the great mysteries of occultism. Every white soul has a black double, a contrary soul that antagonizes and combats him. Love and anti-love fight each other. Anel is the angel of love. Lilith is his tenebrous double. Lilith represents anti-love. In ancient times, Iamblichus, the great theurgist, invoked these two genii, and two children then appeared out of a river, love and anti-love, Eros and Anteros, Anel and Lilith. The multitudes who witnessed Iamblichus's miracle prostrated themselves before the great theurgist. The disciple of the rocky path that leads to nirvana is filled with ecstasy when he has the joy of contemplating Anel, the angel of love. Anel presents himself before those who invoke him, who know how to call him. Anel is a beautiful child of the dawn. In the presence of the angel of love, we feel ourselves returning to the lost innocence of Eden. Anel's hair is like a golden waterfall flowing onto his alabaster shoulders. The face of the angel of love has the rosy color of dawn. Anel wears a white tunic and is indescribably beautiful. Anel is the angel of music and love, angel of beauty and tenderness, delightful cupid of lovers, ecstasy of all adoration. Lilith is Anel's rival brother, his evil antithesis, a terribly evil child, the infernal angel of all great amorous deceptions, monarch of the human being's atomic hells. Lilith cannot resist the gaze of the angel of love, but is the shadow of that angel. Lilith has the presence of a terribly evil child. Lilith's messy and faded hair, malignant face, and black and blue tunic speak clearly to us of a cruel and bitter world. Anel represents the positive ray of Venus. Lilith represents the negative ray of Venus. Great Kabbalistic traditions state that Adam had two wives, Lilith and Nahema. Lilith is the mother of abortions, pederasty, sexual degeneration, homosexuality, infanticide, etc. Nahema is the mother of adultery. Nahema seduces with the enchantment of her beauty and virginity. When a man is unfaithful to the wife who was given to him by the lords of the law, he receives a luciferic mark between his eyebrows. When a man marries a woman who does not belong to him, when he realizes a marriage which is in violation of the law, it is easy to recognize the error because on the day of the wedding, the bride appears to be bald. Her head is so covered with a veil that her hair cannot be seen. The woman does this instinctively. Hair is a symbol of modesty in woman, and the weddings of Nahema prohibit display of hair. That is the law. Angels of light and angels of darkness live in eternal struggle. The root of the great battle between the powers of light and darkness is in sex. According to great law, Every planet has two polarities. The positive ray of Mars is represented by Elohim Gibor. The negative ray of Mars is represented by the double of this Elohim. That double is called Andromelech. The perverse demon Andromelech is now reincarnated in China. The supreme leader of the positive ray of the moon is Jehovah. Chavajoth is exactly his antithesis, his rival brother. Jehovah directs the positive ray of the moon. Chavajoth directs the negative ray of the moon. Jehovah teaches white sexual magic. Chavajoth teaches black sexual magic. Two moons exist, the white moon and the black moon. The universal, 
feminine forces of sexuality are represented in the two moons. Creation is the outcome of the evolutionary processes of sound. Sound is the expression of sexuality. Angels create with the sexual power of the creative larynx. Unmanifested primordial sound, through its incessant evolutionary processes, converts itself into energetic forms of stabilized, dense matter. Unmanifested primordial sound is the subtle voice. Primordial sound contains in itself the masculine feminine sexual forces. As we descend into the difficult abyss of matter, these forces multiply and become more complicated. The positive pole of sound is the miraculous force that attracts us toward the unmanifested absolute, where only happiness reigns. The negative pole of sound is the tenebrous force that attracts us to this valley of bitterness. The positive pole is solar, Christic, divine. The negative pole is lunar and is represented by the moon. The shadow of the white moon is Lilith. The origin of fornication is in Lilith. The origin of separate individuality is in Lilith. The origin of the eye is the black moon. The black moon is Lilith. Jehovah works with the white moon. Chavajoth works with the black moon. Creation of the phenomenological universe is impossible without the intervention of the lunar forces. Unfortunately, tenebrous forces of the black moon intervene and spoil creation. The sun and the moon represent the positive and negative poles of sound. The sun and the moon originate creation. The sun is positive and the moon negative. The sun is the husband and the moon is the wife. The devil Lilith gets between them and harms the great work. As above so below. The man is the sun and the woman is the moon. Lilith is the Satan that seduces them both and leads them to fornication and to the abyss. Lilith is the black moon, the dark aspect of the white moon, the origin of the eye and of separate individuality. Jehovah does not have a physical body. Chavajoth has a physical body. Chavajoth is now reincarnated in Germany. He poses as a war veteran and works for the great black lodge. In the internal worlds, the black magician Chavajoth dresses in a red tunic and wears a red turban. This demon cultivates the mysteries of black sexual magic in a tenebrous cavern. He has many European disciples. Jehovah normally lives in Eden. Eden is the ethereal world. Everyone who returns to Eden is received by Lord Jehovah. The door of Eden is sex. In the astral, there exist temples of light and temples of darkness, and where the light shines more clearly, the darkness becomes more dense. In Cataluna, Spain, there is a marvelous temple in the Jinn state. This is the temple of Montserrat. In that temple, the Holy Grail is guarded. It is the silver chalice from which Jesus the Christ drank the wine during the Last Supper. Coagulated blood of the world's Redeemer is contained in the Holy Grail. Tradition says the Roman senator, Joseph of Arimathea, filled that chalice with royal blood at the foot of the Savior's cross. Blood flowed from the wounds of the Adorable One and filled the chalice. A group of masters from the Great White Lodge live in the Temple of Montserrat. They are the Knights of the Holy Grail. In other times, the Temple of Montserrat and the Holy Grail were visible to the whole world. Later, that temple with its Holy Grail became invisible. The temple exists in the Jinn state. The temple was submerged with its Grail into hyperspace. Now we can only visit that temple with the astral body or with the physical body in the Jinn state. A physical body can be taken out of the tridimensional world and placed in the fourth dimension. All this can be performed through the wise use of hyperspace. Soon, astrophysics will demonstrate the existence of hyperspace. Indigenous tribes of America had a profound knowledge of jinn science. In Mexico, the Tiger Knights knew how to place the physical body into hyperspace. In America there are lakes, mountains, and temples in the jinn state. In Mexico, the Temple of Chapultepec is found in the jinn state. It is located in hyperspace. Master Hirakocha received initiation in this temple. Next to every temple of light, there is a temple of darkness. Where the light shines brightest, there the darkness, by contrast, changes appearance, it gets denser. The knights of the white grail must inevitably fight against the knights of the black grail. The hall of witchcraft located in Salamanca, Spain, is the fatal antithesis of the temple of Montserrat. Let us study this curious analogy of the opposites. The temple of the white grail is a splendid monastery of the great light. The temple of Salamanca is a splendid monastery of darkness. The monastery of Montserrat has two floors. The hall of witchcraft also has two floors. The temple of Montserrat is surrounded by beautiful and sweet gardens. 
The Hall of Witchcraft is also surrounded by romantic gardens where each flower exudes a breath of death. Both are splendid buildings. In both buildings, truth and justice are well spoken of. In both temples, order and culture reign. In both temples, sanctity and love are spoken of. This will cause astonishment for the reader, and he will question himself, how is it possible that in the temples of evil, sanctity and love are well spoken of? Please, dear reader, don't get confused. Remember, brethren, the knights of the Black Grail are wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. The left-hand adepts love to ejaculate the Christonic semen. That is why they are black magicians. Their philosophy is the philosophy of fatality. For them, all good is evil. For them, all evil is good. The doctrine of Java is divine for them. The doctrine of Christ is diabolical for them. The lords of darkness hate the Christ. The sons of the abyss hate the Divine Mother. In their regions, they violently attack all those who invoke the Divine Mother or her beloved Son. If the occult investigator goes into the Hall of Witchcraft with his astral body, he will inevitably find a very beautiful and elegant spiral staircase, which leads to the most secret place of the precinct. This is an elegant hall furnished with the splendid luxury of the lordly mansions of the 17th century. The mirrors of 1001 nights shine there, the enchanted rugs, and all of Nahema's malign beauty. The governor of that mansion of fatality is Mr. Ramon Ribifero, distinguished knight of the Black Grail, horrible demon of darkness. Those disciples who visit the Hall of Witchcraft are unfortunate. Nahema's fatal beauty will seduce them with all the delightful magic of her enchantments. Then they will roll into the abyss where only crying and the gnashing of teeth are heard. For them, it would have been better not to have been born at all, or to have had a windmill stone tied around their necks, and to have been thrown into the depths of the sea. Matthew 18 verse 6, Mark 9 verse 42, Luke 17 verse 12. In the temple of Montserrat, the glory of the silver chalice, with the blood of the Redeemer of the world, shines. In the temple of Salamanca, the darkness of the Black Grail shines. In the temple of Montserrat, cosmic festivals are celebrated. In the temple of Salamanca, profane dances and disgusting covens are celebrated. The Knights of the Holy Grail worship the Christ and the Divine Mother. The Knights of the Black Grail worship Java and the fatal shadow of great nature. That shadow is called Santa Maria. Important clarification from Venerable Master Samuel Anwar about Santa Maria. When I was investigating that strange creature in the world of the Klipoth, how she shared her life with so many black magicians, how she could work her way into so many covens, I nevertheless never saw in her that which we could call perversity. The tenebris of the left hand, the sublunar creatures, worshipped her, and considered that magician not as something tenebrous but rather as a saint. I wanted to know if there was any truth in it, the alleged sanctity of a creature who mingled with the darkness, who figures in so many covens and monasteries of the Middle Ages. Who of those who have occupied themselves studying old accounts of medieval high and low magic have never heard of Maria of Antilla? There are so many secrets hidden within the dust of many libraries. Of course, I knew I had to clarify this, and I clarified it precisely when, in the world of Tifereth, I invoked that entity. I was heard, and to my surprise I was met with a self-realized master. I then comprehended that she had emanated her bodhisattva from herself and this bodhisattva was versed in the practice of magic in the magical triangle, or third triangle. She was passing through rigorous training beginning in the Klipoth but without doing harm to anyone. Samuel Anwar, Tarot and Kabbalah, Chapter 66, The Klipoths Continuation of Chapter The Kingdom of Santa Maria is the Abyss. The great battle between the powers of light and darkness is as ancient as eternity. The core of that great battle is sex. White magicians want to make the serpent rise. Black magicians want to make the serpent descend. White magicians follow the path of the perfect matrimony. Black magicians love adultery and fornication. There are masters of the great white lodge. There are masters of the great black lodge. There are disciples of the great white lodge. There are disciples of the great black lodge. Disciples of the great white lodge know how to move consciously and positively in the astral body. Disciples of the Great Black Lodge also know how to travel in the astral body. All of us, as children, listen to many stories of witches and fairies. Our grandmothers always told us stories of witches that mounted their broomsticks at midnight and traveled through the clouds. Although it will seem incredible to many students of occultism, 
theosophy, Rosicrucianism, etc., those witches really do exist. They don't ride broomsticks as grandmothers believe but they do know how to travel through the air. The so-called witches travel through space with their bodies of flesh and bone. They know how to make use of hyperspace and transport themselves from one place to another with the physical body. Soon astrophysicists will discover the existence of hyperspace. It can be demonstrated with hypergeometry. When a body submerges into hyperspace, it is said it has entered the jinn state. Each body in the jinn state escapes the law of gravity. Then it floats in hyperspace. There is volume and hypervolume. So-called witches move within the hypervolume of curved space in which we live. Curved space does not pertain exclusively to the planet Earth. Curved space corresponds to the infinite starry space. If cyclones constitute proof in themselves of the Earth's rotational movement, it is also very true and precisely logical that the rotation of all suns, constellations, and worlds is concrete evidence of the curvature of space. White magicians also know how to place the physical body in the jinn state. Jesus walked on the waters of the Sea of Galilee by making intelligent use of hyperspace. Buddha's disciples could pass through a rock from one side to another by making use of hyperspace. In India, there are yogis who can pass through fire without being burned by making use of hyperspace. Peter escaped from prison and saved himself from the death penalty by using hyperspace. The great yogi Patanjali states in his aphorisms that, by practicing samyama on the physical body, it becomes as light as cotton and can float in the air. Samyama consists of three phases, concentration, meditation, and ecstasy. First, the yogi concentrates on his physical body. Second, he meditates on his physical body inducing sleep. Third, full of ecstasy, he rises from his bed with his body in the jinn state. Then he penetrates hyperspace, and escaping the law of gravity, floats in the air. Devotees of Santa Maria, witches and warlocks, do the same thing with formulas of black magic. With their bodies in the jinn state, white magicians penetrate a higher type of dimension. With their bodies in the jinn state, black magicians penetrate a lower type of dimension. In all of nature, there is the subtraction and addition of ever-infinite dimensions. We leave one dimension to penetrate another, higher or lower. That is the law. The kingdom of Santa Maria is the abyss of failures. The kingdom of light is the region of the gods. Only those who have attained supreme chastity can live in the kingdom of light. In the abyss, chastity is a crime, and fornication turns into law. Whoever sees the elegant hall of Jevesema will be dazzled by luxury and happiness. There he will meet thousands of female black magicians endowed with a terribly malign beauty. The inexperienced soul who penetrates those evil regions could stray onto the path of error and fall forever into the abyss of perdition. Nahema's malign beauty is dangerous. In the temples of light, we only witness love and wisdom. There, the tenebrous ones cannot enter because they live in a lower type of dimension. Nahema's beauty is fatal. Those who loved so much, those beings who swore eternal love to each other could have been happy, unfortunately, enchanted by Nahema's beauty, they adored another's wife and fell into the abyss of despair. In the hall of Javasemo, the beauty of Nahema fatally shines. Black magicians have a sacred symbol. That symbol is the copper cauldron. White magicians have the holy cross as their sacred symbol. The latter is phallic. Insertion of the vertical phallus into the formal ties forms the cross. The cross has the power to create. There can be no creation without the sign of the holy cross. Animal species are crossed. Atoms and molecules are crossed to perpetuate life. The blessed roses of spirituality bloom on the cross of the perfect matrimony. The perfect matrimony is the union of two beings, one who loves more, and the other who loves better. Love is the best religion available to humankind. Black magicians hate the perfect matrimony. Nahema's fatal beauty and Lilith's sexual crimes are the fatal antitheses of the perfect matrimony. The white magician adores the internal Christ. The black magician adores Satan. This is the I, the me myself, the reincarnating ego. In fact, the I is the specter of the threshold itself. It incessantly reincarnates in order to satisfy desires. The I is memory. And the I are all the memories of our ancient personalities. The I is Ariman, Lucifer, Satan. Our real being is the internal Christ. Our real being is of a universal nature. Our real being is not any kind of superior or inferior I. Our real being is impersonal, 
universal, divine. He transcends every concept of I, me, myself, ego, etc. The black magician strengthens his Satan and bases his fatal power on it. Satan's form and size result from the degree of human malignancy. When we enter the path of the perfect matrimony, Satan loses his volume and ugliness. We need to dissolve Satan. This is only possible with the perfect matrimony. We need to elevate ourselves to the angelic state. This is only possible by practicing sexual magic with the priestess wife. Angels are perfect men. There are two types of sexual magic, white and black, positive and negative. Sexual magic with ejaculation of the semen is black magic. Sexual magic without ejaculation of the semen is white magic. The Ban and Drukpa of the Red Cap ejaculate the semen, which they later collect from within the vagina. Clarification by Master Sama Alan Wewer concerning the Ban. In Oriental Tibet, the Ban monks are very radical when it comes to self-realization, which is why Blavatsky thought they were black magicians. We have all repeated this mistake, and now we feel obligated to rectify it. I am not saying the Drukpa are saints or meek lambs. They are black magicians because they teach black tantrism but the Ban, even though they use a red cap, are not black magicians as Blavatsky mistakenly supposed. Samuel on Wewer, The Devil and Lucifer Continuation of Chapter This semen, mixed with the feminine sexual fluid, is reabsorbed again through the urethra, utilizing a tenebrous procedure. The fatal result of that black tantrism is the awakening of the snake in an absolutely negative form. Then instead of ascending through the medullar canal, it descends toward the atomic infernos of man. That is Satan's horrifying tale. With this procedure, the Ban and Drukpa forever separate themselves from the internal Christ and forever sink into the terrifying abyss. No white magician ejaculates the semen. The white magician treads the path of the perfect matrimony. The Ban and Drukpa of the Red Cap want, by means of this fatal procedure, to unite solar and lunar atoms in order to awaken the Kundalini. The result of their ignorance is eternal separation from the internal God. White magicians blend solar and lunar atoms within their own sexual laboratory. This is what the perfect matrimony is for. Blessed is woman. Blessed is love. The great battle between black and white magicians has its root in sex. The tempting serpent of Eden and the bronze serpent that healed the Israelites in the wilderness fight against each other. When the serpent rises, we become angels. When it descends, we become demons. During sexual magic, the three breaths of pure akasha that descend through the brahmanic cord are reinforced. When the magician spills the semen, he loses billions of solar atoms that are replaced by billions of diabolical atoms, which the sexual organs collect with their nervous movement that happens when the semen is spilled. Satanic atoms try to rise to the brain through the brahmanic cord, but the three breaths of akasha precipitate them to the abyss. When they collide against the black atomic god residing in the coccyx, the snake awakens and moves downward to form the devil's tail in the astral body. Angels are perfect men. In order to elevate oneself to the angelic state, one needs the perfect matrimony. Demons are perverse men. There are two types of sexual magic, white and black. Those who practice white sexual magic never in their lives spill the semen. Those who practice black sexual magic spill the semen. The Ban and Drukpa of the Black Lodge of Tibet spill the semen. These tenebrous ones, after spilling the semen, collect it from within the feminine vulva with a special instrument. Later, they reabsorb it through the urethra using a black power, a variety of the Vajroli Mudra, which we do not divulge so as not to propagate the fatal science of darkness. The magicians of darkness believe mixing solar and lunar atoms in this way awakens the Kundalini. The result is, instead of rising through the medullar canal, the spinal fires descend toward the atomic infernos of man and turn into Satan's tail. White magicians mix solar and lunar atoms within their own sexual laboratory without committing the crime of spilling the seminal liquor. Thus, the Kundalini awakens positively and rises victorious through the medullar canal. This is the angelic way. The white magician aspires to the angelic state. The lords of the tenebrous countenance want to reach the degree of Anagarikas. The souls who follow the path of the perfect matrimony fuse with their internal God and elevate themselves to the kingdom of the Superman. The souls who hate the path of the perfect matrimony divorce themselves from their internal God and submerge into the abyss. The white magician makes the sexual energy rise through the sympathetic cords of the spinal medulla. These two cords wind around the spinal medulla, 
forming the Holy Eight. These are the two witnesses of the Apocalypse. Feel your chalice, brother, with the sacred wine of light. Remember, the chalice is the brain. You need eagle eyes and igneous wings. The tenebrous struggle to take you from the real path. Know that the three gravest dangers that await the student are mediums of spiritualism, false prophets and prophetesses, and sexual temptations. This is the path of the razor's edge. This path is full of dangers, within and without. Leave alert and vigilant as the lookout in wartime. Do not let yourself be surprised by those who consider sex a purely animal function without any kind of spiritual transcendence. As a rule, false prophets hate sex and exhibit novel doctrines to surprise the weak, and after fascinating them, lead them to the abyss. Do not allow yourself to be confused by false words of the tenebrous. Remember that spiritualist mediums often serve as vehicles for black entities. These present themselves boasting of sanctity and advising against the path of the perfect matrimony. Usually, they declare themselves to be Jesus Christ or Buddha, etc., in order to deceive the naive. Beware of the temptations that await you. Be prudent and vigilant. Remember the great battle between the powers of light and darkness is found in sex. Everyone who enters the path of the perfect matrimony must be very careful of these three very grave dangers. The tenebrous fight tirelessly to take you from the path of the perfect matrimony. Do not allow yourself to be seduced by sublime doctrines that advise you to spill the semen because they are of black magic. The king of the diabolical atoms waits in the coccyx for the opportunity to awaken the snake negatively and direct it downward. With the spilling of semen, the black atomic god receives a formidable electrical impulse sufficient to awaken the snake and direct it toward the atomic infernos of man. This is how man becomes a demon. Thus, this is how one falls into the abyss. Chapter 4 The Abyss Kabbalistic traditions state that Adam had two wives, Lilith and Nahema. Lilith is the mother of abortions, homosexuality, and generally all kinds of crimes against nature. Nahema is the mother of malignant beauty, passion, and adultery. The abyss is divided into two large regions, the spheres of Lilith and Nahema. Infrasexuality reigns supreme in these two large regions, the sphere of Lilith. Those who hate sex, for example, monks, anchorites, preachers of sex of a pseudo-esoteric type, pseudo-yogis who abhor sex, nuns, etc., live in the infrasexual sphere of Lilith. All these infrasexual people, by the mere fact of being infrasexual, tend to have an affinity with people of intermediate sexuality. Thus, it is not difficult to find homosexuality within many convents, religions, sects, and schools of a pseudo-esoteric type. Infrasexual people consider themselves to be immensely superior to those of normal sexuality. They look at people of normal sexuality with disdain, considering them inferior. All the taboos, restrictions, and prejudices that currently condition the lives of people of normal sexuality were firmly established by infrasexual people. We knew of the case of an old anchorite who preached a certain pseudo-occult doctrine. Everyone venerated this man, considering him to be a saint. He was apparently a master, and people worshipped him. Finally, one poor woman discovered the truth when he proposed to her a sexual union against nature, supposedly in order to initiate her. In reality, this anchorite was an infrasexual. Nevertheless, this man had taken vows of chastity. This man mortally hated the arcana may zedef, sexual magic. He considered it to be dangerous. However, he had no problem proposing extravaginal unions to his devotees because he was really an infrasexual. Who would have doubted this man? Apparently, he was a saint. This is what the people believed. His followers considered him a master. He hated sex. Yes, he mortally hated sex. This is a characteristic of degenerated, infrasexual people. The most serious thing of all is that they consider themselves superior to people of normal sexuality. They feel they are super transcendent, and they manage to seduce people of normal sexuality, converting them into their followers. In our mission to spread Gnostic esotericism, we have had the opportunity to study infrasexual people. We often hear them repeating the following phrases, you Gnostics are selfish because all you ever think of is your kundalini and sexual magic. You are sexual fanatics. Sexual magic is purely animalistic. Sex is something very vulgar. I am a spiritualist, and I abhor all that is materialistic and vulgar. Sex is filthy. There are many paths to God. I live only for God, and am not interested in the smut of sexuality. I follow chastity, and abhor sex, etc. This is precisely the language of infrasexual people. They are always self-sufficient, 
always so proud in their feeling of superiority over people of normal sexuality. An infrasexual woman who hated her husband said to us, I would only practice sexual magic with my guru. She said this in the presence of her husband. This woman had no sexual relations with her husband because she supposedly hated sex. Nevertheless, she was willing to practice sexual magic but only with her guru. She had an affinity with the guru because he was also an infrasexual. This is the saint mentioned earlier in this chapter, the one who enjoyed suggesting to his female devotees to have sexual unions against nature with him. We knew of the case of the archirophant who hated women, and who often uttered phrases such as this, Women, I thank them with my feet. He preached a doctrine, and his followers adored him as if he was a god. He was always surrounded by adolescents. Thus, this is how he spent his time, until the police uncovered everything. He was a homosexual, a homosexual corrupter of minors. However, he had the pride of all infrasexuals, the pride of feeling super-transcendent, ineffable, and divine. The sphere of Lilith is the sphere of great heresy. These people no longer have the possibility of redemption because they hate the Holy Spirit. All manner of sin shall be forgiven except the sin against the Holy Spirit. Sexual energy is an emanation of the Divine Mother. Whoever renounces the Cosmic Mother, whoever hates the Divine Mother, whoever profanes the energy of the Divine Mother, shall sink into the abyss forever. There they will have to pass through the second death. The Psychology of the Sphere of Lilith The Sphere of Lilith is characterized by its cruelty. The psychology of this sphere has various aspects, monks and nuns who hate sex, homosexuality in convents, homosexuality outside of all monastic life, induced abortions, people who love masturbation, criminals of the brothel, people who enjoy torturing others. In this sphere we find the most horrible crimes reported in police records, horrible cases of bloody crimes of homosexual origin, terrifying acts of sadism, homosexuality in jails, lesbianism terrifying criminal minds, those who enjoy making their loved ones suffer, horrible infanticides, patricides, madricides, etc., pseudo-occultists who would rather suffer from nocturnal pollutions than get married, people who mortally hate the arcana may, Zadef, and perfect matrimony, people who believe they can reach God while hating sex, anchoritic people who abhor sex and consider it vulgar and gross. The Sphere of Nahema the sphere of Nahema seduces with the enchantment of her malignant beauty. In this infrasexual sphere, we find the Don Juans and Femme Fatale. The world of prostitution unfolds in this sphere. The infrasexual men of Nahema feel very manly. Men who have many women live in this sphere. They feel happy in adultery. They believe themselves to be very manly. They are unaware that they are infrasexuals. We also find millions of prostitutes in the sphere of Nahema. These poor women are victims of the fatal charm of Nahema. We find elegant ladies of high social standing in the sphere of Nahema. These people are happy within adultery. That is their world. In the infrasexual region of Nahema, we find sweetness that moves the soul, virgins that seduce with the charm of their tenderness, beautiful women who seduce, men who abandon their homes bewitched by the enchantment of these precious beauties, indescribable enchantments, uncontrollable passions, precious salons, elegant cabarets, soft beds, delightful dances, orchestras of the abyss, romantic words that cannot be forgotten, etc. The infrasexuals of Nahema sometimes accept the arcana may, Zedef, sexual magic, but fail because they can't manage to avoid the ejaculation of semen. They almost always retreat from the perfect matrimony, uttering horrible things against it. We have heard them saying, I practice sexual magic and sometimes I managed to sustain myself without spilling the semen. I was an animal enjoying the delicious passions of sex. After retreating from the path of the razor's edge, represented by the spinal cord, they seek refuge in some seductive doctrine of Nahema, and if they have the luck of not falling into the sphere of Lilith, they then continue ejaculating the seminal liquor. Such is their infrasexual world. The Psychology of the Sphere of Nahema The infrasexual inhabitants of the sphere of Nahema are very touchy. They are the ones who utter phrases such as, Offense is cleansed with blood. I killed because I am a man of honor. My honor was slighted. I am a wronged husband, etc. The Nahema type is one who jeopardizes his life for whatever lady, the passionate type, lover of luxury, slave to social prejudices, friend of drunkenness, banquets, parties, very elegant fashions, etc., etc. These people consider perfect matrimony to be something impossible, and when they accept it, they last only a short time on the path because they fail. 
This type of person enjoys brutality in sex. When this type of person accepts the arcanum A, Zeta F, they utilize it to enjoy lust, and as soon as they find some seductive doctrine that offers them refuge, they then retreat from the perfect matrimony. The Mystique of Nahema Sometimes we find mystical types in the infrasexual sphere of Nahema. They don't drink, eat meat, or smoke, or they are very religious though they aren't vegetarians. The mystical type of Nahema is only passionate in secret. They violently enjoy sexual passions even though they later utter terrible judgments against sexual passion. Sometimes they accept the arcanum A, Zeta F, but leave shortly after, when they find some consoling doctrine that provides them with phrases like this, God said be fruitful and multiply. The sexual act is a purely animal function, and spirituality has nothing to do with it, etc. Then the infrasexual from Nahema. Finding justification for ejaculating the seminal liquor leaves the path of perfect matrimony. Chapter 5. Normal Sexuality Let it be understood that people of normal sexuality are those who have no sexual conflicts of any kind. Sexual energy is divided into three different types. First, the energy related with reproduction of the race and health of the physical body in general. Second, the energy related with the spheres of thought, feeling, and will. Third, the energy found related with the divine spirit of man. Truly, sexual energy is, without doubt, the most subtle and powerful energy normally produced and transported through the human organism. Everything man is, including the three spheres of thought, feeling, and will, is nothing but the exact outcome of different modifications of sexual energy. Control and storage of sexual energy is certainly difficult due to the tremendously subtle and powerful nature of this energy. In addition, its presence represents a source of immense power that can result in a true catastrophe if one does not know how to handle it. There are certain channels within the organism through which this powerful energy should normally circulate. When this energy infiltrates the delicate mechanism of other functions, failure is the violent outcome. In such cases, extremely delicate centers in the human organism are damaged, and in fact, the individual becomes an infrasexual. All negative mental attitudes can lead directly or indirectly to these violent and destructive catastrophes of the sexual energy. Hatred of sex, hatred of the arcanum A, Zeta F, disgust or repugnance towards sex, disdain for sex, underestimation of sex, passionate jealousies, fear of sex, sexual cynicism, sexual sadism, obscenity, pornography, sexual brutality, etc., etc., turn the human being into an infrasexual. Sex is the creative function through which the human being is a true god. Normal sexuality results from total harmony and concordance with all the other functions. Normal sexuality bestows upon us the power to create healthy children, or to create in the world of art, or in the sciences. Any negative mental attitude towards sex produces infiltrations of this powerful energy into other functions, provoking dreadful catastrophes the fatal result of which is infrasexuality. Every negative attitude of the mind forces the sexual energy and compels it to circulate through channels and systems fit for mental energies, volative, or any other type of energy less powerful than sexual energy. The result is fatal because those types of channels and systems, being unable to endure the tremendous voltage of the very powerful sexual energy, heat up and burn out like a wire that is too thin and fine when a high-power electrical current passes through it. When man and woman unite sexually in perfect matrimony, they are truly ineffable gods in those voluptuous moments. Man and woman united sexually form a perfect divine androgyne, a male-female Elohim, a terribly divine divinity. The two halves, separated since the dawn of life, are united for one instant in order to create. This is ineffable, sublime. This is a thing of paradise. Sexual energy is dangerously volatile and potentially explosive. During the secret act, during sexual ecstasy, the couple is surrounded by a tremendous, terribly divine energy. In these moments of supreme joy and ardent kisses that ignite the depths of the soul, we are able to retain that wonderful light to purify and totally transform ourselves. When we spill the cup of Hermes, when the loss occurs, the light of the gods retreats leaving the doors open for Lucifer's red and sanguineous light to enter the home. Then the enchantment disappears, and disillusionment and disenchantment come. After a short time, the man and woman begin the path of adultery because their home has become a hell.
It is a characteristic of nature to mobilize enormous reserves of creative energy in order to create any cosmos. But nature only employs an infinitesimal quantity of its enormous reserves in order to realize its creations. So, man loses six or seven million spermatozoa in one seminal ejaculation, however, only one infinitesimal spermatozoan is needed to engender a child. In Lemuria, no human being ejaculated the semen. Then, in order to create, couples united sexually in the temples. During those moments, lunar hierarchies knew how to utilize one spermatozoan and one egg in order to create without the necessity of reaching the orgasm and seminal ejaculation. No one spilled the semen. The sexual act was a sacrament, which was only performed within the temple. Women in those times gave birth to children without pain, and the serpent was raised victoriously through the spinal canal. In that epoch, man had not yet left Eden. All of nature obeyed him, and he knew neither pain nor sin. The tenebrous lucifers were the ones who showed man how to spill the semen. The original sin of our first parents was the crime of spilling the semen. That is fornication. When paradisiacal man fornicated, he then penetrated the kingdom of the lucifers. Modern man is luciferic. It is absurd to spill six or seven million spermatozoa when only one is needed in order to create. One single spermatozoan escapes easily from the sexual glands without the necessity of spilling the semen. When man returns to the point of departure, when he reestablishes the sexual system of Eden, the sacred serpent of the Kundalini will again rise victoriously in order to convert us into gods. The sexual system of Eden is normal sexuality. The sexual system of Luciferic man is absolutely abnormal. One does not only fornicate physically, fornication also exists in the mental and astral worlds. Those who engage in lustful types of conversation, those who read pornographic magazines, those who attend movie theaters where passionate, erotic films are shown, waste enormous reserves of sexual energy. Those poor people utilize the finest and most delicate substance of sex, wasting it miserably in the satisfaction of their brutal mental passions. Sexual fantasy produces a psychosexual type of impotence. This type of sick men have normal erections. They are apparently normal men, but the instant they try to connect the member with the vulva, the erection diminishes, the phallus falls, leaving them in the most horrible state of despair. They have lived in sexual fantasy, and when they really face the harsh sexual reality, which has nothing to do with fantasy, they become confused and are unable to respond to that reality properly. The sexual sense is formidably subtle and tremendously rapid thanks to its very fine and imponderable energy. The molecular level where the sexual sense acts is millions of times faster than thought waves. Mental logic and fantasy are stumbling blocks for the sexual sense. When mental logic, with all its reasoning, or when sexual fantasy, with all its erotic illusions, wants to control the sexual sense or direct it within its illusions, it is fatally destroyed. Mental logic and sexual fantasy destroy the sexual sense when they try to place it at their service. Psychosexual impotence is the most dreadful tragedy that can afflict fanatical men and women, and purely rational types of people. The struggle of many monks, nuns, anchorites, pseudo-yogis, etc., etc., to bottle up sex within their religious fanaticism, to confine in the prison of their penitence, to muzzle it or sterilize it, to prohibit all creative manifestation, etc., etc., converts fanatics into slaves of their own passions, into slaves of sex incapable of thinking of anything other than sex. Those are the fanatics of sex, the degenerates of infrasexuality. These people discharge with disgusting nocturnal emissions every night or acquire homosexual vices, or masturbate miserably. Wanting to confine sex is like wanting to bottle up the sun. A man like this is the most abject slave of sex without any benefit or true pleasure. A man like this is an unhappy sinner. A woman like this is a sterile mule, a vile slave of that which she wants to enslave, sex. The enemies of the Holy Spirit are people of the abyss. It would have been better for those people to never have been born or to tie a millstone around their necks, and hurl themselves to the bottom of the sea. The human being must learn to live sexually. The age of sex, the new Aquarian age, is at hand. The sexual glands are controlled by the planet Uranus, which is the regent of the constellation of Aquarius. Thus, sexual alchemy is, in fact, the science of the new Aquarian age. Sexual magic will be officially accepted in the universities of the new Aquarian age. 
those who presume to be messengers of the new Aquarian age, but nevertheless hate the Arcanum A. Zedef, provide more than enough evidence that they are truly impostors because the new Aquarian age is governed by the regent of sex. This regent is the planet Uranus. Sexual energy is the finest energy of the infinite cosmos. Sexual energy can convert us into angels or demons. The image of truth is found deposited in sexual energy. The cosmic design of the Adam Christ is found deposited in sexual energy. The son of man, the superman, is born out of normal sexuality. The superman could never be born of infrasexuals. The realm of infrasexuals is the abyss. The Greek poet Homer said, Better to be a beggar on earth, and not a king in the empire of the shades. This empire is the tenebrous world of the infrasexuals. Chapter 6 Suprasexuality Suprasexuality is the result of sexual transmutation. Christ, Buddha, Dante, Zoroaster, Muhammad, Hermes, Quetzalcoatl, and many other great masters were suprasexuals. The two great aspects of sexuality are called generation and regeneration. In the preceding chapter, we studied conscious generation. Now we are going to study regeneration. By studying the life of animals, we discover very interesting things. If we cut a serpent in half, we can be sure it has the power to regenerate itself. It can totally develop a new half with all the organs of the lost half. Most earth and sea worms also have the power of continuous regeneration. The lizard can regenerate its tail and the human organism its skin. The power of regeneration is absolutely sexual. Man has the power to recreate himself. Man can create the superman within himself. This is possible using sexual power wisely. We can recreate ourselves as authentic supermen. This is only possible with sexual transmutation. The fundamental key to sexual transmutation is the arcanum A, zeta F, sexual magic. The key to all power is found in the union of the phallus and the womb. What is important is that the couple learns how to withdraw from the sexual act before the spasm, before seminal spillage. Semen must not be spilled, neither inside the womb nor outside it, neither to the sides nor anywhere else. We speak clearly so people will understand, even though some puritanical infrasexuals label us pornographic. Human life itself has no meaning. To be born, to grow, to work hard in order to live, to reproduce like an animal, and then to die, is really a chain of martyrdom man carries entangled in his soul. If that is life, it is not worth living. Fortunately, we have in our sexual glands the seed, the grain. From this seed, from the grain, can be born the superman, the Adam Christ, the golden child of sexual alchemy. For this, life is certainly worth living. The path is sexual transmutation. This is the science of Uranus. This is the planet that controls the gonads or sexual glands. This is the planet that governs the constellation of Aquarius. Uranus has a sexual cycle of 84 years. Uranus is the only planet that directs its two poles toward the sun. The two poles of Uranus correspond to masculine and feminine aspects. These two phases alternate in periods of 42 years each. The alternating stimuli of the two poles of Uranus govern all the sexual history of human evolution. Epochs in which women undress in order to display their bodies alternate with epochs in which men adorn themselves. Epochs of feminine preponderance alternate with times of intrepid gentlemen. This is the story of the ages. When the human being reaches a mature age, he is stimulated by the antithetical cycle, opposite to that which governed during our infancy and youth. Then we are truly mature. We feel sexually stimulated by the sexual opposite. In reality, maturity is marvelous for the work of sexual regeneration. Sexual sentiments are richer and more mature at 40 years of age than at 30. The superman is not the outcome of evolution. The superman is born from the seed. The superman is the result of a tremendous revolution of the consciousness. The superman is the son of man mentioned by Christ. The superman is Adam Christ. Evolution means that nothing is still. Everything exists within the concepts of time, space, and movement. Nature contains within itself all possibilities. No one reaches perfection with evolution. Some people become better, and the vast majority, terribly perverse. This is evolution. The man of innocence, that paradisiacal man of several million years ago, is now, after much evolution, the man of the atomic bomb, the man of the hydrogen bomb, and the corrupted man of embezzlement and crime. Evolution is a process of complication of energy. 
We need to return to the point of departure, sex, and regenerate ourselves. Man is a living seed. The seed, the grain, must make an effort so the superman may germinate. This is not evolution. This is a tremendous revolution of the consciousness. Christ said, and rightly so, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 3 verse 14 The Son of Man is Adam Christ, the Superman. With sexual transmutation, we regenerate ourselves absolutely. The period of sexual ecstasy is always preceded by the period of sexual enjoyment. Thus, the same energy that produces sexual enjoyment, when transmuted, produces ecstasy. The lamp of the Hermit of the Ninth Arcanum, which is normally found enclosed within the deep caverns of the sexual organs, must be placed within the tower of the temple. This tower is the brain. Then we become enlightened. This is the truly positive path that converts us into masters of samadhi, ecstasy. Every true technique of internal meditation is intimately related with sexual transmutation. We need to raise the lamp very high in order to illuminate ourselves. Every novice of alchemy, after being crowned, begins to move away from the sexual act little by little. One increasingly distances himself from the secret connubial in accordance with certain cosmic rhythms marked by the oriental gong. That is how the sexual energies are sublimated, until they are absolutely transmuted to produce continuous ecstasy. The neophyte of alchemy, who in preceding reincarnations worked in the magisterium of fire, accomplishes the work of the sexual laboratory in a relatively short time. But those who work in the great work for the first time need at least twenty years of very intense work, and twenty more in order to withdraw very slowly from the work of the laboratory, a total of forty years in order to accomplish all the work. When the alchemist spills the cup of Hermes, the fire of the laboratory furnace is turned off, and all the work is lost. The age of mystical ecstasy begins when the age of sexual pleasure ends. All those who attain the Venustic initiation have a very difficult task to accomplish afterward. This task consists of the transformation of the sexual energies. Just as we can transplant a vegetable, transfer a plant from one flower pot to another, we must also transplant the sexual energy, extract it from earthly man, and transfer it, transplant it, into the Adam Christ. In alchemy it is said we must liberate the philosophical egg from the filthy putrefaction of matter and deliver it definitively to the Son of Man. The result of this work is astonishing and marvelous. This is precisely the instant in which the Adam Christ can swallow his human consciousness. The consciousness of Adam, the sinner, must have died before this moment. Only the internal God can devour the soul. Upon reaching these heights, the Master has self-realized absolutely. From this moment on, we have attained continuous ecstasy, the supreme illumination of great hierophants. The birth of the Superman is an absolutely sexual problem. We need to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of the heavens. The Superman is as different from man as lightning is from a black cloud. Lightning comes from the cloud but it is not the cloud. Lightning is the Superman, the cloud is man. Sexual regeneration activates the powers we had in Eden. We lost those powers when we fell into animal generation. We reconquer those powers when we regenerate ourselves. Just as the worm can regenerate its body and the lizard its tail, we can also regenerate our lost powers in order to shine once again as gods. Sexual energies once transplanted in the Adam Christ shine with the immaculate whiteness of divinity. These energies then appear as terribly divine rays. The grandeur and majesty of the Superman is tremendous. In reality, the Superman shines for a moment in the night of the ages and then disappears. He becomes invisible to man. Ordinarily, we can find traces of these kinds of beings in some secret schools of regeneration. Almost nothing is officially known about these schools. However, it is because of these secret schools that we know of the existence of those sublime supersexual beings. The regeneration schools have periods of public activity and periods of secret work. The planet Neptune cyclically governs the activity of these schools. In the human organism, Neptune has control over the pineal gland. Only with sexual transmutation is this gland of the gods activated. Uranus controls the sexual glands, and Neptune controls the pineal gland. Uranus is practical sexual alchemy. Neptune is esoteric study. First, we must study, and then work in the laboratory. Uranus has a sexual cycle of 84 years, 
and Neptune a cycle of 165 years. The cycle of Uranus is that of an average human life. The cycle of Neptune is that of public activity in certain schools of regeneration. Only through the path of perfect matrimony do we reach supersexuality. Chapter 7. The Seven Churches. Man is a triad of body, soul, and spirit. A mediator exists between the spirit and the body. This is the soul. We Gnostics know the soul is dressed with a marvelous garment. This is the astral body. We know through our Gnostic studies that the astral body is a double organism endowed with marvelous internal senses. Great clairvoyants speak to us of the seven chakras, and Mr. Ledbeater describes them in great detail. These chakras are really the senses of the astral body. These magnetic centers are found in intimate correlation with the glands of internal secretion. In the laboratory of the human organism, there exist seven ingredients submitted to a triple nervous system. The nerves control the glandular septenary as agents of the law of the triangle. The three different nervous systems, which interact with each other, are the following. First, the cerebrospinal nervous system, agent of conscious functions. Second, the great sympathetic nervous system, agent of subconscious, unconscious, and instinctive functions. Third, the parasympathetic or vagus system, which collaborates by restraining the instinctive functions under the mind's direction. The cerebrospinal system is the divine spirit's throne. The great sympathetic system is the astral body's vehicle. The vagus or parasympathetic obeys the mind's commands. Three rays and seven magnetic centers are the basis for any cosmos, in the infinitely large as well as in the infinitely small. As above, so below. The seven most important glands of the human organism constitute the seven laboratories controlled by the law of the triangle. Each of these glands has its exponent in a chakra of the organism. Each of the seven chakras is found located in intimate correlation with the seven churches of the spinal medulla. The spine's seven churches control the seven chakras of the great sympathetic nervous system. The seven churches become intensely active with the kundalini's ascent along the medullar canal. The kundalini dwells in the electrons. Sages meditate on it, devotees adore it, and in homes where perfect matrimony reigns, it is worked with practically. The kundalini is the solar fire enclosed in the seminal atoms, the ardent electronic substance of the sun, that, when liberated, transforms us into terribly divine gods. The fires of the heart control the kundalini's ascension through the medullar canal. The kundalini develops, evolves, and progresses according to the merits of the heart. The kundalini is the primordial energy enclosed within the church of Ephesus. This church is found two fingers above the anus and two fingers behind the genital organs. The divine serpent of fire sleeps, coiled three and a half times, within its church. When the solar and lunar atoms make contact in the triveni near the coccyx, the kundalini, the igneous serpent of our magical powers, awakens. As the serpent rises through the medullar canal, it puts each of the seven churches into activity. The chakras of the gonads, sexual glands, are directed by Uranus, and the pineal gland, situated in the upper part of the brain, is controlled by Neptune. There is an intimate correlation between these two glands, and the kundalini must connect them with the sacred fire in order to achieve the profound realization. The church of Ephesus is a lotus with four splendid petals. This church has the brilliance of ten million suns. The elemental earth of the sages is conquered with the power of this church. The kundalini's ascent to the prostatic region activates the six petals of the church of Smyrna. This church bestows upon us power to dominate the elemental waters of life and joy of creation. When the sacred serpent reaches the region of the navel, we can dominate volcanoes because the elemental fire of the sages corresponds to the church of Pergamos, situated in the solar plexus. This center controls the spleen, the liver, the pancreas, etc., etc. This center of Pergamos has ten petals. With the ascent of the kundalini to the heart region, the church of Thyatira with its twelve marvelous petals is activated. This church bestows upon us power over the elemental air of the sages. Development of this cardiac center confers inspiration, presentiment, intuition, and powers for departing consciously in the astral body, as well as the power to place our body into the jinn state. The second chapter of Revelation deals with the four lower churches of our organism. These four centers are known as fundamental or basic, prostatic, umbilical, and cardiac. Now we shall study the three upper magnetic centers mentioned in Revelation, chapter 3. These three upper churches are the churches of Sardis, 
Philadelphia, and lastly, Laodicea. The Kundalini's ascent to the region of the creative larynx bestows upon us the power to hear the voices of beings that live in the superior worlds. This chakra is related to pure Akasha. Akasha is the agent of sound. The laryngeal chakra is the church of Sardis. When the Kundalini opens the church of Sardis, it blossoms on our fertile lips made word. The laryngeal chakra has sixteen beautiful petals. Complete development of this Akashic center allows us to keep our bodies alive even during the profound nights of the great Pralaya. Incarnation of the great word is impossible without having awakened the sacred serpent. Akasha is, precisely, the agent of the word. It is to the word what conductive wire is to electricity. The word needs Akasha to manifest itself. Akasha is the agent of sound. The Kundalini is Akasha. Akasha is sexual. The Kundalini is sexual. The magnetic center where the Kundalini normally lives is absolutely sexual, as demonstrated by the concrete fact of the place it is located. Two fingers above the anus, and about two fingers behind the genitals. The space where it is located is four fingers wide. The kundalini can only be awakened and fully developed with sexual magic. This is what infrasexuals do not like. They feel themselves to be super transcendental and mortally hate sexual magic. On one occasion, after listening to a lecture we gave about sexual magic, someone protested saying, that was how we Gnostics were corrupting women. This individual was an infrasexual. The man protested because we were teaching the science of regeneration but meanwhile, he did not protest against intermediate sexuality, nor against prostitutes, nor against the vice of masturbation, nor did he say these people were corrupt. He protested against the doctrine of regeneration but not against the doctrine of degeneration. That is how infrasexuals are, they feel immensely superior to all people of normal sexuality. They protest against regeneration but defend degeneration. Infrasexuals can never incarnate the word. They spit inside the sacred sanctuary of sex, and the law punishes them, hurling them into the abyss forever. Sex is the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. When the Kundalini reaches the height of the space between the eyebrows, the Church of Philadelphia opens. This is the Eye of Wisdom. The Father who is in secret dwells in this magnetic center. The chakra at the space between the eyebrows has two fundamental petals and many splendorous radiations. This center is the throne of the mind. No true clairvoyant says he is one. No true clairvoyant says I saw. The clairvoyant initiate says we consider. All clairvoyants need initiation. The clairvoyant without initiation is at risk of falling into very serious mistakes. The clairvoyant who goes around recounting his visions to the whole world is at risk of losing his faculty. The talkative clairvoyant can also lose his mental equilibrium. The clairvoyant must be quiet, humble, modest. The clairvoyant must be like a child. When the kundalini reaches the height of the pineal gland, the church of Laodicea opens. This lotus flower has a thousand resplendent petals. The pineal gland is influenced by Neptune. When this church opens, we receive polyvision, intuition, etc. The pineal gland is intimately related to the chakras of the gonads or sexual glands. The greater the level of sexual potency, the greater the development of the pineal gland. The lesser the degree of sexual potency, the lesser the degree of development of the pineal gland. Uranus in our sexual organs and Neptune in the pineal gland unite to carry us to total realization. In schools of regeneration, so mortally hated by infrasexuals, we are taught to work practically with the science of Uranus and Neptune. The Tao path includes three paths, this being the fourth. Much has been said about the four ways. We Gnostics traverse the fourth way in full consciousness. During the sexual act, we transmute the brutal instincts of our physical body into willpower, the passionate emotions of the astral into love, the mental impulses into comprehension, and as spirits, we carry out the great work. This is how we traverse the four ways in practice. We do not need to become fakirs for the first path, neither monks for the second, nor scholars for the third. The path of perfect matrimony allows us to traverse the four paths during the sexual act itself. From the first verse to the seventh, Revelation speaks about the coccygeal center. The church of Ephesus is in this center. The igneous serpent has coiled itself three and a half times within this creative center. Whoever awakens the serpent and makes it rise through the spinal medulla receives the flaming sword and then enters Eden. The redemption of man is found in the serpent, but we should be on guard against the serpent's astuteness. 
the forbidden fruit must be contemplated, and its aroma inhaled. But remember what the Lord Jehovah said, If you eat that fruit, you will die. We must enjoy the happiness of love, and adore the woman. A good painting enchants us, a beautiful piece of music carries us to ecstasy, but an adorable, beautiful woman immediately makes us want to hold her. She is the living representation of Godmother. The sexual act with one's beloved has its indisputable delights. Sexual enjoyment is a legitimate right of mankind. Enjoy love's blessing but do not spill the semen. Do not commit sacrilege. Do not be fornicators. Chastity converts us into gods. Fornication converts us into demons. Krumheller said the Scythians adored the great light, and said the sun, in its emanations, forms a nest in us, and constitutes the serpent. The Nazarenes said, All of you shall be gods, if you leave Egypt and cross the Red Sea. Krumheller tells us in his book, The Gnostic Church, that this Gnostic sect had, as a sacred object, a chalice from which they drank the semen of Benjamin. This, according to Hirakocha, was a mixture of wine and water. The great master Krumheller tells us the sacred symbol of the sexual serpent was never missing from the altars of the Nazarenes. Really, the force, the power, that accompanied Moses was the serpent on the staff, which later became the staff itself. The serpent was certainly the one that spoke to the rest of the serpents, and the one that tempted Eve. The sage Hirakocha, in another paragraph of his immortal work entitled The Gnostic Church, said Moses, in the desert, showed his people the serpent on the staff, saying the serpent would not be damaging to the one who made use of it during his journey. All the marvelous powers of Moses resided in the sacred serpent Kundalini. Moses practiced sexual magic extensively in order to raise the serpent upon the staff. Moses had a wife. In the terrifying night of centuries past, sublime and austere hierophants of the great mysteries were the jealous guardians of the great arcanum. The great priests had sworn silence, and the key to the arc of science was hidden from the eyes of the people. Sexual magic was only known and practiced by the great priests. The wisdom of the serpent is the basis of the great mysteries. This was cultivated in the mystery schools of Egypt, Greece, Rome, India, Persia, Troy, Aztec Mexico, Inca Peru, etc. Krumheller tells us that in the hymn of Demeter by Homer, found in a Russian library, we can see that everything revolved around a cosmic physiological fact of great transcendence. In that ancient song of the man-god who sang to old Troy, and Achilles' wrath, we clearly see sexual magic serving as a cornerstone in the great temple of Eleusis. Naked dance, delightful music in the temple, the kiss that intoxicates, the mysterious spell of the secret act, made Eleusis a paradise of adorable gods and goddesses. In those times nobody had dirty thoughts, but only thought of holy and sublime things. It would have occurred to no one to desecrate the temple. Couples knew to withdraw in time to avoid spillage of the sacred wine. In Egypt Osiris, the masculine principle, appears facing Isis, the eternal and adorable feminine. In this sunny country of Kem, the lord of all perfection also worked with the great arcanum A. Zadef, precisely when he was in his initiatic preparation period before beginning his mission. That is how it is written in the memories of nature. In Phoenicia, Hercules and Deianira loved each other intensely. In Attica, Pluto and Persephone, but as Dr. Croem Heller says, among them the phallus and womb are clearly mentioned. This is the lingam yoni of the Greek mysteries. The great priests of Egypt, old heirs of the archaic wisdom the Atlanteans cultivated, depicted the great god Ibis of Thoth with the virile member in a state of erection. And Croem Heller recounts that, over the erect phallus of Ibis of Thoth, a phrase was inscribed, which said, Giver of reason. Next to the inscription a lotus flower shone gloriously. The ancient sages of sacred Egypt engraved the divine symbol of the sexual snake upon their millinery walls. The secret of sexual magic was incommunicable. That is the great arcanum. Those poor wretches who divulged the ineffable secret were sentenced to death. They were taken to a stone patio, and before a millinery wall covered with crocodile skins and indecipherable hieroglyphics, their heads were cut off, their hearts were torn out, and their cursed ashes were thrown to the four winds. This brings to mind the great French poet, Cazat, who died at the guillotine during the French Revolution. At a noted banquet, this man prophesied his own death and the fatal destiny that awaited a certain group of initiate nobles who planned the disclosure of the great arcanum. For some, he prophesied the guillotine, for others, the dagger, poison, jail, exile. 
his prophecies were fulfilled with absolute accuracy. In the Middle Ages, all those who divulged the great arcanum were mysteriously killed, be it by shirt of Nessus, poisoned soaps, or fragrant bouquets that arrived to the door of the condemned as a birthday present, or the dagger. The great arcanum is the key to all powers, and the key to all empires. The powers of nature are unleashed against the daring who attempt to dominate it. The great hierophants hide their secret, and divine kings do not entrust the secret key of their power to any mortal. Unhappy poor wretch is the mortal who, after receiving the secret of sexual magic, does not know how to take advantage of it. For him, it would be better to have never been born, or to hang a millstone around his neck and throw himself to the bottom of the sea. Nature is not interested in mankind's cosmic realization, and it's even contrary to its own interests. That is the reason she opposes with all her might the daring who want to dominate her. Fittingly, a curious anecdote comes to mind. On a certain occasion, a poor customs guard was walking along the beach. Suddenly, something caught his attention. In the sands whipped by the raging waves of the Caribbean, he saw a leather object. The man approached it, and with great surprise he found a small black leather briefcase. He ran immediately to the harbor masters and delivered that object to his superior. Mission accomplished, he went to his house. When he went to work the following day, the superior officer, full of great anger, gave the man a twenty-cent coin while saying, You imbecile, this is what you deserve. Take this coin to hang yourself. You don't deserve to live by the rope with these twenty cents and hang from a tree. Luck came to you, and you disregarded it. The briefcase you delivered to me had close to a million dollars. Get out of here. Out of here, imbecile, you don't deserve to live. Really, this is the fatal destiny that awaits those who do not know how to take advantage of the very precious treasure of the great arcanum. They don't deserve to live. The great arcanum of sexual magic has never before been taught in life, and now we are divulging it. Poor wretches are those who, after coming across the treasure of kings, disregard it, as did the guard in the example. The treasure of the great arcanum is worth even more than the fortune found by the guard. To disregard this is to really be an imbecile. In order to awaken the kundalini, the woman is needed. However, we must warn that the initiate must practice sexual magic with only one woman. Those who practice sexual magic with different women commit the sin of adultery. They do not progress in these studies. Unfortunately, there are certain individuals who utilize sexual magic as a pretext for seducing women. They are profaners of the temple. These types of men inevitably fall into black magic. We warn women to be very careful of these sexually perverse characters. There are also many women who, under the supposed pretext of profound realization, unite with any man. What those passionate women want is to satiate their carnal desires. The world is always the same and, as expected, since we are divulging the great arcanum, swine have appeared who trampled the doctrine and then died poisoned by the bread of wisdom. The cult of sexual magic can only be practiced between husband and wife. We clarify this to avert carnal seductions and sudden impulses and passionate lustful saints. Sexual force is a formidable weapon scientists have not been able to find the origin of electricity. We affirm that the cause of electrical energy must be sought in the universal sexual force. This force not only resides in the sexual organs but also in the atoms and electrons of the universe. The light of the sun is a product of sexuality. An atom of hydrogen unites sexually with an atom of carbon in order to produce solar light. Hydrogen is masculine. Carbon is feminine. Solar light results from the sexual union of both. Studies on the processes of carbon are very interesting. Those processes are the gestation of light. The causal causarum of electricity must be sought in the universal serpentine fire. This fire dwells in electrons. Sages meditate on it, mystics adore it, and those who follow the path of perfect matrimony work practically with it. Sexual force is a formidable weapon in the hands of white magicians and black magicians. Thought attracts sexual fluid to the spine in order to deposit it in its respective sac. With the fatal spillage of this fluid, billions of solar atoms are lost. The movement of sexual contraction that follows the spillage of semen gathers, from the atomic infernos of man, billions of satanic atoms, which replace the lost solar atoms. This is how we form the devil within ourselves. When we refrain the sexual impulse within us, the marvelous fluid returns to the astral body, multiplying its ineffable splendors. This is how we form the Christ within ourselves. 
Thus, with the sexual energy, we can form the Christ, or the devil within ourselves. The great master, in his capacity as the incarnated cosmic Christ, said, I am the bread of life, I am the living bread. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. John 6 verses 35 to 56. Christ is the solar soul, the living spirit of the sun. This, with its life, makes the ear of wheat grow, and all the potency of the solar logos is enclosed in the grain, the seed. The Christonic substance of the solar logos is enclosed in every vegetable animal or human seed, as within a precious case. Making the creative energy return inward and upward, germinates. A marvelous child is born within us, a Christified astral body. This vehicle bestows immortality upon us. This is our Crestos mediator. With this vehicle we reach the Father who is in secret. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14 verse 6 said the Lord of all perfection. The astral phantasm possessed by mortals is nothing more than a sketch of man. It doesn't even have unity. This ghost-like facade is a den of demons and every unclean and hateful bird. Within this astral phantasm lives the I, the devil. This is the infernal legion. The I is a legion. Just as the body is composed of many atoms, so too is the I composed of millions of eyes, diabolical intelligences, repugnant demons that quarrel amongst themselves. When a person dies, he becomes that legion. The person himself becomes dust. Only the legion of eyes remain alive. Clairvoyants often find the disincarnated dressed distinctly and simultaneously in different places. The person seems to have become many people. He's legion. However, when we have given birth to the Christic astral body in ourselves, we continue living in that sidereal body after death. Then we are really immortal. The kinds of people who possess a Christified astral body find themselves with the consciousness awake after death. The common disincarnated leave after death with a sleep consciousness. Death is really returned to fetal conception. Death is returned to the seed. All those who die return to a new maternal womb, totally unconscious, asleep. People don't even have their soul incarnated. The souls of people are disincarnated. People have only an embryo of soul incarnated. Evil people don't even have this embryo of soul. We can incarnate the soul only when we possess a Christified astral body. Common people are only just the vehicle of the eye. The name of each mortal is legion. Only with sexual magic can we cause the Christ astral to be born within us. Temptation is fire. Triumph over temptation is light. Refraining desire makes the astral liquid rise toward the pineal gland, and thus, the Adam Christ, the Superman, is born within us. Upon excitation of the sexual organs to perform the coitus, semen multiplies. When it is not spilled, it transmutes, and it transforms us into gods. Sexual fire is the sword with which the internal God combats the tenebris. All those who practice sexual magic open the seven churches. Whosoever spills the semen, after having worked with the kundalini, inevitably fails, because the kundalini then descends one or more vertebrae according to the magnitude of the fault. We must fight until we reach perfect chastity, or else I will come to you quickly, and will remove your candlestick from its place, unless you repent. Revelation 2 verse 5 the vapor that rises from the seminal system opens the lower orifice of the spinal medulla so the sacred serpent can enter through there. This orifice is found closed in common people. The seminal vapor of black magicians is directed towards the abyss. The seminal vapor of white magicians is raised toward heaven. Opening the church of Ephesus signifies the awakening of the kundalini. The color of this center is a dirty red in the licentious, yellowish red in the initiate and purplish-reddish-blue in the initiated mystic. Solar and lunar atoms rise from the seminal system. The seminal vapors have atoms of the sun and the moon as their basis. Seminal vapors are transmuted into energy. This energy is bipolarized into positive and negative, solar and lunar. These energies rise through the sympathetic channels of Ida and Pingala up to the chalice. This chalice is the brain. The two sympathetic channels through which the semen rises already completely converted into energy, are the two witnesses of revelation, the two olive trees of the temple, the two candlesticks before the god of the earth, the two serpents entwined on the staff of the caduceus of Mercury. When their tails touch, 
solar and lunar atoms make contact in the coccyx, near the triveni. Then the kundalini awakens. The igneous serpent of our magical powers emerges from the membranous pocket where it was enclosed, and rises through the spinal canal toward the chalice, the brain. Certain nerve filaments that connect the seven chakras, or sympathetic plexus, with the spinal column, branch out from the medullar canal. The sacred fire activates the seven magnetic centers. The kundalini marvelously coordinates the activity of all seven chakras. We could illustrate all this by a stem with seven fragrant and beautiful roses. The stem would represent the spinal column, and the seven roses would represent the seven chakras or magnetic centers. The delicate stems of these seven roses of ardent fire are the fine threads which unite them to the spinal column. The powers of light battle the powers of darkness within the semen. The advent of the fire is the most magnificent event of the perfect matrimony. The center where the serpent is coiled has four petals, of which only two are active. The other two are activated with initiation. The prostatic chakra has six beautiful colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. This is the Church of Smyrna. This center is extremely important for the magician. We control the sexual act with this center. This is the magnetic center of practical magic. The third center is the Church of Pergamos. This is the brain of the emotions. We have a veritable wireless station established within the human organism. The receptive center is the umbilical center. The transmitting antenna is the pineal gland. Mind waves of those who think about us reach the umbilical center or brain of the emotions, and later pass to the brain, where we become aware of these thoughts. The Church of Thyatira, the fourth center, is worthy of total admiration. The cardias or cardiac center is intimately related with the heart of the solar system. Mankind is a universe in miniature. If we want to study the universe, we must study mankind. In the universe, we discover mankind. In mankind, we discover the universe. The solar system seen from far away truly seems like a glorious man walking across the unalterable infinite. All time has been transformed there into a living form, full of ineffable music, the music of the spheres. An instant of perception for this celestial man is eighty years. The heart of this celestial man is really found in the center of the solar disk. Those who know how to travel consciously and positively in the astral body are able to visit this temple. A gigantic abyss, blacker than the night, leads to the sanctuary. Few are those brave enough to descend into this fatal abyss. In the frightening depths of that solar abyss, one can perceive formidable things, consuming flames, the terror of the mystery. Whoever has the courage to descend there will find the vestibule of the sanctuary. An adept will bless them with an olive branch. Joyful are those who gain admittance to the secret place. A narrow passageway leads the beloved disciple to the secret place of the sanctuary. This is the cardia of the solar system. Seven saints live in this sacred place. They are the rulers of the seven solar rays. The most important ray is that of the kundalini or serpentine fire, which sparkles intensely in the aurora. Every perfect matrimony must practice sexual magic during the dawn. The solar system is the body of a great being. That one is total perfection. The heart of that great being is the sun. The heart chakra has twelve petals. Six are active and six are inactive. The twelve petals are activated with the sacred fire. We must work on the heart through intense prayer. The fifth center is the Church of Sardis. This is the center of the creative larynx. This is the lotus of sixteen petals. When the human being activates this lotus through the fire, he receives the magical ear. The sacred fire becomes a creator in the throat. Angels create with the power of the word. Fire blossoms on fecund lips made word. The initiate is capable of creating anything with thought, and then materializing it with the word. Hearing with the magical ear has not been well defined by occultists. We should warn here that, whoever has the magical ear, can really hear internal sounds, perceiving them almost physically, or better said, in a form similar to the physical. The magical ear permits us to hear angels. When the totality of the creative energy rises to the brain, we elevate ourselves to the angelic state. Then, we can create with the power of the word. One does not reach these heights through the mechanical evolution of nature. Evolution is movement of universal life, but it doesn't take anyone to the angelic state. Nature is not interested in the superman. She contains all possibilities, but the superman is contrary to her vested interests. The most terrible forces of nature oppose the birth of the superman. The angel, the superman, 
is the result of a tremendous revolution of consciousness. No one is obligated to help the individual in this revolution. This is a very intimate matter for each of us. The problem is absolutely sexual. We must unsheathe the sword and combat the terrible forces of nature which oppose the birth of the Superman. When the sacred fire opens the frontal chakra, the Church of Philadelphia, with its marvelous petals and innumerable splendors, we can then see clairvoyantly. People are accustomed to theorizing in life and swearing to things they have never seen. It is necessary to awaken clairvoyance in order to see the great internal realities. The frontal chakra is the throne of the mind. When study and clairvoyance move together in balance and harmony, we do, in fact, enter the temple of true knowledge. Many are those who affirm what they have read, they repeat borrowed highlights. These kinds of people believe they know but have never seen what they have read about. They're repeating like parrots, that is all. These people know nothing. They are ignorant people. They are learned ignoramuses. In order to know, one must first be. Clairvoyance is the eye of the being. Being and knowing must march in a balanced and parallel way. Those who have read so much occultism feel they are wise. If these poor people have not seen what they have read, you can rest assured they know absolutely nothing. There are all types of seers in the world. The true clairvoyant never goes around saying he is one. Every student of occultism, upon having his first clairvoyant visions, has a tendency to tell the whole world. Then others laugh at him, and since the vibrations of the people are negative, the novice ends up losing mental equilibrium. Clairvoyance without initiation leads students into error, and even to the crime of insult and slander, sometimes even to homicide. Someone who has a flash of clairvoyance sees, for instance, his wife in the astral committing adultery with his friend, and if the seer does not have initiation and is jealous, he could then murder his wife or his friend, even though his unfortunate wife is a saint and his friend a true and loyal servant. Keep in mind that in the astral the human being is legion, and each pluralized I repeats acts committed in previous lives. The great masters of the White Lodge have been slandered by seers. Every master has a double exactly like himself. If the master preaches chastity, his double preaches fornication. If the master does good works, his double does evil works. It is exactly his antithesis. Because of all this, we can only trust in those clairvoyants who have reached the fifth initiation of major mysteries. In addition, we must take into account that before the fifth initiation of major mysteries, the human being does not have at his disposal Christified vehicles to serve as the temple of his internal God. Neither the soul nor the Christ can enter people who do not have organized vehicles. Whoever has not incarnated his soul does not have real existence. He is a legion of eyes that struggle to manifest through the man's body. Sometimes the drinking eye acts, other times the smoking eye, the killing eye, the stealing eye, the eye that falls in love, etc., etc. There is conflict between the eyes. That is why we see many who swear to belong to the Gnostic movement, and then they change their minds and declare themselves enemies of Gnosis. The eye that swears loyalty to Gnosis is displaced by another eye that hates Gnosis. The eye that swears he adores his wife is replaced by another eye that abhors her. The eye is a legion of demons. How can we trust clairvoyants who have not yet incarnated their souls? The man who has not incarnated his soul is still not morally responsible. Could we possibly trust demons? Students of Gnosis should be very careful of those who go around declaring that they are supposedly seers and prophesying to the people. The true clairvoyant never claims to be one. Masters of the fifth initiation of major mysteries are very humble and quiet. No student of occultism is a master. True masters are only those who have reached the fifth initiation of major mysteries. Before the fifth initiation, nobody is a master. The last lotus flower to open is the church of Laodicea. This lotus flower has a thousand petals. This lotus flower shines gloriously on the heads of saints. When the kundalini reaches the pineal gland, this marvelous flower opens. This is the eye of polyvision, the diamond eye. With this faculty, we can study the memories of nature. This is the divine eye of the spirit. The first sacred serpent passes from the pineal gland up to the eye of wisdom, situated between the two eyebrows. Then it penetrates the magnetic field at the bridge of the nose. When it touches the atom of the father situated in that place, the first initiation of major mysteries is attained. No one is a master by the mere fact of having received the first initiation of major mysteries. 
This only means one more has entered the current that leads to nirvana. The student must raise the seven serpents, one after the other. The second serpent belongs to the vital body, the third to the astral, the fourth to the mental, the fifth to the causal. The sixth and seventh serpents are of the soul consciousness and divine spirit. Each of the seven serpents corresponds to an initiation of major mysteries. There are seven serpents, two groups of three, with the sublime coronation of the seventh tongue of fire that unites us with the One, the Law, the Father. We must open the seven churches on each plane of cosmic consciousness. During initiation, the devotee must receive the stigmata of the Christ. Every one of his internal vehicles must be crucified and stigmatized. The stigmata are given to man according to his merits. Each stigma has its esoteric tests. The first stigmata received are those of the hands, and the tests to receive them are very painful. Precious stones also play an important part in initiation. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. Revelation 21 verses 19 to 20. Revelation states, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Revelation 21 verse 6, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Blessed are those who wash their robes, the seven bodies, in the blood of the Lamb, Christonic semen, and may go through the gates into the city. Revelation 22 verses 13 to 14 and 7 14. Nevertheless, there are really so few of those who reach high initiation. Very few are those capable of getting as far as kissing the whip of the executioner. It is very difficult to kiss the hand that beats us, yet it is urgent to do so for those who reach high initiation. Christ said of a thousand that seek me, one finds me, of a thousand that find me, one follows me, of the thousand that follow me, one is mine. What is most grave is that those who have read much occultism and have belonged to many schools are full of platitudinous sanctity. They believe themselves to be very saintly and wise, even though they presume to be humble. These poor brethren are farther from the altar of initiation than the profane. Whoever wishes to reach high initiation must begin by recognizing himself as perverse. Whoever admits his own wickedness is on the road to the realization. Remember that within the incense of prayers also hides crime. This is difficult for those who have read a great deal. These people feel they are full of sanctity and wisdom. When they have flashes of clairvoyance, they are unbearable because they declare themselves to be masters of sapience. Naturally, people like this are sure candidates for the abyss and second death. The abyss is full of the sincerely mistaken and of people with good intentions. When the initiate has made part of his creative fire come out of his head, he throws his crown to the feet of the Lamb. St. John speaks of the twenty-four elders who cast their crowns to the feet of the throne of the Lord. In chapter 19, Revelation describes a rider with a sash on his thigh. On this sash, written in sacred characters, is the phrase, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Indeed, the king is not in the forehead but in sex. Rasputin, inebriated with wine, pounded his sexual phallus on the orgy table saying, This is the king of the world. Fortunate are those couples who know how to love. With the sexual act, we open the seven churches of the Apocalypse and transform ourselves into gods. The seven chakras resound with the powerful Egyptian mantra Fei Yun Dagj. The last word is guttural. The perfect exercise of the seven churches, the complete priesthood, is performed with the body in the jinn state. Great magicians know how to put the body into the jinn state. Then they exercise the full priesthood of the seven churches. When Jesus walked upon the sea, he carried his body in the jinn state. In this state we are omnipotent gods. In the umbilical region, there is a mysterious chakra that the magician uses for his jinn states. If they utilize the power of this chakra, any magician who is far from his physical body can beseech his internal god in this way, My lord, my god, I beg you to bring me my body. The internal god can bring the physical body to the magician in the jinn state, that is, submerged in the astral plane. The mysterious chakra of Jin science spins in those moments. Whoever wants to learn Jin science can study the Yellow Book. We teach this mysterious science in there. The seven churches bestow upon us power over fire, air, water, and earth. 
Chapter 8 Happiness, Music, Dance, and the Kiss Only love and wisdom should reign in the homes of Gnostic brethren. In reality, humanity confuses love with desire and desire with love. Only great souls can and know how to love. In Eden, perfect men love ineffable women. In order to love, we must be. Those who incarnate their soul truly know how to love. The eye does not know how to love. The demon eye that today swears love is replaced by the demon eye that does not feel like loving. We already know the eye is plural. The pluralized eye is really legion. This whole succession of the eye is in constant battle. It is said we have one mind, nevertheless we Gnostics affirm that we have many minds. Each phantasm of the pluralized eye has its own mind. The eye that kisses and adores his beloved wife is replaced by the eye that hates her. One must first be in order to love, man still is not. Whoever has not incarnated the soul is not, man still does not have real existence. A legion of demons speak out of man's mouth. These are demons who swear love. Demons who abandon their beloved. Demons who hate. Demons of jealousy, anger, resentment, etc. Nevertheless, the intellectual animal, mistakenly called man, despite everything, has incarnated the essence, a fraction of his human soul, the Bodhata. It knows how to love. The I does not know how to love. We must forgive the defects of our beloved because these defects are of the I. Love is not to blame for disagreements. The I is the guilty one. The homes of Gnostic initiates must have a backdrop of happiness, music, and ineffable kisses. Dance, love, and the joy of loving strengthen the embryo of the soul that children have within. This is how Gnostic homes are a true paradise of love and wisdom. Liquor and fornication must be banished from the bosom of Gnostic homes. However, we must not be fanatics. Whosoever is incapable of handling one drink at a social gathering is as weak as someone who doesn't know how to control his liquor and gets drunk. Fornication is another thing. That is unpardonable. Whoever ejaculates the seminal liquor is a fornicator. For those, for fornicators, the abyss and second death. Man can be a part of everything, but should not be the victim of anything. He must be the king and not the slave. Someone who has had a drink has not committed a crime, but the one who becomes a slave and victim of that drink has committed a crime. The true master is a king of the heavens, earth, and infernos. The weak one is not king, the weak one is a slave. The initiate only unites sexually with his spouse in order to practice sexual magic. Miserable is the one who unites with his spouse in order to spill the semen. The initiate does not experience the feeling of death that fornicators feel when they lose their semen. Man is one half, and woman is the other half. During the sexual act, they experience the joy of being complete. Those who do not spill the semen preserve this joy eternally. In order to create a child, it is not necessary to spill the semen. The spermatozoan that escapes without spilling the semen is a select spermatozoan. A superior kind of spermatozoan, a totally mature spermatozoan. The result of such fecundation is truly a new creature of the highest order. This is how we can form a race of supermen. It is not necessary to spill the semen in order to engender a child. Imbeciles like to spill the semen. The Gnostic is not an imbecile. When a couple is sexually united, clairvoyants often see a very bright light enveloping the couple. Precisely in that moment, the creative forces of nature serve as a medium for the creation of a new being. When the couple gets carried away with carnal passion and then commits the crime of spilling the semen, those luminous forces withdraw, and in their place, luciferic forces of a blood-red color penetrate, which bring quarrels, jealousy, adultery, weeping, and desperation to the home. That is how homes that could be a heaven on earth become true infernos. People who do not spill their semen retain and accumulate for themselves peace, abundance, wisdom, happiness, and love. Arguments within homes can be eliminated with the key of sexual magic. This is the key to true happiness. During the act of sexual magic, couples charge themselves with magnetism. They mutually magnetize. In the woman, feminine currents flow from the pelvis, while the breasts emit masculine ones. In the man, the feminine current is in the mouth and the masculine in his virile member. All these organs must be well excited through sexual magic in order to give and receive, transmit and gather vital magnetic forces that increase extraordinarily in quantity and quality. Delightful dance, joyful music, and the ardent kiss in the house of Gnostic initiates 
where couples come into such intimate sexual contact, have as their objective the attainment of mutual magnetization of man and woman. The magnetic power is masculine and feminine at the same time. The man needs his wife's currents if he truly wishes to progress, and the woman inevitably needs her husband's currents in order to achieve the development of her powers. When a couple mutually magnetizes, business progresses, and happiness makes a nest in the home. When a man and woman unite, something is created. Scientific chastity allows transmutation of the sexual secretions into light and fire. Every religion that degenerates preaches celibacy. Every religion at its birth and in its glorious splendor preaches the path of perfect matrimony. Buddha was married and established the perfect matrimony. Unfortunately, after 500 years, the prophecy made by the Lord Buddha that his dharma would be exhausted and the sangha would divide into dissident sects was fulfilled with complete accuracy. That was when Buddhist monasticism and hatred of perfect matrimony was born. Jesus, the divine savior, brought Christic esotericism to the world. The adorable one taught his disciples the path of perfect matrimony. Peter, the first pontiff of the church, was a married man. Peter was not celibate. Peter had a wife. Unfortunately, after 600 years, the message of the adorable one was adulterated and the dead forms of Buddhist monasticism returned to the Church of Rome with its cloistered monks and nuns who mortally hate the path of perfect matrimony. It was then, after 600 years of Christianity, that another message about perfect matrimony became necessary. Then came Muhammad, the great preacher of perfect matrimony. Naturally, as always, Muhammad was violently rejected by infrasexuals who hate the woman. The disgusting brotherhood of the enemies of women believe that only by compulsory celibacy can one reach God. This is a crime. Abstinence, as preached by infrasexuals, is absolutely impossible. Nature rebels against such types of abstention. Then come nocturnal pollutions that inevitably ruin the organism. Every abstemious individual suffers nocturnal seminal spillage. A cup that fills up will inevitably overflow. The luxury of abstention is only possible for those who have already reached the kingdom of the Superman. They have converted their organisms into machines of eternal sexual transmutation. They have educated their glands with sexual magic. They are men gods. They are the result of many years of sexual magic and rigorous education in sexual physiology. The initiate loves great classical music and feels repugnance for the infernal music of vulgar people. Afro-Cuban music awakens man's lowest animal instincts. The initiate loves the music of the great composers. For example, the magic flute by Mozart reminds us of an Egyptian initiation. There is an intimate relationship between the word and the sexual forces. The word of the great master Jesus had been Christified by drinking the wine of light of the alchemist in the chalice of sexuality. The soul communes with the music of the spheres when we listen to the nine symphonies of Beethoven, or the compositions of Chopin, or the divine Polonaise of Liszt. Music is the word of the eternal. Our words must be ineffable music. Thus, we sublimate the creative energy to the heart. Disgusting, filthy, immodest, and vulgar words have the power to adulterate the creative energy, converting it into infernal powers. In the mysteries of Eleusis, sacred dances, dances in the nude, the ardent kiss, and sexual connection converted men into gods. It would have occurred to no one to think of perversities, but only of holy and profoundly religious matters. Sacred dances are as ancient as the world and have their origin in the dawn of life on earth. Sufi dances and dancing dervishes are tremendously marvelous. Music should awaken in the human organism for the word of gold to be spoken. The great rhythms of Mahavan and Chodavan with their three eternal bars, sustain the universe steady in its motion. They are the rhythms of the fire. When the soul floats delightfully in sacred space, it must accompany us with its song, because the universe is sustained by the word. The house of Gnostic initiates must be full of beauty. The flowers that perfume the air with their aroma, beautiful sculptures, perfect order and cleanliness, make of each home a true Gnostic sanctuary. The mysteries of Eleusis still exist in secrecy. The great Baltic initiate, von Oxkel, is one of the most exalted initiates of that school. That great initiate practices sexual magic intensely. We must clarify that sexual magic can only be practiced between husband and wife. The male or female adulterer inevitably fails. You can only be married when there is love. Love is law, but conscious love. 
Those who use this knowledge of sexual magic in order to seduce women are black magicians who will tumble into the abyss where wailing and the second death await them, which is thousands of times worse than the death of the physical body. We make an urgent call to the maidens who walk the world, to the naive women. We warn you that you can only practice sexual magic when you have your husband. Take care against such sly foxes who go around seducing naive damsels with the pretext of sexual magic. We warn you so you do not fall into temptation. We also call to the unredeemed fornicators who populate the world. We warn that it is useless to try to hide before the eyes of the Eternal. Those poor women who utilize this knowledge as a pretext in order to satisfy their lust and to lie in beds of pleasure will fall into the abyss where all that awaits them is weeping and the gnashing of teeth. We speak clearly so we will be understood. Go back, profane and profaneous. Sexual magic is a double-edged sword. It transforms the pure and virtuous into gods. It wounds and destroys the wicked and impure. Chapter 9 Ga Yi O oh. When in the sanctum sanctorum of the Temple of Solomon the high priest chanted the formidable mantra E A ah, A ah, the temple drums resounded in order to prevent the profane from hearing the sublime E A A ah, ah. The great master Hirakocha stated the following in the Gnostic Church. Diodorus said, Know that among all gods the highest is E, ah, all. Hades is in the winter, Zeus begins in spring, Helios in the summer, and in autumn E, ah, all enters into activity again, working constantly. E, ah, O is Jove's pater, Jupiter, whom the Jews unjustly call Jave. E, ah, O offers the substantial wine of life while Jupiter is a servant of the sun. E. Ignis, fire, soul. A. Ah, agua, water, substance. O. Origo, cause, air, origin. Hirakocha says E. A. Ah, o is the name of God among the Gnostics. The divine spirit is symbolized by the vowel O, which is the eternal circle. The letter I symbolizes the internal being of each human being, but both are intermingled with the letter A as a point of support. This is the powerful mantra or magic word we must chant when practicing sexual magic with the priestess wife. The sound of the three powerful vowels must be prolonged like this, yi yi a a o, that is to say, extending the sound of each vowel. After having inhaled to fill the lungs, the air is then exhaled. One inhales, counting to twenty, holds the air, counting to twenty, and exhales vocalizing the letter I. Each exhalation is for a count of twenty. Repeat the same for the letter A, then continue with the letter O. This is done seven times. Afterward, continue with the powerful archaic mantras, Kalaka, Salasal, Zizer. Kalaka makes the human spirit vibrate. Salasal vibrates the earthly human personality. Zizar makes the astral body of the human being vibrate. These are very ancient mantras. The divine savior of the world chanted the powerful sacred mantra of fire along with his priestess when practicing with her in the pyramid of Kephren. That is Inri, the lord of all adoration practiced in Egypt with his Isis. He combined this mantra with the five vowels E, E, O, U, A, Inri, Enre, Onro, Unru, Anra. The first is for clairvoyance. The second is for the magic ear. The third is for the heart chakra, the center of intuition. The fourth is for the solar plexus or the telepathic center. The fifth is for the pulmonary chakras. These grant the power to remember past reincarnations. The mantra in Re and its four derivatives applicable to the chakras are vocalized by dividing them into two syllables and then pronouncing the sound of each of their four magic letters. With these mantras we carry the sexual fire to the chakras during the practices of sexual magic. Returning now to the E, A, ah, O, oh, which, as we have already stated, is the name of God among the Gnostics, we will add the following. The vowel E makes the pineal gland and the embryo of soul that every human being has incarnated vibrate. The vowel A puts the physical vehicle into vibration, and the formidable O makes the testicles vibrate, marvelously transmuting the seminal liquor until it is converted into Christic energy that victoriously ascends up to the chalice, brain. The Gospel of St. John begins praising the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John 1 verses 1 to 5. The word John can be broken down into five vowels thus, e, e, o, u, a, e, e, o, u, a, n, John. The entire gospel of John is the gospel of the word. There are people who want to separate the divine word from sexual magic. That is absurd. No one can incarnate the word by excluding sexual magic. Jesus, who is the incarnation of the word itself. Jesus, who is the word itself made flesh, taught sexual magic precisely through the gospel of St. John itself. It is necessary to now study chapter 3 of the gospel of St. John, from verse 1 to 20. Let's see. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do, unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3 verses 1 to 3 Here, dear reader, is a sexual problem. To be born has been and will always be, a sexual problem. No one can be born from theories. We have never met a person born from some theory or hypothesis. To be born is not a question of beliefs. If we could be born simply by believing in the Gospels, why haven't all students of the Bible been born? Being born is not a matter of believing or not believing. No child is born from beliefs. They are born through the sexual act. This is a sexual matter. Nicodemus was unaware of the great arcanum and responded in ignorance, saying, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3 verses 4 to 5 It is necessary for you, reader, to know that the water of the gospel is the semen itself, and the Spirit is the fire. The Son of Man is born from the water and fire. This is absolutely sexual. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. John 3 verses 6 to 7. It is necessary that the Master be born within us. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. John 3 verse 8. Indeed, the one who is born of the Spirit shines for a moment, and later disappears among the multitudes. The multitudes cannot see the Superman. The Superman becomes invisible for the multitudes. Just as the chrysalis cannot see the butterfly when it has flown, likewise the common man loses sight of the Superman. Nicodemus did not understand any of this. Thus, responding, he said, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and do not know these things? John 3 verses 9 to 10. Indeed, Nicodemus knew the sacred scriptures because he was a rabbi, but he did not know sexual magic because Nicodemus was not an initiate. Jesus continued saying, Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. John 3 verse 11. Jesus gave testimony of what he knew, of what he had seen, and of what he had experienced for himself. Jesus practiced sexual magic with a vestal of the Pyramid of Kephron. Thus, he was born. This is how he prepared himself in order to incarnate the Christ. Thus, he was able to incarnate the Christ in the Jordan. We all know that after leaving Egypt, Jesus traveled through India, Tibet, Persia, etc., and after returning to the Holy Land, he received the Venustic initiation in the Jordan. When John baptized Master Jesus, the Christ entered the soul of the Master. The Christ was humanized. Jesus was divinized. The outcome of this divine and human mixture is that which is called the Son of Man, the Superman. If Jesus had not practiced sexual magic in Egypt, he would not have been able to incarnate the Christ. He would have been a great master but not the living model of the Superman. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? John 3 verse 12 with this, the great master corroborates that he is talking about earthly things, about the practice of sexual magic. Without this, one cannot be born. If people do not believe in earthly things, how can they believe in the heavenly ones? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. John 3 verse 13
The eye cannot ascend to heaven because it did not descend from heaven. The eye is Satan and must inevitably be dissolved. That is the law. Speaking about the sacred serpent, the great master said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 3 verse 14 We must lift up the serpent upon the staff as Moses did in the wilderness. This is a matter of sexual magic because the kundalini only rises with sexual magic. Only thus can we lift up the Son of Man, the Superman, within ourselves. It is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3 verse 15 The rational homunculus, mistakenly called man, still does not have the authentic astral, mental, and causal vehicles. Really, it's only just a phantom. It is necessary to practice sexual magic in order to live the path of perfect matrimony, in order to engender the Christ astral, Christ mind, and Christ causal. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3 verses 16 to 18 We affirm that true faith and belief is shown with actions. Anyone who does not believe in sexual magic cannot be born even though he says, I believe in the Son of God. Faith without deeds is dead. Anyone who does not believe in the sexual magic taught by Jesus to Nicodemus does not believe in the Son of God. Those people are lost. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, hates sexual magic, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed, impugned. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. John 3 verses 19 to 21. All of this is quoted from the Holy Gospel of John. One must be born on all the planes. What does a poor man or woman filled with theories do when practicing exercises, etc., etc., without having been born in the astral? What good does it do to work with the mind if you still do not have the mental body? The first thing that a human being must do is to engender his internal vehicles, and then he can practice whatever he wants and study whatever he wants. However, we must first create the internal vehicles in order to have the right to incarnate the soul, and later the word. When the legitimate astral is born, we become immortal in the world of twenty-four laws, the lunar world. When the authentic mental is born, we immortalize ourselves in the world of twelve laws, the world of Mercury, or of the mind. When the true causal vehicle is born, we acquire immortality in the world of six laws, the causal world, or world of Venus. When we reach these heights, we incarnate our human soul and become true men. Those Christic vehicles are born through sex, it is a sexual matter. As above, so below. If the physical body is born through sex, the superior vehicles are born through sex. Whoever engenders his Christic vehicles incarnates his soul, and then speaks with the word of gold. This is the language of power that man spoke in the ancient land called Arcadia, where children of fire were worshipped. That is the language the entire universe speaks, a divine and terribly powerful language. This was the mysterious language in which the angel of Babylon wrote the terrible, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharsan, at the famous banquet of Belshazzar. That same night, the sentence was carried out, Babylon was destroyed, and the king died. A great deal has been said about the universal language, but we can speak it only when we incarnate the soul. Then the kundalini flourishes on our fertile lips, made word. When humanity left paradise as a result of spilling the semen, they forgot the divine language that flows majestically, like a river of gold through the thick jungle of the sun. The roots of all languages correspond to the divine primitive language. Sexual magic is the only path that exists to once again speak the divine language. There is a close relationship between the sexual organs and the creative larynx. In the old mystery schools, initiates were forbidden to tell of the antediluvian catastrophes for fear of evoking them and bringing them into manifestation again. The old hierophants knew there was an intimate relationship between the elements of nature and the word. The book entitled Logos, Mantra, Magic, by the great Gnostic Rosicrucian master, Dr. Arnold Krumheller, 
is a true jewel of occult wisdom. The great master concludes his book by saying the following, In ancient times, a mystery school existed in which there was a ring, upon which appeared the engraved image of Isis and Serapis, united by a snake. Dr. Krum Heller continues, Here I synthesize everything I have stated in this book. In the eighth lesson of his zodiacal course, Dr. Krum Heller wrote a paragraph that scandalized many know-it-alls. After the master's death, they tried to adulterate this paragraph in their own way, each according to their own theories. Now let's transcribe the paragraph exactly as Master Huirakocha wrote it. Let's see, instead of the coitus which reaches orgasm, sweet caresses, amorous phrases and delicate touching should be lavished reflectively, keeping the mind constantly separated from animal sexuality, sustaining the purest spirituality, as if the act were a true religious ceremony. Nevertheless, the man can and should introduce the penis, and keep it inside the feminine sexual organ, to bring upon both a divine sensation, full of joy that can last for hours, withdrawing at the moment the spasm is near, to avoid the ejaculation of the semen. In this way, they will have a greater yearning each time to caress each other. This may be repeated as many times as they wish without ever becoming overcome by weariness because, quite the opposite, it is the magic key to daily rejuvenation, keeping the body healthy, and prolonging life, since it is a fountain of health with this constant magnetization. We know that in ordinary magnetism, the magnetizer communicates currents to the subject, and if the former has those forces developed, he can heal the latter. The transmission of magnetic currents is ordinarily done through the hands or through the eyes, but it is necessary to say that there is no greater and more powerful conductor, a thousand times more powerful, a thousand times superior to the rest, than the viral member and the vulva as receptive organs. If many people practice this, they spread force and success in their surroundings for all those who come into commercial or social contact with them. But in the act of sublime divine magnetization to which we are referring, both man and woman reciprocally magnetize each other, being for one another as a musical instrument which when plucked, gives off or emits prodigious sounds of mysterious and sweet harmonies. The strings of that instrument are spread all over the body, and it is the lips and fingers that make them vibrate provided that the utmost purity presides over the act. This is what makes us magicians in that supreme moment. This is the end of Dr. Krum Heller's words. This is the path of initiation. One reaches the incarnation of the word through this path. We may be Rosicrucian, Theosophist, or Spiritualist students. We may practice yoga, and there is no doubt that in all this there are marvelous works and magnificent esoteric practices, but if we do not practice sexual magic, we will not create the Christ astral, the Christ mental, the Christ will. Without sexual magic, we cannot be born again. Practice what you will, study in the school you like most. Pray in the temple that pleases you most, but practice sexual magic. Leave the path of perfect matrimony. We are not against any holy religion, nor against any school, order, or sect. All of these sacred institutions are necessary, but we advise you to live the path of perfect matrimony. Perfect matrimony is not opposed to religious life or to the esoteric practices of holy yoga. The Gnostic movement is made up of people from all religions, schools, lodges, sects, orders, etc., etc. Remember, beloved reader, the sacred jewel with its E, A, O, within Ga, E, O is hidden E, A, O. Work with E. Ah. Oh. The priest, the master of every lodge, the disciple of yoga, everyone, everyone will be able to be born, will be able to preserve their true chastity if they practice sexual magic. Blessed be. Ah. Oh. Blessed be sexual magic. Blessed be perfect matrimony. Within sexual magic we find the synthesis of all the religions, schools, orders, and yogas. Every system of self-realization without sexual magic is incomplete, therefore it is useless. Christ and sexual magic constitute the supreme practical synthesis of all religions. Chapter 10. Direct Knowledge All those who study occultism want direct knowledge. They yearn to know how they are doing, they want to know about their own inner progress. Every student's greatest aspiration is to be able to convert themselves into a conscious citizen of the superior worlds and study at the foot of the master. Unfortunately, occultism is not as simple as it seems. The internal powers of the human race are completely damaged and atrophied. Human beings have not only ruined their physical senses but, 
Moreover, and what is worse, their internal faculties. This has been the karmic result of our bad habits. The student searches here and there, reads and rereads any book about occultism and magic that falls into his hands, and all the poor aspirant does is fill himself with terrible doubts and intellectual confusion. There are millions of theories and thousands of authors. Some repeat the ideas of others. This author refutes that author. It's all against one, and one against all, colleague to colleague. They ridicule and fight against each other, and it's really all against all. Some authors advise devotees to be vegetarians, others say they should not be. Some advise them to practice breathing exercises, others say they should not practice them. The result is horrifying for the poor seeker. He does not know what to do. Yearning for the light, he supplicates, begs, nonetheless, nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing happens. What to do? We have met extremely mystical individuals, group, heroes. Many of them are vegetarians, abstemious, virtuous, etc. They are usually very sincere and want the best for their followers. However, they sigh like everyone else. They suffer and cry in secret. These poor people have never seen what they preach. They do not know their guru. They have never had the joy of speaking with him personally. They have never seen the planes of cosmic consciousness, the planes or superior worlds of which they make such pretty diagrams and such interesting descriptions. We, the brethren of the temple, feel true pity for them and try to help them. That is what we attempt to do but all is useless. They hate everything about sex, whatever resembles sex. When we speak to them about perfect matrimony, they laugh and protest angrily, defending their sexual abstention. Those poor blind leading the blind need someone to guide them. They suffer a lot because they do not have the joy of having direct knowledge. They suffer quietly so as not to discourage or disappoint their followers. We, the brethren of the temple, frankly love and pity them. It is necessary to stop theorizing. The opium of theories is more bitter than death. The only path for reconquering lost powers is sexual magic. The great arcanum has the advantage of regenerating man. Man needs to regenerate, and this is not a matter of authors or libraries. We need to work with the grain, with the seed. Just as the lizard can regenerate its tail, and the worm can regenerate itself, so too can man regenerate his lost powers. These animals can replace their lost tail with the sexual force they possess. So man can replenish, reconquer, his internal powers with that same sexual force. The suffering pilgrims can reach direct knowledge by this path. So they will become true enlightened priests for their fraternal groups. The path is sexual magic. Every guide must be clairvoyant and clairaudient. Next, we give an exercise to develop clairvoyance and the occult ear. After having these faculties, it is good to remain for periods of time within the deepest forests, away from urban life. In the peacefulness of nature, the gods of fire, air, water, and earth teach us ineffable things. It's not about living only in the forest. What's a saint doing in the forest? However, we should have a good holiday in the countryside, that's all. Perfect mental equilibrium is of vital importance for spiritual progress. Almost all aspirants of esotericism easily lose their mental equilibrium and fall into the most absurd things. Those who yearn for direct knowledge should concern themselves with keeping their minds in perfect equilibrium. Practice The great master Huirakocha teaches a very simple practice for seeing the tattvas. Tattva is the vibration of ether. The exercise is as follows. The devotee puts his thumbs in his ears. He closes his eyes and seals them with his index fingers. He closes his nostrils with his middle fingers, and finally, seals his lips with his ring and little fingers. In this condition, the student must try to see the tattvas with the sixth sense. This eye is found between the eyebrows. Yogananda, who gives the same exercise as Kromheller, advises to also use the mantra Om. Yogananda says that devotees should rest their elbows on some cushions. These will be placed on a table. The devotee will do this practice at the table, facing east. Yogananda advises that the chair on which the devotee sits to do this practice should be wrapped in a wool blanket. This reminds us of Apollonius of Tiana, who wrapped himself in a woolen mantle to totally isolate himself from disquieting currents. Many authors give this exercise, and we consider it to be very good. We believe clairvoyance and the magical ear are developed with this practice. Initially, devotees will see only darkness. However, with more effort in the practice, their clairvoyance and magical ear will develop slowly but surely. In the beginning, devotees will hear nothing but physiological sounds but little by little, 
they will hear more and more delicate sounds during the practice. This is how they will awaken their magical ear. Instead of giving himself indigestion with so many contradictory theories, it is better that the reader practice and develop his internal faculties. The process of regeneration must proceed intimately associated with esoteric exercise. Science says an unused organ becomes atrophied. It is necessary to use the organs of clairvoyance and of the magical ear. It is urgent that we exercise with these organs and regenerate them in order to attain internal realization. These practices are not against any religion, sect, school, or belief. All priests, guides, instructors of all schools and orders can do these exercises to develop their faculties. Thus, they can better lead their respective groups. Awakening of internal faculties should run parallel with cultural, intellectual, and spiritual development. The clairvoyant must also develop all the chakras so as not to fall into serious error. Most clairvoyants have made serious mistakes. Almost all famous clairvoyants have filled the world with tears. Almost all great clairvoyants have slandered people. Poorly used clairvoyance has led to divorces, assassinations, adultery, robbery, etc. The clairvoyant needs logical thought and exact concepts. The clairvoyant must have perfect mental equilibrium. The clairvoyant must be powerfully analytical. The clairvoyant must be mathematical in investigation and demanding in expression. Clairvoyance demands perfect development of clairaudience, intuition, telepathy, premonition, and other faculties in order to function correctly. Chapter 11. Be Fruitful and Multiply. In Genesis, it states, Be fruitful and multiply. To be fruitful means to transmute and sublimate the sexual energy in order to grow spiritually. The word multiply refers to reproduction of the human species. There are two types of children mentioned in the Bible, the children of God and the children of men. Children of God are those who result from sexual magic when there is no seminal spillage. Those who result from passionate pleasure with spillage of semen are children of men. We need to engender children of God and then fight for their spiritual growth. Education of Children Children learn more by example than by precepts. If we want our children to grow spiritually, we should concern ourselves with our own spiritual growth. It's not enough to multiply ourselves, we also need to grow spiritually. Sin Our resplendent dragon of wisdom has three aspects. They are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is light and life. The Son is the water and blood that flowed from the Lord's side, wounded by the lance of Longinus. The Holy Spirit is the Pentecostal fire or the fire of the Holy Spirit called Kundalini by the Hindus, the igneous serpent of our magical powers, the holy fire symbolized by gold. We sin against the Father when we tell lies. We sin against the Son when we hate someone. When we fornicate, that is to say, when we spill the semen, we sin against the Holy Spirit. The Father is truth, the Son is love, the Holy Spirit is sexual fire. Education We must teach our children to tell the truth, and nothing but the truth. We must teach our children the law of love. Love is law, but conscious love. We must teach our children the mysteries of sex when they are at the age of 14. Based upon this triple aspect of sanctity and perfection, our children will thus grow spiritually. Whoever guides their children by this triple aspect of perfection will have established a foundation of steel for their happiness. Nonetheless, it is necessary to teach them not only with precepts but also by example. We must show with deeds that which we preach. Profession. Modern life demands that we prepare our children more intellectually. It is right for them to have a profession in order to make a living. We need to carefully observe the vocational dispositions of our children in order to guide them intellectually. We should never leave a son or daughter without a profession. Every human being needs to learn some profession in order to live. It is a very serious crime to leave a child helpless and without a profession. Concerning daughters. Modern times demand that our daughters receive solid intellectual and spiritual preparation. It is indispensable that mothers teach their daughters the mysteries of sex when they reach the age of 14. It is right that they walk along the threefold path of truth, love, and chastity. The modern woman must have a profession to make a living. It is necessary for fathers and mothers to understand that their daughters also need to grow spiritually and multiply through perfect matrimony, but do everything respectably and with order. It is absurd for daughters to walk alone in the streets or in parks, or go to cinemas or dances with a boyfriend. Since they have not yet killed the animal ego, they are easily sexually seduced and fail miserably. Daughters should always be accompanied by their parents or relatives, 
and should never be alone with a boyfriend. Parents should never impede the marriage of their daughters. However, I repeat, do everything with law and order. It is necessary to reproduce with chastity and to grow spiritually. That is the path of perfect matrimony. Chapter 12. Two Rituals. There are certain tenebrous rites which have been preserved since the most remote epochs of history. The witches of Thessaly celebrated certain rituals in their cemeteries or pantheons to evoke the shadows of the dead. On the death anniversary of their loved ones, they congregated at the cemetery tombs, and amidst terrifying shrieks they pierced their breasts for blood to flow. This served as a vehicle for the shadows of the dead to materialize in the physical world. The great initiate Homer recounts in the Odyssey about a ritual celebrated by a sorcerer on the island of Aea, where the cruel goddess Circe reigned. The priest slit the throat of a beast in a pit, filling it with blood. The priest invoked the fortune teller of Thebes. Homer tells that the fortune teller answered the call and was able to totally materialize thanks to the blood. The fortune teller of Thebes spoke personally with Ulysses and predicted many things. The wise author of Thus Spoke Zarathustra stated, Write with blood, and you will discover that blood is spirit. Gota exclaimed through his Mephistopheles, Blood is a quite special fluid. The Last Supper The Last Supper is a magical ceremony with immense power, something very similar to the archaic ceremony of the Brotherhood of Blood. The tradition of this brotherhood indicates that, if two or more people mix their blood in a cup and drink of it, they remain eternally united through the blood. The astral vehicles of these people then become intimately associated for all eternity. The Hebrew people assign very special characteristics to blood. The Last Supper was a blood ceremony. Each of the apostles brought drops of his own blood in their cups and emptied these drops into the chalice of Christ Jesus. The adorable had also placed his own royal blood in that chalice. Thus the blood of Christ Jesus was mixed with the blood of his disciples within the Holy Grail. Tradition tells us that Jesus also gave infinitely small particles of his own flesh to his disciples to eat. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Luke 22 verses 19 to 20. Thus the pact was signed. All pacts are signed with blood. The astral body of Christ Jesus remained associated, united, with his disciples and with all of humanity through the blood pact. The adorable is the savior of the world. This blood ceremony is as ancient as the infinite. All the great avatars have verified it since ancient times. The great lord of Atlantis also held the last supper with his disciples. This blood ceremony was not improvised by the divine master. This is a very ancient archaic ceremony the blood ceremony of the great avatars. Every Gnostic unction, whatever the worship or belief, denomination or religion, is associated, intimately united with the Last Supper of the Adorable, through the blood pact. The early holy Gnostic Christian church, to which we have the joy of belonging, preserves in secrecy the original rituals used by the apostles. These were the rituals of the Christians that met in the catacombs of Rome during the time of the Nero Caesar. These were the rituals of the Essenes, a humble caste of great initiates among whom Christ Jesus was counted. These are the primeval rituals of the ancient Christians. These rituals have power. The whole of our secret science of the great arcanum is contained within them. When we ritualize, we vocalize certain mantras that have the power to sublimate the sexual energy up to the heart. The internal Christ lives in the heart temple. When the sexual energies are sublimated to the heart, they have the immense joy of mixing with the forces of the internal Christ so they can enter the superior worlds. Our rituals are repeated in all seven great cosmic planes. The ritual ceremony establishes a secret channel from the physical region, passing through all seven great planes to the world of the solar logos. Christic atoms of the solar logos descend through that channel and then accumulate in the bread and wine. This is how the bread and wine really do become the flesh and blood of the Christ through the work of transubstantiation. Upon eating the bread and drinking the wine, the Christic atoms spread throughout our body and pass into the internal bodies to awaken in us the powers of solar nature. The apostles drank the blood of the Christ and ate the flesh of the Christ. Sexual Forces and Ritual In the book The Bush of Horeb by Dr. Adum, Chief Magician, we have found the description of a black mass from medieval times. Dr. Adum transcribes a paragraph taken from a book by Hoismans. 
This is such an interesting description that we cannot but make it known to our readers. Let us see. As a general rule a priest would officiate. He would completely undress, then put on an ordinary chasuble. On the altar, there lay a naked woman, usually a petitioner. Two naked women served as acolytes. At times adolescents were used, who would necessarily be naked. Those who attended the service would be dressed or naked according to the whim of the moment. The priest would carry out all the exercises of the ritual, and the audience present accompanied the representation with obscene gestures. The atmosphere became more and more charged, the environment became fluid to a highest degree. Everything came together, by the way, the silence, darkness, and seclusion. The fluid was attractive, that is to say, it put the participants in contact with the elementals. If, during the ceremony, the woman lying upon the altar concentrated her attention on a desire, it was not unusual to produce an absolutely real transmission of that desire. A transmission that converted it, the object of her desire, into a true obsession. This was the goal, finally achieved. Therefore, that day, or during the following days, when the realization of the desired phenomenon occurred, it was attributed to the generosity of Satan. Nevertheless, this fluid ambience always had an inconvenience, to exacerbate the nerves and to produce in some member of the assembly, a hysterical crisis, which sometimes became collective. It was not unusual to see the women out of their minds, and pulling off their clothes at a given moment, and the men abandoning themselves to wild gesticulations. Suddenly, two or three women would even fall to the ground, prey to violent convulsions. They were simply mediums who entered a trance. It was said they were possessed, and everyone seemed to be satisfied. That is as far as we will go with the story told by Hoysman's transcribed by Dr. Adum. Through this story, we can realize how rituals and sexual forces were misused for acts of terrible evil. Clearly, during a ritual of this type, the overexcited nervous state absolutely sexual and marked by passion violently determines a certain type of mental force saturated with creative energy. The outcome of such a ritual is a magical phenomenon. All rituals have to do with blood and semen. Ritual is a double-edged sword that defends and gives life to the pure and virtuous. It hurts and destroys the impure and tenebrous. Ritual is more powerful than dynamite and the knife. In a ritual, nuclear forces are handled. Atomic energy is a gift of God. Just as it can heal, it can kill. Every temple within which the holy Gnostic unction is celebrated is in fact, and for that reason, an atomic energy plant. In Atlantis, black magicians also used similar rituals combined with sexual forces. The result of those abuses was the sinking of that continent, which had previously reached an extremely high degree of civilization. Sexual forces are closely related to the four elements of nature. All black rituals, every black mass, has its fatal coordinates in nature. We now explain what the causes for the sinking of Atlantis were. Sexual energy is like electricity. It is found everywhere. It is a force that resides in electrons. That force flows in the nucleus of each atom and in the center of each nebula. Without that force, the worlds in infinite space would not exist. It is the creative energy of the third logos. White and black magicians work with that force. White magicians work with white rituals. Black magicians work with black rituals. The Last Supper of the Adorable Savior of the World has an archaic and very ancient tradition that is lost in the night of the centuries. The black mass and all those black ceremonies of the tenebris come from a very ancient lunar past. In every epoch, two rituals have always existed, one of light and the other of darkness. Ritual is practical magic. Black magicians mortally hate the Holy Eucharist. Magicians of darkness justify their hatred for the rituals of bread and wine in the most diverse ways. Sometimes they give the Gospels the most capricious interpretations of their fantasy. Their own subconscious betrays them. They try to do away with the Last Supper in any way possible. They hate the Last Supper of the Adorable. Our disciples must be alert and vigilant for these types of dangerous subjects. Anyone who hates the rituals of the Last Supper is a black magician. Anyone who rejects the bread and wine of the holy Gnostic unction, in fact, rejects the flesh and blood of the Christ. Those types of people are black magicians. The Gnostic Church There are four very important paths that every perfect matrimony must know. First, the path of the fakir. Second, the path of the monk. Third, the path of the yogi. Fourth, the path of the well-balanced man. 
The universal Christian Gnostic movement has school and religion. We live the first path in practical life, learning to live righteously. The second path resides within our church. It has its sacraments, rituals, and its cloistered life. We live the third path as practical occultists. We have our esoteric practices, special exercises for the development of latent faculties in man. We live the fourth path, which is the path of the astute man, by practicing in the most complete equilibrium. We study alchemy and Kabbalah. We work on disintegration of the psychological eye. We are not members of the Roman Catholic Church. That church only follows the path of the monk. We traverse all four paths. We have the path of the monk in our Gnostic religion with its patriarch, archbishops, bishops, and priests. That is why we do not belong to the Church of Rome. We are not against any religion, school, or denomination either. Many priests of the Church of Rome have joined our ranks. People from all organizations have joined our Gnostic movement. Our Gnostic Church is the most complete. On the path of the fakir, we learn to live righteously. On the path of the monk, we develop emotion. On the path of the yogi, we practice esoteric exercises that activate the latent occult powers of man. On the path of the balanced man, we work with alchemy and the Kabbalah, and we fight to disintegrate the eye. Our Gnostic Church is the transcendent church. That church is found in the superior worlds. We also have many temples in the physical world. In addition, we have opened thousands of Gnostic Lemigios where one celebrates the holy rituals and studies the secret doctrine of the adorable Savior of the world. We must not forget that our Gnostic movement has school and religion at the same time. It has already been definitively proven that Jesus the Christ was Gnostic. The Savior of the world was an active member of the Essene caste, mystics who never cut their hair or beards. The Gnostic Church is the authentic early Christian church, whose first pontiff, was the Gnostic initiate called Peter. Paul of Tarsus belonged to it, he was a Nazarene. The Nazarenes were another Gnostic sect. The early Christian church was the true esoteric trunk from which many neo-Christian denominations sprung forth such as Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, Adventism, the Armenian Church, etc. Frankly, we have resolved to make publicly known the root of Christianity, Gnosticism. This is the early Christian church. To this Gnostic church belonged the patriarch Basilides, a famous alchemist who left a seven-page book of lead, which is preserved in the Kircher Museum of the Vatican, according to Master Kromheller. This book cannot be understood by archaeologists because it is a book of occult science. Basilides was a disciple of St. Matthias. Roman Catholicism of today is not true Catholicism. Legitimate, authentic Catholicism is the early Gnostic Christian Catholic one. The current Roman denomination is only a deviation of early Gnostic Catholicism. Frankly, this is the basic reason why we have completely distanced ourselves from the Roman denomination. Saints such as Saturninus of Antioch, the celebrated Kabbalist, belong to the early Gnostic Christian Catholic Church. Simon the Magician, who lamentably deviated, Carpocrates, who founded several Gnostic monasteries in Spain, Massian of Ponto, Saint Thomas, Valentinus, the great master of the major mysteries called St. Augustine, Tertullian, St. Ambrose, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Epiphanius, Clement of Alexandria, Mark, the great Gnostic who took care of the holy Gnostic unction and left us extraordinary teachings about the path of sexual forces through the twelve zodiacal gates of the human organism, Serto Empedocles, St. Geronimo, and many other saints of the early Gnostic Christian Catholic Church from which the current Roman sect deviated, were also Gnostic. Sacraments. In our Gnostic Church, we have baptism, communion of bread and wine, marriage, confession, friendly conversations between masters and disciples, and finally, extreme unction. The Gnostic marriage in the Transcendent Church is very interesting. In this sacrament, the woman is dressed in the garment of the Gnostic priestess, and she is presented to her husband as his wife. The holy masters officiate in this, and she is received as a wife with the promise to not fornicate. The Christ. The Gnostic Church adores the Savior of the world called Jesus. The Gnostic Church knows that Jesus incarnated the Christ and therefore adores Him. Christ is not a human nor a divine individual. Christ is a title given to all fully realized masters. Christ is the army of the voice. Christ is the Word. The Word is far beyond the body, soul, and spirit. In fact, everyone who manages to incarnate the Word receives the title of Christ. Christ is the Word itself.
It is necessary for each of us to make flesh the Word. When the Word becomes flesh in us, we speak with the Word of light. At present, several masters have incarnated the Christ. In secret India, the Christ Yogi Babaji, the immortal Babaji, has lived for millions of years. The great master of wisdom Kudhumi also incarnated the Christ. Sanat Kumara, founder of the great college of initiates of the White Lodge, is another living Christ. In the past, many incarnated it. In the present, some have incarnated it. In the future, many will incarnate it. John the Baptist also incarnated the Christ. John the Baptist is a living Christ. The difference between Jesus and the other masters, who also incarnated the Christ, has to do with hierarchy. Jesus is the highest solar initiate of the cosmos. Resurrection The Supreme Great Master, Jesus, lives today with the same physical body resurrected from among the dead. The Great Master currently lives in Shambhala. This is a secret country of eastern Tibet. Many other resurrected masters live with the Supreme Great Master and collaborate with him in the great work of the Father. Unction The initiated priest, in a state of ecstasy, perceives the Christ's substance and magically transmits his own influence to the bread and wine, thus awakening the Christianic substance found in these elements, so it can work miracles by awakening the Christic powers of our internal bodies. Sacred Vestments In the great Gnostic cathedrals, Gnostic priests usually wear the three vestments of all Catholic priests, cassock, surplice, and chasuble. These three vestments legitimately belong to the early Gnostic Christian Catholic Church. The beretta is also used. The three superimposed vestments represent the body, soul, and spirit, the physical, astral, and spiritual worlds. The beretta signifies he is a man. When he preaches, he covers his head to signify he only expresses personal opinions. In Gnostic Lamigials, the priest only wears a sky-blue tunic with a white cord at the waist. He wears sandals. The Isises of Gnostic Lamigials cover their heads with a white veil. That's all. At one point, we directed attendees to wear their own tunic, a tunic similar to that which one's own intimate, wears internally according to the esoteric degree. Later we had to prohibit this custom, due to the abuses of many attendees, who, believing themselves to be high initiates, dressed in beautiful tunics and took on high-sounding names. Moreover, this lent itself to pride. Many who saw themselves in tunics of certain degrees were filled with vanity and pride during the rite and they looked with contempt on those of less esoteric degrees. The officiating altar. The officiating altar must be made of stone. Remember that we work with the philosopher's stone, sex. The altar also signifies the philosophical earth. The base of the chalice, the stem of the plant, and the sacred cup symbolize the flower. This means the Christianic substance of the sun penetrates the womb of the earth, and makes the grain germinate, and grow the sprig of wheat until the fruit, the seed, appears. After the grain has been given, the rest dies. All the power of the sun Christ remains enclosed within the grain. The same happens with wine. The sun causes the grapes to ripen. All the power of the sun Christ remains enclosed within the grape. With the Gnostic unction, all the Christic solar powers are freed from the bread and wine. Then they act within our organism, Christifying us. Epiphany Epiphany is the manifestation, or revelation, or ascension of the Christ within us. According to Krumheller, Dietrich, the great theologian stated, to discover that which you desire, religare or union with divinity, you have to discover through these four ways, receiving God, the Eucharist, amorous union, sexual magic, filial love, to feel oneself a child of God, death, and reincarnation. The Gnostic lives these four paths. The Praetor. There is a Gnostic church, the Cathedral of the Soul, in the superior worlds. In that cathedral, rituals are performed on Fridays and Sundays at dawn, or whenever necessary for the good of humanity. Many devotees meet with the Praetor in their astral bodies. There are also some athletes of Jin science who take their physical body to the Praetor. There, all these devotees have the fortune of receiving the bread and wine. Key to travel in the astral consciously. The key to travel in the astral is very simple. It's enough to fall asleep, mentally pronouncing the powerful mantra Fa, Ra, An. This mantra is divided into three syllables Fa, Ra, An. When the devotee finds himself in that state of transition that exists between wakefulness and sleep, he goes deep within himself by way of conscious self-reflection, and then gently jumps from bed, completely identified with his light, fluidic spirit. In the astral body, each devotee can meet with the preter. 
People who have not yet engendered their Christ astral suffer greatly because after much work, they fail to learn to go out in the astral without thousands of difficulties. Those who in past reincarnations engendered the Christ astral leave the physical body with great ease. Key to take the physical body into the jinn state. The disciple will concentrate on Master Obwara. The disciple should fall asleep reciting this prayer. I believe in the Christ. I believe in Obwara, Babaji, Mataji and the jinn masters. Take me from my bed with my physical body. Take me to the Gnostic church with my physical body in the jinn state. The devotee will pray this prayer thousands of times. The devotee should fall asleep praying this prayer. When the devotee feels more asleep than awake, when he feels his body is weak and full of lassitude, when he feels intoxicated with sleep, when he begins to dream, he should get out of bed, preserving his sleep as a miser guards his treasure. All the power is in the sleep. In those moments, formidable forces are working to raise the physical body's vibration, accelerating the movement of the atom to astonishing speeds. Then the physical body enters the jinn state. It penetrates hyperspace. If the student jumps with the intention of floating, he will notice with amazement that he can fly. In that state, he is invisible to the physical world. In that state, he can attend the preter. When the physical body is entering the jinn state, it begins to inflate, starting from the bottom, the ankles, to the top. Properly speaking, the physical body does not really inflate, rather, the astral forces fully co-penetrate it, giving it the appearance of being inflated. General Aspects of the Gnostic Ritual For the profane Romanists, when a Catholic officiant passes from the side of the epistle to the side of the gospel, it is the Christ going from Herod to Pilate. But for Gnostic priests, it is the passage from one world to another after death. The Four Seasons We Gnostics use a different practice in each season. In the astral, there are angels who take turns in the work of helping humanity. Raphael in the spring, Uriel in the summer, Michael in autumn, and Gabriel in winter. All the angels attend the Gnostic rituals to help us. The Our Father Of all the ritual prayers, the most powerful is the Our Father. This is a magical prayer of immense power. Imagination, inspiration, and intuition are the three obligatory paths of initiation. Master Hirakocha says the following, First, it is necessary to see spiritual things internally, and then you have to listen to the verb with the divine word for our spiritual organism to be prepared for intuition. This trinity is found in the first three petitions of the Our Father, namely, Hallowed be your name, in other words, the divine verb, the magnificent name of God, the creative word. Your kingdom come, in other words, with the pronunciation of the verb, the mantras, the internal kingdom of the holy masters comes to us. Your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. This is the union with God, leaving everything resolved. With these three supplications, Krum Heller says, we have asked in full. And if one day we succeed, we will then be gods, and therefore we will no longer need to ask. The Gnostic Church preserves the whole secret doctrine of the adorable Savior of the world. The Gnostic Church is the religion of happiness and beauty. The Gnostic Church is the virginal trunk from which Romanism and all of the other denominations that adore the Christ came forth. The Gnostic Church is the only church that secretly preserves the doctrine Christ taught from his lips to the ears of his disciples. We are not against any religion. We invite people of all holy religions to adore the Lord to study our secret doctrine. We must not forget there are rituals of light and of darkness. We possess the secret rituals of the adorable Savior of the world. We may the scorn nor underestimate any religion. All religions are precious pearls linked on the golden thread of divinity. We only affirm that Gnosis is the flame from which all religions of the universe come, that is all. Chapter 13 The Two Marys There are two serpents, one that ascends the spinal canal, and one that descends. The serpent ascends within white magicians because they do not spill the semen. The serpent descends within black magicians because they do spill the semen. The serpent ascending in the spinal canal is the virgin. The serpent descending from the coccyx toward the atomic infernos of nature is the Santa Maria of black magic and witchcraft. Here we have the two Marys, the white and the black. White magicians abhor the black Santa Maria. Black magicians mortally hate the white Virgin Mary. Whoever dares to name the Virgin is immediately attacked by the tenebris. When the initiate is performing the great work, he has to struggle terribly against the adepts of Santa Maria. The creative forces are threefold, masculine, feminine, and neutral. 
those great forces flow from above to below. Whoever wants to regenerate himself has to change this movement and make these creative energies return inward and upward. This is even contrary to interests of nature. The tenebrous then feel offended and attack the initiate terribly. Lady adepts of the black hand sexually assault the initiate in order for him to discharge. This happens especially during sleep. This is how nocturnal pollutions occur. The student dreams of beautiful women who sexually discharge him in order to impede the ascent of the fire through the spinal canal. The tenebrous adore Santa Maria within the abyss, and they sing sublimely malignant verses to her. White magicians adore the virgin who, as a serpent of fire, rises in the spinal canal, and they rest their heads upon her, like a child in the arms of his adored mother. In India, Kali, the divine mother Kundalini, is adored. But Kali is also adored in her fatal black aspect. These are the two Marys, the white and the black, the two serpents, the one of bronze that healed the Israelites in the desert, and the tempting serpent of Eden. There are white initiations and black initiations, temples of light and temples of darkness. All degrees and all initiations are based on the serpent. When the serpent ascends, we become angels. When it descends, we become devils. We will now recount a black initiation, as investigated by us. While asleep, the devotee was taken out of his physical body. The demon festivity took place in the street. All attendees were in their astral bodies. The neophyte practiced negative sexual magic with spillage of semen. This is how he progressed in the science of demons who presented themselves at the festival dressed in black tunics. That festivity was a true witch's Sabbath. After the orgy, the adepts of the left hand escorted their beloved disciple to a yellow temple. That was a den of black magic. Seen from the outside, this temple appeared to be a humble religious chapel. Inside, it was a magnificent palace. Inside the temple there were two floors or levels, and magnificent corridors through which the tenebrous passed. The adepts of the shadows congratulated the candidate for his tenebrous triumphs. It was horrible to see the adepts of Santa Maria. The candidate felt at home. The devil's tail was visible on those astral phantoms. The festivity of darkness was magnificent. A priest of the abyss climbed on a rock to deliver a sermon. This phantom was sincerely mistaken, a man of good intentions but fatally lost. This adept of the shadows solemnly said, I shall be faithful to my religion. Nothing will make me take a step back. This is sacred. Then the tenebrous one continued with a long speech, which everyone applauded. The guest of honor, who had had the misfortune of awakening the kundalini negatively, was marked with a fatal seal. That mark was triangular and had black and gray lines. Before using it, this seal was placed into the fire. The mark of the seal was placed beneath his left lung. The tenebris gave the disciple a fatal name, which was engraved with black letters on his left forearm. This new black initiate was then led before a statue of terribly malign beauty, which symbolized the black goddess, the kingdom of Santa Maria. The disciple, sitting before that statue, crossed his legs in the Anagarika style, left over right. He then placed his hands on his waist and concentrated on the fatal goddess. After all of it, the tenebrous one returned to his physical body, happy with his triumph. That is as far as our investigation went in regard to the initiations of the abyss. All those who follow the path of perfect matrimony must defend themselves against the tenebrous who try to take the devotee from the true path to make him a member of the Black Lodge. When they achieve their goal, the student is taken to a banquet of demons. The struggle is terrible, brain against sex, sex against brain, and what is most terrible, and most painful, heart against heart. You know this. We must crucify all human affections, abandon all that signifies carnal passion. This is extremely difficult. The past screams, implores, cries, begs. This is terribly painful. The Superman is the result of a tremendous revolution of consciousness. Those who believe mechanical evolution of nature converts us into masters are absolutely mistaken. The master is the result of a tremendous revolution of consciousness. We need to fight against nature and against the shadow of nature. Chapter 14 The Work with the Demon The awakening of the Kundalini and the dissolution of the eye precisely form the fundamental basis of all profound realization. In this chapter, we are going to address the topic of the dissolution of the eye. This is definitive for final liberation. The eye is the demon we carry within. Concerning this statement, we can say the work of the dissolution of the eye is really work with the demon. 
This work is very difficult. When we work with the demon, tenebrous entities usually attack us terribly. This is really the path of the astute man, the famous fourth path, the path of Tao. Origin of the pluralized eye. The origin of the sinful eye is lust. The ego, Satan, is subject to the law of eternal return of all things. It returns to new wombs in order to satisfy desires. In each one of its lives, the eye repeats the same dramas, the same errors. The eye complicates itself over time, each time becoming more and more perverse. The death of Satan. The Satan we carry within is composed of atoms of the secret enemy. Satan had a beginning, Satan has an end. We need to dissolve Satan in order to return to the inner star that has always smiled upon us. This is true final liberation. Only by dissolving the eye can we attain absolute liberation. The intimate star. Within the unknowable depths of our divine being, we have a completely atomic internal star. This star is a super divine atom. The Kabbalists call this star by the sacred name of Ein Sof. This is the being of our being, the great reality within ourselves. God does not evolve. God does not need to evolve because he is perfect. God does not need to perfect himself. He is perfect. God is our inner being. Evolution and involution. We the Gnostics have never denied the law of evolution. However, we do not accept such a mechanical law as dogma. The laws of evolution and involution make up the mechanical axis of nature. For every ascent, there follows a descent. For every evolution, there is a specific corresponding involution. There is evolution in the seed that germinates, in the stalk that grows and develops, in the plant that bears fruit. There is involution in the tree that no longer grows, withers away, becomes old and dies. Total Revolution we need a tremendous revolution of consciousness to return to the inner star that guides our being. Total revolution exists when we dissolve the I. Pain. Pain cannot make anyone perfect. If pain could perfect anyone, all humanity would already be perfect. Pain is a result of our own errors. Satan commits many errors. Satan reaps the fruits of his errors. This fruit is pain. Therefore, pain is satanic. Satan cannot perfect himself, nor can he make anyone perfect. Pain cannot make anything perfect because pain is of Satan. The great divine reality is happiness, peace, abundance, and perfection. The great reality cannot create pain. What is perfect cannot create pain. What is perfect can only engender happiness. Pain was created by the eye, Satan. Time. Time is Satan. Satan is memory. Satan is a bunch of memories. When a man dies, only his memories remain. These memories constitute the I, the myself the reincarnating ego. Those unsatisfied desires, those memories of yesterday, reincarnate. Thus, this is how we are slaves of the past. Therefore, we can be sure that the past is what conditions our present life. We can affirm that Satan is time. We can also state without fear of being mistaken, that time cannot liberate us from this valley of tears, because time is satanic. We have to learn to live from moment to moment. Life is an eternal now, an eternal present. Satan was the creator of time. Those who think they will liberate themselves in a distant future, in some millions of years, with the passing of time and the ages, are sure candidates for the abyss and the second death because time is of Satan. Time does not liberate anyone. Satan enslaves. Satan does not liberate. We need to liberate ourselves right now. We need to live from moment to moment. The Seven Fundamental Centers of Man All human beings have seven basic fundamental centers. Let's see them. 1. The intellectual center located within the brain. 2. The motor center, or the center of movement, located in the upper part of the spine. 3. The emotional center located in the solar plexus and in the specific nervous centers of the great sympathetic nervous system. 4. The instinctive center located in the lower part of the spine. 5. The sexual center located in the genital organs. 6. The superior emotional center. 7. The superior intellectual center. These last two can only express themselves through the authentic astral body and the legitimate mental body. Technique for the dissolution of the eye. The eye exercises control over the five inferior centers of the human machine. These five centers are the intellectual, motor, emotional, instinctive, and sexual. The two centers of the human being that correspond to Christ consciousness are known in occultism as Christ mind and Christ astral. These two superior centers cannot be controlled by the eye. 
Unfortunately, the superior mind and the superior emotions still do not have these precious Christic vehicles at their disposal. When the superior mind is clothed in the Christ mind, and when the Christ astral covers the superior emotion, we are indeed elevated to the state of true human being. All those who want to dissolve the I must study its functionalism within the five inferior centers. We must not condemn the defects. We must not justify them either. What is important is to comprehend them. It is urgent to comprehend the actions and reactions of the human machine. Each of these five inferior centers has a whole set of extremely complicated actions and reactions. The I works with each of these five inferior centers, and by deeply comprehending the whole mechanism of each of these centers, we are on our way to dissolving the I. In everyday life, two people will react differently before any given representation. What is pleasant for one person can be unpleasant for the other. Many times, the difference is that one person might judge and see with the mind, while the other might be touched in his sentiments. We must learn to differentiate between mind and sentiments. Mind is one thing, and sentiment is another. Within the mind, there is a whole set of actions and reactions that must be comprehended. Within the sentiments, there are attachments that must be crucified, emotions that must be carefully studied, and in general, a whole mechanism of actions and reactions that are easily confused with activities of the mind. Intellectual center. This center is useful within its own orbit. What is dangerous is to want to remove it from its gravitational field. The great realities of the spirit can only be experienced with the consciousness. Therefore, those who attempt to investigate the transcendental truths of the being based on pure reasoning make the same mistake as someone who ignores the use and management of modern scientific instruments and attempts to study infinitely small lifeforms with telescopes and infinitely large lifeforms with microscopes. Movement. We need to self-discover and to deeply comprehend all our habits. We must not allow our life to continue to unfold mechanically. It seems incredible that, living within the patterns of our habits, we do not know the patterns that condition our lives. We need to study our habits. We need to comprehend them. These habits belong to the activities of the motor center. It is necessary that we self-observe the way we live, act, dress, walk, etc. The center of movement has many activities. Sports also belong to the center of movement. When the mind interferes with this center, it obstructs and causes damage to it because the mind is very slow and the motor center is very fast. Any typist works with the motor center and naturally can make mistakes at the keyboard if the mind intervenes. A person driving an automobile could have an accident if the mind intervenes. Emotional Center The human being stupidly wastes sexual energy through the abuse of violent emotions, movies, television, football games, etc. We must learn to dominate our emotions. We must save our sexual energy. Instinct Various instincts exist. The instinct of preservation, the sexual instinct, etc. Many perversions of instinct also exist. Deep within every human being, there are subhuman instinctive brutal forces that paralyze the true spirit of love and charity. These demonic forces must first be comprehended, then brought under control and eliminated. These bestial forces are criminal instincts, lust, cowardliness, fear, sexual sadism, sexual bestialities, etc. We need to study and deeply comprehend these subhuman forces before we can dissolve and eliminate them. Sex Sex is the fifth power of the human being. Sex can liberate or enslave man. No one can be complete. No one can deeply realize himself without sexual force. No celibate person can attain total realization. Sex is the power of the soul. The integral human being is achieved with absolute fusion of the masculine and feminine poles of the soul. Sexual force develops, evolves, and progresses on seven levels, the seven levels of the soul. In the physical world, sex is a blind force of mutual attraction. In the astral world, sexual attraction is based on the affinity of types, according to their polarities and essences. In the mental world, sexual attraction occurs according to the laws of mental polarity and affinity. In the causal plane, sexual attraction takes place on the basis of conscious will. It is precisely on this plane of natural causes where the complete union of the soul is consciously realized. Indeed, no one can attain the complete glory of perfect matrimony without having attained this fourth state of human integration. We need to fully comprehend this entire sexual matter. We need to be integral. We must transcend the mechanics of sex. We need to know how to procreate children of wisdom. In the supreme moment of conception, 
human essences are completely open to all types of influences. The state of purity of the parents, and the willpower used in order to not spill the cup of Hermes, is all that can protect us from the danger of subhuman substances of bestial egos, which want to reincarnate by infiltrating into the spermatozoan and the ovum. The Absolute Death of Satan We discover the whole process of the eye, by comprehending the intimate activities of each of the five inferior centers. The result of this self-discovery is the absolute death of Satan, the tenebrous lunar eye. Adultery since the woman's body is a passive and receptive element, it is clear she collects and stores the results of sexual acts with all those men who committed adultery with her. Those results are atomic substances from the men with whom she has had sexual intercourse. Therefore, when a man has sexual intercourse with a woman who has been with another man, or other men, he then absorbs the atomic essences of the other men and poisons himself with them. This is a very grave problem for those brethren who are dissolving the eye. Because then, not only do they have to fight against their own errors and defects but, moreover, against the errors and defects of those other men with whom the woman had sexual intercourse. The Root of Pain The eye is the root of pain. The eye is the root of ignorance and error. When the eye is dissolved, the inner Christ is all that remains within us. We need to dissolve the eye. Only by dissolving the eye can ignorance and error disappear. When the eye disappears, all that remains within us is that which is called love. When the eye is dissolved, authentic and legitimate happiness comes to us. Only by totally annihilating desire can we attain the dissolution of the eye. If we want to dissolve the eye, we must be like the lemon. The eye is the horrifying Satan, the horrible demon that has made our life so bitter and nauseating. Chapter 15 Celibacy Swami X stated the following in one of his lessons, Unmarried people can spiritually unite the natural creative force of the soul within themselves by learning the correct method of meditation and its application to physical life. Such people do not have to pass through the material experience of matrimony. They can learn to marry their feminine physical impulse with the masculine impulse of their internal soul. If our beloved Gnostic disciples reflect on Swami X's words, they will reach the conclusion that they are manifestly absurd. This idea of marrying the feminine physical impulse with the masculine impulse of the internal soul is 100% false. This type of utopian marriage is impossible because man has not yet incarnated the soul. With whom, then, is he going to marry his feminine physical impulse? The intellectual animal still does not have a soul. Whoever wishes to incarnate their soul, whosoever yearns to be a man with soul, must have the astral, mental, and causal bodies. The human being of this day and age still does not have these internal vehicles. The astral specter, the mental specter, and the causal specter are only specters. The majority of occultists believe these internal specters are the true vehicles, and they are very mistaken. We need to be born in the superior worlds, and this matter of being born is a sexual problem. No human being is born a theory. Not even a simple microbe can be born of theories. No one is born through the nostrils nor through the mouth. Every living being is born of sex. As above, so below. If man is born of sex here in the physical world, it is logical that in the internal worlds above, the process is analogous. Law is law, and the law is fulfilled. The Christ astral is born just as the body of flesh and blood is born. It is sexual. Only with sexual magic between husband and wife can one give birth to that marvelous body. We can say the same for the mental and causal. We need to engender those internal bodies, and that is only possible with sexual contact because as above, so below, and as below, so above. No celibate person can marry his feminine physical impulse with the masculine of his internal soul because no celibate person can incarnate his soul. To incarnate the soul, we must engender the internal bodies, and only through the sexual union of man and woman can they be engendered. No single man or woman can procreate. The two poles are necessary to create that is life. It is necessary to engender the internal vehicles. It is necessary to be born in the superior worlds. Celibacy is an absolutely false path. We need the perfect matrimony. After birth, each vehicle needs its special nourishment. Only with this special nourishment does it totally develop and strengthen itself. The nourishment of those vehicles is based on hydrogens. The different types of hydrogens which nourish man's various internal bodies are fabricated within the physical organism. Laws of the bodies. Physical body, this, is governed by 48 laws. 
Its basic nourishment is hydrogen-48. Astro body. This vehicle is subject to 24 laws. Its basic nourishment is hydrogen-24. Mental body. This vehicle is subject to 12 laws. Its basic nourishment is hydrogen-12. Causal body. This vehicle is governed by 6 laws. Its basic nourishment is hydrogen-6. Every substance is transformed into a specific type of hydrogen. Thus, just as substances and life forms are infinite, the hydrogens are likewise infinite. The internal bodies have their special hydrogen, and they are nourished with them. Swami X was only a monk. We have been told that soon, this good monk will have to reincarnate in order to marry and profoundly self-realize. He is a beautiful disciple of the White Lodge. He believed he was self-realized in the superior worlds. He was greatly surprised when we had to make his mistake known to him in the temple. Indeed, this good monk has not yet engendered his Christic bodies. He needs to engender them. This is a sexual problem. These wonderful internal bodies can only be engendered with sexual magic. We give notice to our critics that we are not speaking against Swami X. His exercises are wonderful and very useful. But we do clarify that no one can profoundly realize with the bellows system. Many schools exist. All of them are necessary. All of them serve to help the human being. But it is good warning that we cannot engender the internal bodies with any theory. We have never witnessed anyone being born from a theory. We have not yet met a human being who was born from theories. There exist very respectable and venerable schools. These institutions have their courses of instruction and degrees. Some of them also have rituals of initiation. However, in the superior worlds, the degrees and initiations from these schools are useless. The masters of the White Lodge are not interested in the degrees and hierarchies of the physical world. They are only interested in the Kundalini. They examine and measure the spinal cord. If the candidate has not raised the serpent for them, he is simply profane like anyone else, even if he occupies some high position in the physical world, and even when his school or lodge is very venerable, or he is some supreme hierarch. If the Kundalini has risen three vertebrae, he is considered by the masters to be an initiate of the third degree, and if only one vertebra, an initiate of the first degree. So the masters are only interested in the Kundalini. Indeed, those who abandon everything in order to work in their cavern with their eagle and their serpent are very few. It is something for heroes, and this present humanity does not abandon its lodges and schools in order to remain alone with its eagle and its serpent. Students of all organizations are not even loyal to their schools. They live flitting from lodge to lodge, school to school, and thus, they supposedly want to profoundly self-realize. We feel infinite pain when we see these fickle brethren. Many of them practice wonderful exercises. Certainly, there are many good practices in all schools. The practices of Yogananda, Vivekananda, Rama Charaka, etc. are admirable. Students practice them with very good intentions. There are very sincere students. We greatly appreciate all those students and all those schools. Nonetheless, we feel so much irremediable pain for those who search for their final liberation with such yearning. We know they must engender their internal bodies. We know they must practice sexual magic. We know that, only with sexual magic, will they be able to awaken the sacred fire and engender their internal vehicles in order to incarnate their soul. We know this through our own experience. But what can we do to convince them? We, the brethren, suffer greatly and without remedy. On the former earth moon, millions of human beings evolved, and from all of those millions, only a few hundred elevated themselves to the angelic state. The vast majority of human beings were lost. The vast majority plunged into the abyss. Many are called, and few are chosen. If we observe nature, we see that not all seeds germinate. Millions of seeds are lost and millions of creatures perish daily. It is a sad truth, but it is the truth. Every celibate person is a sure candidate for the abyss and the second death. Only those who have elevated themselves to the state of Superman can give to themselves the luxury of enjoying the delights of love without sexual contact. We then penetrate the amphitheater of cosmic science. Nobody can attain the incarnation of the Superman within himself without sexual magic and perfect matrimony. Chapter 16. The Awakening of Consciousness It is necessary to know that humanity lives with the consciousness asleep. People work asleep. People walk through the streets asleep. People live and die asleep. 
When we come to the conclusion that the entire world lives asleep, we comprehend the necessity of awakening. We need the awakening of consciousness. We want the awakening of consciousness. Fascination. The profound sleep in which humanity lives is caused by fascination. People are fascinated by everything in life. People forget themselves because they are fascinated. The drunkard in the bar is fascinated by alcohol, the place, the pleasures, the friends and the women. The vain woman is fascinated before the mirror with her own loveliness. The rich miser is fascinated with money and possessions. The honest worker in the factory is fascinated with the hard work. The father is fascinated with his children. All human beings are fascinated and profoundly asleep. When driving a car, we are astonished when we see people dashing across the roads and streets without paying attention to the danger of the cars. Others truly throw themselves under the wheels of cars. Poor people. They walk around asleep. They look like sleepwalkers. They walk around asleep endangering their own lives. Any clairvoyant can see their dreams. People dream about all that has them fascinated. Sleep. During sleep, the ego escapes from the physical body. This departure of the ego is necessary so the vital body can repair the physical body. In the internal worlds we can affirm the ego takes its dreams into the internal worlds. In the internal worlds the ego occupies itself with the same things that have it fascinated in the physical world. So during sleep, we see the carpenter in his carpentry shop, the policeman guarding the streets, the barber in his barber shop, the blacksmith at his forge, the drunkard in the tavern or bar, the prostitute in the brothel absorbed in lust, etc. All these people live in the internal worlds as if they were in the physical world. Not a single living being has the inkling to ask himself during sleep whether he is in the physical world or the astral. Those who have asked themselves such a question during sleep have awoken in the internal worlds. Then with amazement, they have been able to study all the marvels of the superior worlds. Only by getting accustomed to asking ourselves this question from moment to moment during the so-called wakeful state can we manage to ask ourselves such a question in the superior worlds during those hours of sleep. It is clear that during sleep, we repeat everything we do during the day. If during the day we accustom ourselves to asking this question, during our nocturnal sleep, while being outside of the body, we will end up repeating the same question to ourselves. The result will be the awakening of the consciousness. Remembering oneself. The human being that's fascinated does not remember himself. We must self-remember from moment to moment. We need to self-remember in the presence of every representation that could fascinate us. Let's stop before every representation and ask ourselves, where am I? Am I in the physical plane? Am I in the astral plane? Then, give a little jump with the intention of floating within the surrounding atmosphere. It is logical that if you float, it is because you are outside the physical body. The result will be the awakening of consciousness. The purpose of asking this question at every instant, at every moment, is to etch it into the subconscious so it acts later during the hours given to sleep, in the hours when the ego is really outside the physical body. You know that in the astral things appear just as they are here in the physical plane. This is why during sleep, and after death, people see everything there in a form very similar to this physical world. They do not even suspect that they are outside of their physical body. No dead person ever believes he has died. He is fascinated and profoundly asleep. If the dead had made a practice of remembering themselves from moment to moment when they were alive, if they had struggled against the fascination of the things of the world, the result would have been the awakening of consciousness. They would not dream. They would walk around in the internal worlds with the consciousness awake. Whoever awakens the consciousness can study all the marvels of the superior worlds during the hours of sleep. Whoever awakens the consciousness lives in the superior worlds as a totally awakened citizen of the cosmos. One then coexists with the great hierophants of the White Lodge. Whoever awakens the consciousness can no longer dream here in this physical plane or in the internal worlds. Whoever awakens the consciousness stops dreaming. Whoever awakens the consciousness becomes a competent investigator of the superior worlds. Whoever awakens the consciousness is an illuminated one. Whoever awakens the consciousness can speak familiarly with the gods who initiated the dawn of creation. Whoever awakens the consciousness can remember his innumerable reincarnations. Whoever awakens the consciousness can attend his own cosmic initiations consciously. Whoever awakens the consciousness can study in the temples of the Great White Lodge. Whoever awakens the consciousness can know how his kundalini is developing in the superior worlds. 
Every perfect matrimony must awaken consciousness in order to receive guidance and direction from the White Lodge. In the superior worlds, the masters will wisely guide all those who really love one another. In the superior worlds, the masters give each person what they need for their inner development. Complementary Practice After waking from normal sleep, every Gnostic student must perform a retrospective exercise based on the process of their sleep in order to remember all those places they visited during the hours of sleep. We already know the ego usually travels to where we have been physically, repeating everything we have seen and heard. Masters instruct their disciples when they are outside of the physical body. It is urgent to know how to meditate profoundly and then practice what we have learned during the hours of sleep. It is necessary to not move at the time of waking up because, with movement, the astral is agitated and memories are lost. It is urgent to combine the retrospective exercises with the following mantras. Ra Orm, Ga Orm. Each word is divided into two syllables. The vowel O should be accentuated. These mantras are for the student what dynamite is for the minor. As the minor opens his way through the bowels of the earth with the aid of dynamite, the student also opens his way into the memories of his subconscious with the aid of these mantras. Patience and Tenacity The Gnostic student must be infinitely patient and tenacious because powers cost a great deal. Nothing is given to us for free. Everything has a cost. These studies are not for inconsistent people or for people with little will. These studies demand infinite faith. Skeptical people should not come to our studies because occult science is very demanding. Skeptics fail totally. Unbelievers will not manage to enter celestial Jerusalem. The Four States of Consciousness The first state of consciousness is called Akasya. The second state of consciousness is Pistis. The third state of consciousness is Dianoia. The fourth state of consciousness is Nous. Akasya is ignorance, human cruelty, barbarism, exceedingly profound sleep a brutal and instinctive world, an infrahuman state. Pistis is the world of opinions and beliefs. Pistis is belief, prejudices, sectarianism, fanaticism, theories in which there does not exist any type of direct perception of truth. Pistis is humanity's common level of consciousness. Dianoia is the intellectual revision of beliefs, analysis, conceptual synthesis, cultural intellectual consciousness, scientific thought, etc. Dianoetic thought studies phenomena and establishes laws. Dianoetic thought studies inductive and deductive systems with the purpose of using them profoundly and clearly. Nous is perfect awakened consciousness. Nous is the state of Turiya, profound perfect inner illumination. Nous is legitimate objective clairvoyance. Nous is intuition. Nous is the world of the divine archetypes. Noetic thought is synthetic, clear, objective, illuminated. Whoever reaches the heights of noetic thought totally awakens consciousness and becomes a Turiya. The lowest part of man is irrational and subjective, and is related with the five ordinary senses. The highest part of man is the world of intuition and objective spiritual consciousness. In the world of intuition, the archetypes of all things in nature develop. Only those who have penetrated the world of objective intuition, only those who have reached the solemn heights of noetic thought, are truly awakened and illuminated. No true Turiya can dream. The Turiya who has reached the heights of noetic thought never goes around saying so, never presumes to be wise. He is extremely simple and humble, pure and perfect. It is necessary to know that a Turiya is neither a medium, pseudo-clairvoyant, nor pseudo-mystic, unlike those who currently abound like weeds in all spiritual, hermetic, occult, etc., schools. The state of Turiya is very sublime and is only reached by those who work in the flaming forge of Vulcan all of their lives. Only the Kundalini can elevate us to the state of Turiya. It is urgent to know how to meditate profoundly, and then to practice sexual magic throughout our whole life in order to reach, after many difficult trials, the state of Turiya. Meditation and sexual magic carry us to the heights of noetic thought. Neither dreamer nor medium, nor any of those who enter a school of occult teaching can instantaneously achieve the state of Turiya. Unfortunately, many believe it is as easy as blowing bubbles or, like smoking a cigarette, or like getting drunk. Thus, we see many hallucinators, mediums, and dreamers declaring themselves to be clairvoyant masters, illuminated ones. In all schools, including within the ranks of our Gnostic movement, those people who say they are clairvoyant, without really being so are never missing. These are the ones who, 
based upon their hallucinations and dreams, slander others by saying such a person is fallen, so-and-so is a black magician, etc. It is necessary to advise that the heights of Turiya require many years of mental exercise and sexual magic in perfect matrimony. This means discipline, long and profound study, very intense and profound internal meditation, sacrifice for humanity, etc. Impatience Commonly, those who have recently entered Gnosis are full of impatience. They want immediate phenomenal manifestations, instantaneous astral projections, illumination, wisdom, etc. Reality is another thing. Nothing is gifted to us. Everything costs. Nothing is attained through curiosity, instantaneously, rapidly. Everything has its process and its development. The Kundalini develops, evolves, and progresses very slowly within the aura of the Maha Chohan. The Kundalini has the power of awakening the consciousness. Nevertheless, the process of awakening is slow, gradual, natural, without spectacular sensational emotional and uncivilized events. When the consciousness becomes completely awakened, it is not something sensational or spectacular. It is simply a reality, as natural as a tree that grows slowly, unfolds, and develops without sudden leaps or sensational events. Nature is nature. In the beginning, the Gnostic student says, I am dreaming. Later he exclaims, I am in the astral body, outside the physical body. Later still he obtains samadhi, ecstasy, and enters the fields of paradise. In the beginning, the manifestations are sporadic, discontinuous, followed by long periods of unconsciousness. Much later, the igneous wings give us continuous uninterrupted, awakened consciousness. Chapter 17 Dreams and Visions Gnostic students must learn to differentiate between dreams and visions. To dream is one thing and to have visions is another. A truly awakened Gnostic cannot dream. Only those who have the consciousness asleep live dreaming. The worst type of dreamer is the sexual dreamer. Those who live dreaming of carnal passions foolishly waste their creative energy in the satisfaction of their pleasure fantasies. Ordinarily, these people do not progress in their business activities. They fail in every sense, they end up in misery. When we look at a pornographic image, it strikes the senses and then passes to the mind. The psychological eye intervenes in these matters by stealing the erotic image in order to reproduce it in the mental plane. In the world of the mind, that image is transformed into a living effigy. During sleep, the dreamer fornicates with that living effigy, which like an erotic demon, tempts him for the satisfaction of lust. The result is nocturnal pollutions with all their horrible consequences. No true devotee of the path should visit movie theaters because they are dens of black magic. The erotic figures on the screen give rise to mental effigies and erotic dreams. In addition, movie theaters are full of diabolic elementals created by the human mind. Those malignant elementals damage spectators' minds. The subconscious mind creates dream fantasies in the realm of dreams. The quality of dreams depends on the beliefs of the dreamer. When someone believes we are good, he dreams of us looking like angels. When someone believes we are bad, he dreams seeing us with the devil's form. Many things come into our memory while writing these lines. In the past when we, the brethren, worked in various countries, we were able to observe that while our Gnostic disciples believed in us, they dreamed seeing us as angels. It was sufficient for them to stop believing in us, for them to then dream of us as demons. Those who today swore before the altar to follow and obey us, admired us with great enthusiasm and dreamed seeing us as angels. Many times, it was enough for those students to read a book or to listen to some lecturer for them to become affiliated with a new school. Then, when they stopped believing in us, when they changed their concept and opinions, they dreamed about us seeing us changed into devils. So what was the clairvoyance of these people? What became of their clairvoyant dreams? What type of clairvoyant is it? that today sees us as gods and tomorrow claims we are devils. Where is the clairvoyance of these dreamers? Why do these people contradict themselves? Why do they swear today that we are gods and tomorrow swear that we are devils? What is this? The subconsciousness is a screen upon which many internal films are projected. Currently, the subconscious sometimes acts as a cameraman, other times as a director, and also as an operator who projects images onto the mental background. It is ostensible that our subconscious projector usually commits many errors. No one ignores that erroneous thoughts, groundless suspicions, and also false dreams emerge on the screen of the mind. We need to transform the subconscious into consciousness, 
to stop dreaming, to awaken consciousness. The one who awakens is incapable of dreaming while his physical body sleeps within the bed. He lives in a state of intensified vigilance in the internal worlds. Such people are authentic illuminated seers. We frankly cannot accept clairvoyants who have not awakened their consciousness. We cannot accept clairvoyants who have not engendered the Christ astral, Christ mind, and Christ will. Clairvoyants who have neither awakened consciousness nor possessed their Christic vehicles only see their own beliefs and concepts in the internal worlds. In short, they are useless. Only those awakened clairvoyants, only those clairvoyants who possess their Christic vehicles are worthy of true credit. They are not dreamers. They do not make mistakes. They are true illuminates. Such men are in fact, true masters of the White Lodge. The visions of this class of sublime men are not simple dreams. These are masters of perfection. This class of masters cannot dream anymore. This class of masters can investigate the memories of nature and read the whole history of the earth and its races in the sealed archives of creation. Everyone who follows the path of perfect matrimony should live alert and vigilant as a sentry in wartime. During the hours of sleep, masters test their disciples. The tenebrous attack us during sleep when we are working in the great work. During sleep, we must pass through many ordeals in the internal worlds. Masters awaken the disciples' consciousness if they are going to test him in something. Chapter 18 Consciousness, Subconsciousness, Superconsciousness, Clairvoyance Consciousness. That which we call ordinary waking consciousness sleeps profoundly. Ordinary waking consciousness is related with the five senses and the brain. People believe they have an awakened consciousness, and that is absolutely false. People live daily in the most profound sleep. Superconsciousness. Superconsciousness is an attribute of the intimate, the spirit. The faculty of superconsciousness is intuition. It is necessary to compel the superconsciousness to work in order for intuition to become powerful. Remember, an organ that is not used atrophies. The intuition of people who do not work with their superconsciousness is atrophied. Polyvision is intuitive clairvoyance. It is divine omniscience. This eye is found in the pineal gland. The lotus of a thousand petals resides there. Superconsciousness resides there. The pineal gland is located in the upper part of the brain. Whoever wants to develop superconsciousness must practice internal meditation. You must concentrate on the Divine Mother who resides in the depths of your being. Meditate upon her. Fall asleep while imploring that she put your superconsciousness into activity. Meditate daily. Meditation is the daily bread of the wise. With meditation you will develop superconsciousness. Memory. You need memory in order to remember internal experiences. Do not spill the semen. Know that in the semen millions of microscopic brain cells exist. You must not lose those cells. Special nourishment to develop the power of memory. Prepare your breakfast with acidic fruits and ground almonds, along with bee honey. In this way you will provide the brain with the necessary atoms for memory. Internal Experiences The ego lives in the internal worlds and travels to different places while our physical body sleeps. We are tested many times in the internal worlds. We receive initiation in the internal temples. It is necessary to remember everything we do outside the body. With the instructions given in this book, every human being will be able to awaken the consciousness and remember his internal experiences. It is painful to know that there are many initiates who work in the great temples of the White Lodge while their physical body sleeps, but they do not remember anything because their memory is atrophied. Here you have the exercises to develop memory. Practice intensely. Compel your subconscious to work. Awaken your consciousness and put your superconsciousness into activity. Clairvoyance and pseudo-clairvoyance. There exists clairvoyance and pseudo-clairvoyance. The Gnostic student must make a clear differentiation between these two forms of ultra-sensitive perception. Clairvoyance is based on objectivity. Pseudo-clairvoyance is based on subjectivity. By objectivity we mean spiritual reality, the spiritual world. Understand that by subjectivity, we mean the physical world, the world of illusion, that which does not have reality. An intermediate region also exists, the astral world, which would appear objective or subjective according to the degree of spiritual development of each person. Pseudo-clairvoyance is the name given to imaginary perception, fantasy, artificially evoked hallucinations, absurd dreams, astral visions that don't coincide with concrete facts, the reading of one's own projected unconscious thoughts in the astrolite, 
the unconscious creation of astral visions, later interpreted as authentic realities, etc. Also included in the field of pseudo-clairvoyance are subjective mysticism, false mysticism, pseudo-mystical states that have no relation whatsoever with intense and clear sentiments, but are close to hysteria and pseudo-magic. In other words, false religious projections projected unconsciously within the astral light, and in general, everything in orthodox literature that is called beauty, seduction. Objective Clairvoyance There are four mental states that lead the neophyte to the ineffable summits of objective clairvoyance. First, to sleep profoundly. Second, to sleep with dreams. Third, state of vigilance. Fourth, turiya, or perfect state of illumination. Indeed, only the turiya is an authentic clairvoyant. It is impossible to reach these heights without having been born in the causal world. Whoever wishes to reach the state of turiya must thoroughly study the semi-unconscious psychic processes that, in fact, constitute the origin of many forms of self-deception, auto-suggestion, and hypnosis. The Gnostic must first attain the ability to stop the course of his thoughts, the capacity to not think. Only the one who achieves that capacity will truly hear the voice of silence. When the Gnostic disciple attains the capacity to not think, he must then learn to concentrate the mind on only one thing. The third step is correct meditation. This brings the first flashes of the new consciousness to the mind. The fourth step is contemplation, ecstasy, or samadhi. This is the state of Turiya, perfect clairvoyance. Clarification. In the Gnostic movement, only a few Turiyas exist. We make this clarification. It is necessary to know that with a few very rare exceptions, only pseudo-clairvoyance and subjective mystics exist. In reality, all the mystical schools and all the spiritualist movements are full of deluded pseudo-clairvoyants who cause more harm than good. They are the ones who give themselves the title of master. Among them abound famous reincarnations like the John the Baptists, of whom we know more than a dozen, the Mary Magdalenes, etc. This type of person believes initiation is as easy as blowing bubbles, and based on their supposed mastery, and absurd visions created by their morbid mentality. They prophesy and excommunicate others at their whim, as they please, slandering people and characterizing others as black magicians, asserting that certain people are fallen, etc. The Gnostic movement must cleanse itself of this evil and harmful plague, and therefore we have begun with the expulsion of Mrs. X. We are not willing to continue tolerating the unhealthy morbidity of all those deluded pseudo-clairvoyants and all those subjective mystics. We propagate spiritual intellectual culture, decency, chivalry, logical analysis, conceptual synthesis, academic culture, high mathematics, philosophy, science, art, religion, etc. In no way are we willing to continue accepting the gossip of hallucinating people or the madness of dreamers. Truly, the subjective clairvoyant transfers his dreaming consciousness to the wakeful state in order to see his own projected dreams in others. These projected dreams change according to the dreamer's mood. In the past, we have been able to confirm that when some pseudo-clairvoyant agreed with all our ideas and concepts, he would then see us as angels or gods. Thus, he would praise us and even adore us. Nevertheless, when he changed his concept, when the pseudo-clairvoyant became enthusiastic about some new school, when he read some book that appeared marvelous to him, when he listened to some lecturer who came to town, when he resolved to change organizations or schools, he would then accuse us of being black magicians and would see us as demons, etc. This demonstrates that these pseudo-clairvoyants are only dreamers who see their own dreams projected in the astral light. Those who really want to reach the ineffable heights of true and legitimate clairvoyance must be extremely careful of the danger of self-deception and submit themselves to authentic esoteric discipline. Reality The true and legitimate clairvoyant, the one who has achieved superconsciousness, never presumes of being a clairvoyant, never goes about saying so. When he gives advice, he does it without implying that it is based on his clairvoyance. All Gnostic sanctuaries must be careful of those people who praise themselves and call themselves clairvoyant. All Gnostic sanctuaries must carry out the greatest of vigilance to protect themselves against the spectacular pseudo-clairvoyants who, from time to time, appear on the scene to slander and discredit others, assuring us that so-and-so is a sorcerer, that so-and-so is a black magician, that so-and-so is fallen, etc. It is urgent to comprehend that no authentic Turiya has pride. Indeed, 
all those who say I am the reincarnation of Mary Magdalene, John the Baptist, Napoleon, etc., are proud fools, deluded pseudo-clairvoyants, foolish idiots. We are nothing but miserable particles of dust, horrible worms of the mud, before the formidable and glorious majesty of the Father. What I am stating is neither allegorical or symbolic. I am speaking literally, brutally, of a formidable reality. Really, it is thy that says, I am master such and such, reincarnation of prophets so and so, etc. Certainly, the animal eye is Satan. It is the eye, the devil ego, that feels itself to be a master, Mahatma, Hierophant, prophet, etc. Consciousness, subconsciousness, and superconsciousness. Consciousness, subconsciousness, and superconsciousness can be summarized into one thing human consciousness. It's necessary to awaken the consciousness. Whoever awakens the consciousness becomes superconscious, reaches the heights of superconsciousness, becoming a true illuminated clairvoyant, a Turiya. It is urgent to convert the subconscious into consciousness, and totally awaken the consciousness. It is necessary for the totality of the consciousness to become absolutely awakened. Only the person who has the totality of his consciousness awakened is a true clairvoyant, an illuminated one, a Turiya. The so-called infraconsciousness, unconsciousness, and subconsciousness, etc., are only different forms, or zones, of the sleeping consciousness. It is urgent to awaken the consciousness in order to become an illuminated one, a clairvoyant, a superconscious one. The six fundamental dimensions. Beyond the three known dimensions, length, width, and height, exists the fourth dimension, this is time. Beyond time, we have the fifth dimension, this is eternity. However, we assure you that beyond eternity there exists a sixth dimension, which is beyond eternity and time. Total liberation begins in the sixth fundamental dimension. Only the one who awakens in all six fundamental dimensions of space is a true clairvoyant, a Turiya, a legitimate, illuminated one. Chapter 19 Initiation Initiation is your own life. If you want initiation, write it upon a staff. Whoever has understanding, let him understand because here there is wisdom. Initiation is neither bought nor sold. Let's flee from those schools that give initiations by correspondence. Let's flee from all those who sell initiations. Initiation is something very intimate for the soul. The eye does not receive initiations. Those who say, I have so many initiations, I have such and such degrees, are liars and fakes because the eye does not receive initiations or degrees. There are nine initiations of minor mysteries and five important initiations of major mysteries. It is the soul that receives the initiations. This is a very intimate matter, something one should not go about speaking of, nor should it be told to anyone. All the initiations and degrees the many schools of the physical world confer really have no value in the superior worlds. The masters of the White Lodge only recognize the legitimate initiations of the soul as genuine. It is completely internal. The disciple can ascend the nine arcades, pass through all nine initiations of minor mysteries, without having worked in the arcana may zedef, sexual magic. Nevertheless, it is impossible to enter the major mysteries without sexual magic. This is the arcana may zedef. In Egypt, everyone who reached the ninth sphere would inevitably receive by word of mouth the formidable secret of the great arcanum, the most powerful arcanum, the arcana may zedef, the guardian of the threshold. The first trial the candidate has to face is the trial of the guardian of the threshold. This is the reflection of the eye, the innermost depths of the eye. Many are those who fail this terrible trial. The candidate has to invoke the guardian of the threshold in the internal worlds. A frightening electrical hurricane precedes the terrible apparition. The larva of the threshold is armed with a terrible hypnotic power. In fact, this monster has all the horrible ugliness of our own sins. It is the living mirror of our own evils. The struggle is terrible, face to face, hand to hand. If the guardian wins, the candidate becomes enslaved by the horrible monster. If the candidate is victorious, the monster of the threshold flees terrified. Then a metallic sound shakes the universe, and the candidate is received in the chamber of children. This reminds us of that phrase of the Hierophant Jesus the Christ. Unless you become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18 verse 3. In the chamber of children, the candidate is welcomed by the holy masters. The happiness is immense because a human being has entered the path of initiation. 
The whole college of initiates, children, congratulates the candidate. The candidate has defeated the first guardian. This trial takes place in the astral world. The second guardian. The guardian of the threshold has a second aspect, the mental aspect. We should know that man's mind is still not human. It is in the animal stage. In the mental plane, people have the animal physiognomy that corresponds with their character. The sly one is a real fox there. The passionate looks like a dog or a billy goat, etc., etc. The encounter with the guardian of the threshold in the plane of the mind is even more frighteningly horrible than in the astral plane. Really, the second guardian is the great guardian of the threshold of the world. The struggle with the second guardian is usually very horrible. The candidate must invoke the second guardian in the mental plane. It comes preceded by the frightening electrical hurricane. If the candidate is victorious, he is received with a warm welcome in the chamber of children in the mental plane. If he fails, he remains enslaved by the horrible monster. All our mental crimes are personified in this larva. The Third Guardian The encounter with the Third Guardian takes place in the world of will. The demon of ill will is the most terrible of the three. People do their personal will. The masters of the White Lodge do only the will of the Father on earth, as it is in heaven. When the candidate is victorious in the third trial, he is again welcomed in the chamber of children. The music is ineffable, the festivity, solemn, the hall of fire. After the candidate has triumphed in the three basic trials of the guardian of the immense region, he must then enter the hall of fire. There, the flames purify his internal vehicles. The trials of fire, air, water, and earth. In the ancient Egypt of the pharaohs, these four trials had to be faced valiantly in the physical world. Now the candidates have to pass these four trials in the supersensible worlds. Trial of fire. This trial is to prove the serenity and sweetness of the candidate. The wrathful and choleric inevitably fail this trial. The candidate is persecuted, insulted, wronged, etc. Many are they who react violently and return to the physical body having failed completely. The victorious are received in the chamber of children and are welcomed with delightful music, the music of the spheres. The flames horrify the weak. Trial of air. Those who despair because they lose something or someone those who fear poverty, those who are not willing to lose what they most love, fail in the trial of air. The candidate is thrown into the depths of a precipice. The weak cry out and return terrified to the physical body. The victorious are received in the chamber of children with celebration and welcome. Trial of water. The great trial of water is really formidable. The candidate is thrown into the ocean and believes himself to be drowning. Those who do not know how to adapt to the various social conditions of life, those who do not know how to live among the poor, those who reject struggle and prefer to die after being shipwrecked in the ocean of life. They, the weak, inevitably fail in the trial of water. The victorious are received in the chamber of children with cosmic festivities. Trial of Earth We have to learn how to take advantage of the worst adversities. The worst adversities bring us the best opportunities. We should learn to smile before all adversity. That is the law. Those who succumb to pain before the adversities of existence cannot victoriously pass the trial of earth. In the superior worlds, the candidate finds himself between two enormous mountains that close in on him menacingly. If the candidate screams with horror, he returns to the physical body having failed. If he is serene, he is victorious and is received in the chamber of children with great festivity and immense happiness. Initiations of Minor Mysteries when the candidate has surpassed all the introductory trials of the path, he has every right to enter the minor mysteries. Each of the nine initiations of minor mysteries is received in the intimate consciousness. If the student has a good memory, he can bring the memory of those initiations to the physical brain. When the candidate's memory is not good, the poor neophyte is unaware in the physical world of everything he learns and receives in the superior worlds. Those who wish to be aware in the physical world of all that happens to them during initiation have to develop the memory. It is urgent that the candidate learns to travel consciously in the astral body. It is urgent that the candidate awakens consciousness. The nine initiations of minor mysteries constitute the probationary path. The nine initiations of minor mysteries are for the disciples who are on trial. Married disciples who practice the arcana may, Zedef, pass these nine elementary initiations very rapidly. When the disciple is celibate and absolutely chaste, he also passes the nine initiations, although more slowly. Fornicators cannot receive any initiation. The Initiations of Major Mysteries 
There are five great initiations of major mysteries. There are seven serpents, two groups of three, with the sublime coronation of the seventh tongue of fire that unites us with the One, with the Law, with the Father. We need to climb the septenary ladder of fire. The first initiation is related with the first serpent, the second initiation with the second serpent, the third initiation with the third serpent, the fourth initiation with the fourth serpent, the fifth initiation with the fifth serpent. The sixth and seventh belong to Bhuti, or soul consciousness, and to Atman, or the human being's intimate. The first initiation of major mysteries. The first serpent corresponds to the physical body. It is necessary to raise the first serpent through the medullar channel of the physical body. When the serpent reaches the magnetic field at the root of the nose, the candidate attains the first initiation of major mysteries. The soul and the spirit come before the great white lodge without the bodies of sin and in complete absence of the eye. They look at each other, they love each other, and fuse as two flames that unite to form a single flame. Thus the divine hermaphrodite is born and receives a throne from which to rule and a temple in which to officiate. We must transform ourselves into kings and priests of nature according to the order of Melchizedek. Whoever receives the first initiation of major mysteries receives the flaming sword that gives him power over the four elements of nature. We need to practice sexual magic intensely to raise the serpent upon the staff, as Moses did in the desert. Love is the basis and foundation of initiation. It is necessary to know how to love. The struggle to raise the serpent is very difficult. The serpent should rise slowly, degree by degree. There are 33 vertebrae. There are 33 degrees. In each vertebra, the tenebrous attack us terribly. The kundalini rises very slowly, according to the merits of the heart. We have to put an end to all our sins. It is urgent to tread the path of the most absolute sanctity. It is indispensable to practice sexual magic without animal desire. Not only must we kill desire but even the very shadow of desire. We need to be like the lemon. The sexual act should become a true religious ceremony. Jealousy must be eliminated. Know that passionate jealousies do away with peace in the home. The Second Initiation of Major Mysteries The ascent of the second serpent through the medullar channel of the etheric body is very difficult. When the second serpent reaches the magnetic field at the root of the nose, the initiate enters the temple to receive the second initiation of major mysteries. It is good to note that the human personality does not enter the temple. It remains at the door putting its affairs in order with the lords of karma. Within the temple, the intimate, together with his etheric body is crucified. That is to say, the intimate is clothed in the etheric body for the crucifixion. This is how the etheric body is Christified. The Soma Suchikin, the wedding garment of the soul, the body of gold, is born in the second initiation. This vehicle is formed by the two superior ethers. The etheric body has four ethers, two superior and two inferior. We can enter all the regions of the kingdom with the wedding garment of the soul. This initiation is very difficult. The student is tested severely. If he is victorious, the midnight sun shines, and the five-pointed star with its central eye descends from it. This star comes to rest above the head of the neophyte as a sign of approval. The result of the victory is initiation. The third initiation of major mysteries. The third serpent rises through the medullar channel of the astral specter. The third serpent must reach the magnetic field at the root of the nose and, from there, descend to the heart via a secret path in which there are seven holy chambers. When the third serpent reaches the heart, a most beautiful child, the Christ astral, is born. The result of all this is initiation. In the astral body, the neophyte has to go through the entire drama of the Passion of Christ. He has to be crucified, die, and be buried. He has to resurrect, and must also descend to the abyss, and remain there for forty days before the ascension. The supreme ceremony of the third initiation is received with the Christ astral. Sanat Kamara, Ancient of Days, appears over the altar to confer the initiation upon us. Everyone who achieves the third initiation of major mysteries receives the Holy Spirit. It is necessary to know how to love our spouse to attain this initiation. The sexual union should be full of immense love. The phallus should always enter the vulva very gently, in order not to harm the organs of the woman. Each kiss, each word, each caress should be totally free of desire. Animal desire is a very grave obstacle to initiation. Many puritanical people, upon reading these lines, would judge us as immoral. These people, however, are not scandalized by brothels or prostitutes. 
They insult us, but they are incapable of going to preach the good law in the neighborhoods where prostitutes live. They hate us, but they are incapable of abhorring their own sins. They condemn us because we preach the religion of sex, but they are incapable of condemning their own fornication. Such is humanity. The Fourth Initiation of Major Mysteries The fourth initiation of major mysteries is reached when the fourth serpent has succeeded in the ascent through the medullar channel of the mental specter. The fourth serpent also reaches the space between the eyebrows and descends to the heart. In the world of the mind, Sanat Kamara always welcomes the candidate saying, You have liberated yourself from the four bodies of sin. You are a Buddha. You have penetrated into the world of the gods. You are a Buddha. Everyone who liberates himself from the four bodies of sin is a Buddha. You are a Buddha. You are a Buddha. The cosmic festivity of this initiation is grandiose. The entire world, the entire universe, trembles with happiness, saying, A new Buddha has been born. The Divine Mother Kundalini presents her child in the temple saying, This is my beloved son. He is a new Buddha. He is a new Buddha. He is a new Buddha. The holy women congratulate the candidate with a sacred kiss. The festival is terribly divine. The great masters of the mind extract from within the mental specter the beautiful child of the Christ mind. This child is born in the fourth initiation of major mysteries. Everyone who receives the fourth initiation gains nirvana. Nirvana is the world of the holy gods. Whoever reaches the fourth initiation receives the globe of the imperator of the mind. The sign of the cross shines upon this globe. The mind must be crucified and stigmatized in the initiation. The universal fire sparkles in the world of the mind. Each of the 33 chambers of the mind teaches us incredible truths. The Fifth Initiation of Major Mysteries The fifth serpent rises through the medullar channel of that embryo of the soul we have incarnated. The fifth serpent must reach the space between the eyebrows and then descend to the heart. The body of conscious will is born in the fifth major initiation. Everyone who is born in the world of conscious will inevitably incarnates his soul. Everyone who incarnates his soul becomes a true man with soul. Every true, complete, and immortal man is an authentic master. Before the fifth initiation of major mysteries no one should be called by the title of master. We learn to do the will of the Father in the fifth initiation. We must learn to obey the Father. That is the law. In the fifth initiation we must decide which of the two paths we will take, either to remain in nirvana enjoying the infinite happiness of boundless sacred space, sharing with ineffable gods or to renounce that immense happiness and remain living in this valley of tears to help the poor suffering humanity. This is the path of long and bitter duty. He who renounces nirvana for love of humanity, having won and lost nirvana for love of humanity, later attains the venustic initiation. Everyone who receives the venustic initiation incarnates the intimate Christ. There are millions of Buddhas in nirvana who have not incarnated the Christ. It is better to renounce nirvana for the love of humanity and have the joy of incarnating the Christ. The Christ man enters worlds of supernirvanic happiness and later, the absolute. The perfect matrimony. The path of cosmic realization is the path of perfect matrimony. Victor Hugo, the great initiate humanist wrote the following, Man and Woman. Man is the most elevated of creatures, woman the most sublime of ideals. God made for man a throne, for woman an altar. The throne exalts, the altar sanctifies. Man is the brain, woman, the heart. The brain creates light, the heart love. Light engenders, love resurrects. Because of reason, man is strong. Because of tears, woman is invincible. Reason is convincing, tears moving. Man is capable of all heroism, woman of all martyrdom. Heroism ennobles, martyrdom sublimates. Man has supremacy, woman preference. Supremacy is strength, preference is the right. Man is a genius, woman, an angel. Genius is immeasurable, the angel undefinable. The aspiration of man is supreme glory, the aspiration of woman is extreme virtue. Glory creates all that is great, virtue, all that is divine. Man is a code, woman a gospel. A code corrects, the gospel perfects. Man thinks, woman dreams. To think is to have a worm in the brain. To dream is to have a halo on the brow. Man is an ocean, woman, a lake. The ocean has the adorning pearl, the lake, dazzling poetry. Man is the flying eagle, woman, the singing nightingale. To fly is to conquer space. To sing is to conquer the soul. Man is a temple, woman a shrine. Before the temple we discover ourselves, before the shrine we kneel. 
In short, man is found where earth finishes, woman, where heaven begins. These sublime phrases of the great initiate humanist, Victor Hugo, invite us to live the path of perfect matrimony. Blessed be love. Blessed are the beings who adore each other. The food of the serpent. The entire path of initiation is based on the serpent. It has its special cosmic food. There are five known basic elements with which the serpent is nourished, namely the philosophical earth, the elemental water of the wise, elemental fire, elemental air, and ether. The elementals of nature live in these elements. Gnomes inhabit the philosophical earth. Undines live in the water, sylphs in the air, etc. Gnomes work in the entrails of the great mountain range. This is the spinal column. The work carried out by gnomes consists of transmutation of the lead of the personality into the gold of the spirit. The raw matter is the seminal fluid. The furnace of the laboratory is the coccygeal chakra. The water is the seminal fluid, and the sympathetic cords form the great chimney through which the seminal vapors ascend to the distillery of the brain. The entire work of the gnomes is alchemical. Metallic transmutation is the basis of initiation. Raw matter must be transmuted into philosophical gold. Gnomes need the fire of the salamanders and the water of the undines. Gnomes also need the vital air and friendly sylphs of the mind in order to move the seminal vapors inward and upward. The outcome is the transmutation of lead into gold. When the aura of the initiate is pure gold, the work has been completely realized. The region of earth extends from the feet to the knees. Its mantra is La. The region of water is from the knees to the anus. Its mantra is Va. The region of fire is from the anus to the heart. Its mantra is Ra. The region of air encompasses the area from the heart to the space between the eyebrows. Its fundamental mantra is Ya. The region of ether extends from the space between the eyebrows to the top of the head, and its mantra is Har. The serpent of fire is nourished with these five basic elements. Now we can comprehend why the neophyte has to pass the ordeals of earth, water, fire, and air. The purifications and sanctifications related with these elements of nature nourish the serpent and permit its ascent through the sacred mountain range of the spinal column. The ascent of the serpent is impossible without the purifications and sanctifications of these four elements. Brahma is the god of earth. Narayana is the god of water. Rudra is the god of fire. Ishwara is the god of air. Siddha Shiva is the god of ether. By meditating upon these ineffable gods, we can obtain their assistance for the awakening of the chakras, wheels, or discs of the vital body. It is advisable to make these magnetic centers vibrate in order to prepare them for the advent of the fire. Meditate and vocalize the mantra for each element. Concentrate your attention on each of these elemental gods and beg them to help you with the awakening of the chakras. You will become a practical occultist in this way. The Laboratory of the Third Logos the earth has nine strata. The laboratory of the third logos is in the ninth. Actually, the ninth stratum of the earth lies exactly in the center of the planetary mass. The holy eight is there. It is the divine symbol of the infinite. In this symbol, the brain, heart, and sex of the planetary genie are represented. The name of this genie is Chamgam. The center of the holy eight corresponds to the heart, and its upper and lower extremities to the brain and sex respectively. All beings of the earth are structured on this basis. The struggle is terrible. Brain against sex, sex against brain, and that which is most terrible, that which is most grave and painful is heart against heart. The sacred serpent is coiled in the heart of the earth, precisely in the ninth sphere. She is septuple in her constitution, and each of her seven igneous aspects corresponds to one of the seven serpents of man. The creative energy of the third logos elaborates the chemical elements of the earth with all its multifaceted complexity of form. When this creative energy withdraws from the center of the earth, our world will then become a cadaver. This is how worlds die. Man's serpentine fire emanates from the serpentine fire of the earth. The formidable serpent profoundly sleeps within its mysterious nest of strange, hollow spheres, similar in fact to a true Chinese puzzle. These are subtle concentric astral spheres. Indeed, just as the earth has nine concentric spheres in the depths of which, is the formidable serpent, so too does the human being because he is the microcosm of the macrocosm. Man is a universe in miniature. The infinitely small is analogous to the infinitely large. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are the four basic elements with which the third logos works. The chemical elements are placed in order of their atomic weights. The lightest is hydrogen, whose atomic weight is one, ending with uranium, 
whose atomic weight is 238.5 and which is in fact the heaviest of the known elements. The electrons constitute a bridge between spirit and matter. Hydrogen in itself is the most rarefied element known, the primary manifestation of the serpent. Every element, every food, every organism is synthesized into a specific type of hydrogen. Sexual energy corresponds to hydrogen-12, and its musical note is C. The electronic solar matter is the sacred fire of Kundalini. When we liberate this energy, we enter the path of authentic initiation. Chukmul The Chukmul of Aztec Mexico is marvelous. Chukmul really existed. He was an incarnated adept, one of the great initiates of the powerful serpentine civilization of ancient Mexico and of the great Tenochtitlan. The tomb of Chukmul was located, and his remains were found. Therefore, there can be no doubt that Chukmul really existed. If you observe the manner in which Chukmul is reclining, we see that he is resting in the same position the Egyptian initiates assumed when they wanted to travel in the astral body while pronouncing the mantra, Fa Ra An. Nevertheless, something curious appears in Chukmul's umbilical region. It is a bowl or receptacle, as if to receive something. In fact, the solar plexus is marvelous, and Chukmul left humanity a great teaching. The Kundalini or igneous serpent of our magical powers has a great deposit of solar energy in the umbilical region within the solar plexus chakra. This magnetic center is very important in initiation because it is the one that receives the primary energy which is subdivided into ten splendorous radiations. This primary energy circulates through the secondary nervous canals, animating and nourishing all the chakras. The solar plexus is governed by the sun. If the student wants to have really vigorous, objective clairvoyance in the most complete sense of the word, he must learn to take the solar energy from its deposit in the solar plexus to the frontal chakra. The mantra, Sui Ra, is the key that permits us to extract solar energy from the plexus of the sun in order to carry it to the frontal chakra. Vocalize in this way, Sui Ra, for one hour daily. The result will be the positive awakening of the frontal chakra. If we want solar strength for the laryngeal chakra, we must vocalize the mantra, Sui Ra, in this way, Sui Ra. If we need solar energy for the lotus of the heart, we must vocalize the mantra, Su O Ra, in this way, Su O Ra. Everything is summarized in the great Su Ara, in which, according to the Vedas and the Sastras, the silent Gandharva, heavenly musician, is found. It is necessary to know how to use the solar energy deposited in the solar plexus. It is good for aspirants of initiation to lie down face up, feet on the bed, knees raised. It is evident that by putting the soles of the feet on the bed, the knees are lifted, directed towards the sky, towards Urania. While in the Chukmul position, the aspirant imagines that the energy of the sun enters through the solar plexus making it vibrate and rotate from left to right, like the hands of a clock when we look at it from the front. This exercise can be done for one hour daily. The basic mantra of this magnetic center is the vowel U. This vowel can be vocalized by elongating the sound in this way, U. A well-awakened solar plexus marvelously animates all the chakras of the organism. Thus, this is how we prepare ourselves for initiation. Chuck Mool was venerated in Serpentine, Mexico. Two warrior castes worshipped him. Chuck Mool was carried in great processions and entered the Aztec temples, worshipped by the multitudes. They also made supplications to him asking for rain for the earth. This great master helps those who invoke him. Tiny sculptures of Chuck Mool can be made, or amulets of the figure of Chuck Mool, in order to wear around the neck as a medallion. Serpentine Civilizations Authentic initiation was received in the great mystery temples of the serpentine civilizations. Only serpentine civilizations are true civilizations. It is necessary that the vanguard of human civilization, made up of our beloved brethren, theosophists, Rosicrucians, hermetic yogis, spiritualists, etc., abandon their old prejudices and fears and unite together to create a new serpentine civilization. It is urgent to know that the barbarian populace of this day and age, wrongly called a modern civilization, is approaching its final catastrophe. The present world is struggling within a frightful chaos, and if we really want to save it, we all need to be united in order to create a serpentine civilization, the civilization of Aquarius. We need to make a supreme and desperate effort in order to save the world, because right now, everything is lost. The universal Christian Gnostic movement is non-sectarian. The Gnostic movement is made up of the army of world salvation, of all spiritual schools, of all lodges, religions, and sects. 
The exoteric and esoteric circles. Humanity develops in two circles, the exoteric and the esoteric. The exoteric is public. The esoteric is secret. The multitudes live in the exoteric circle. However, the adepts of the Great White Brotherhood live in the esoteric circle. It is a duty for all those initiated brethren to help those who are within the public circle. It is necessary to bring many to the secret circle of the White Brotherhood. The initiatic path is a true revolution of the consciousness. This revolution has three perfectly defined aspects. First, to be born. Second, to die. And third, to sacrifice ourselves for humanity, to give our life for humanity, to struggle in order to bring others to the secret path. To be born is an absolutely sexual problem. To die is the work of the dissolution of the I, the ego. Sacrifice for others is love. In the public circle there are thousands of schools, books, sex, contradictions, theories, etc. That is a labyrinth from which only the strongest come out. Really, all of those schools are useful. We find grains of truth in all of them. All religions are holy and divine. All of them are necessary. Nevertheless, the secret path is only found by the strongest. Infrasexual people mortally hate this path. They feel more perfect than the third logos. These people will never be able to find the secret path, the path of the razor's edge. The secret path is sex. Through this straight, narrow, and difficult path we reach the esoteric circle, the sanctum regnum dei, magus regnum, the chakras and the plexuses. The candidate for initiation must know the position of the chakras and plexuses profoundly. The fundamental one is at the base of the spine, the fourth sacral vertebra, the coccygeal plexus. The splenic is on the spleen, the first lumbar vertebra, the splenic plexus. This center obeys the solar plexus. Nevertheless, we have to recognize that the true second center is the prostatic and not the splenic. The umbilical is above the navel, the eighth thoracic vertebra, the solar plexus. The cardiac is in the heart, the eighth cervical vertebra, the cardiac plexus. The laryngeal is in the throat, the thyroid gland, the third cervical vertebra, the pharyngeal plexus. The frontal is between the eyebrows, the first cervical vertebra, the carotid plexus. It is urgent to know that the chakras and the plexuses are connected by means of nerve filaments. As the serpent rises through the spinal column, the spinal chakras are put into activity, and by induction, the plexuses are also activated. The chakras are in the cerebrospinal nervous system and the plexuses in the sympathetic nervous system. As the serpent rises through the medullar canal, it puts into full activity the spinal chakras, or churches, in successive order. These in turn make the corresponding sympathetic plexuses vibrate by electric induction. It is urgent to know that each spinal chakra and each sympathetic plexus is septuple in its internal constitution, just like the igneous serpent of our magical powers. The first serpent opens the chakras in the physical world, the second in the etheric, the third in the astral, the fourth in the mental, the fifth in the causal, the sixth in the bathique, and the seventh in the intimates. This process is the same for the plexuses because the chakras or churches are connected to the plexuses by their nerve branches. So the initiate should not despair if he has not opened the astral chakras with the first serpent. They are only opened with the third serpent, that of the astral. With the first, only counterparts of the physical are opened in the intimate. Bear in mind that the intimate is the counterpart of the physical. Clarifications Initiation cannot be bought with money or sent by mail. Initiation is neither bought nor sold. Initiation is your own life accompanied by temple celebrations. It is necessary to avoid all those impostors who sell initiations. It is urgent to keep away from all those who send initiations by mail. Initiation is something very intimate, very secret, very divine. Avoid all those who say, I have so many initiations, so many degrees. Avoid all those who say, I am a master of the major mysteries. I have received so many initiations. Remember, dear reader, that the I, the personality, do not receive initiations. Initiation is a matter for the intimate. It has to do with the consciousness, with the very delicate things of the soul. One must not go about speaking of these things. No true adept would ever use phrases like, I am a master of the White Lodge. I have such and such a degree. I have so many initiations. I have these powers, etc. The Problem of Internal Illumination Many occultist students want internal illumination and suffer horribly because, despite many years of study in esoteric practices, they remain as blind and unconscious as when they began to read the first books. We, the brethren of the temple, 
know through our own experience that the cardiac chakra is definitive for internal illumination. The Shiva Samhita, a great Hindustani book, speaks at great length about the benefits obtained by the yogi when meditating on the chakra of the tranquil heart. He gets immeasurable knowledge, knows the past, present, and future time, has clairaudience, clairvoyance, and can walk in the air whenever he likes. He sees the adepts and the goddesses known as yoginis, obtains the powers called Kechari, moving in the air, and Bachari, going at will all over the world. Those who want to learn how to travel in the astral body at will, those who want to penetrate Jin science to learn how to place themselves within the fourth dimension with their physical body, and transport themselves with their physical body to any place in the world without the necessity of an airplane. Those who urgently need to awaken clairvoyance and clairaudience must concentrate their mind daily on the cardiac chakra and meditate profoundly on that marvelous center. To meditate on this center for one hour daily is marvelous. The mantra of this chakra is the vowel O, which is vocalized by prolonging the sound like this, O. During the practice indicated here, one must pray to the Christ, asking him to awaken the heart chakra. Summary of the Five Great Initiations First Initiation the intimate and the consciousness soul, Bhuthi, are fused, thus forming a new initiate, one more who enters the stream. Second initiation. The etheric body called Soma Suchakin is born. Third initiation. The chakras of the astral body are opened, and the Christ astral is born as a beautiful child. Fourth initiation. The Christ mind is born as a very precious child. The initiate has been born as a new Buddha. Fifth initiation. The human soul, or causal body or body of will, is fused with the inner master who is Atman Bhuthi, the intimate and consciousness. Thus the three flames are one. This is a new and legitimate master of the major mysteries of the White Lodge. The one who reaches the fifth initiation can enter Nirvana. The one who reaches the fifth initiation is born in the causal world. The one who reaches the fifth initiation incarnates the soul. Only the person who reaches the fifth initiation is a man with soul, that is to say, a true man. The vehicles of fire. The authentic and legitimate astral, mental, and causal vehicles are born of sexual magic. It is obvious that during the copulation between man and woman, the aura of the husband and wife are totally opened. Therefore, within our own depths, marvelous psychic fertilizations can be realized. The final outcome becomes precisely the birth of our legitimate astral, and later the birth of the other bodies in successive order. Patience and tenacity. Powers are not obtained by playing around. This is a question of much patience. Inconsistent people, those who go about looking for results, those who after a few months of practices are already demanding signs, indeed are not prepared for occultism. People like that are not good for these studies. People like that are not mature. We advise these people to become members of some religion and to wait a while until they mature. To tread the path of the razor's edge, one needs the patience of Saint Job. To tread the path of the razor's edge, we need the tenacity of very well-tempered steel. Conscious faith. Those people who enter practical occultism that are full of doubt totally fail. The one who doubts our teachings is not prepared for the path of the razor's edge. For people like this it is best that they join some religion and beg to the great reality for the solar power of conscious faith. When they have gained conscious faith, they are then ready to enter this straight, narrow, and difficult path. The one who doubts occultism must not traverse this difficult path until he receives the power of conscious faith. The occultist who doubts can become crazy. Faith is a marvelous solar power. Religions and schools. All the religions and spiritual schools in the world are very necessary and serve as an antechamber to enter the vestibule of wisdom. We must never speak against these schools and religions because all are necessary for the world. We receive the first light of spirituality in these schools and religions. The worst would be a people without religion, a people who persecute those dedicated to spiritual studies. In fact, a people without religion is monstrous. Each human group needs its school, its religion, its sect, its instructors, etc. Each human group is different, and therefore the different schools and religions are necessary. Whoever treads the path of initiation must know how to respect the beliefs of others. Charity the one who follows the path of perfect matrimony must develop charity. Cruel and pitiless people do not progress in this path. It is urgent to learn how to love and always be willing to give even their last drop of blood for others. The warmth of charity opens all the doors of the heart. The warmth of charity brings solar faith to the mind. Charity is conscious love. 
The fire of charity develops the chakra of the heart. The fire of charity permits the sexual serpent to rise rapidly through the medullar canal. Whoever wants to advance rapidly on the path of the razor's edge must practice sexual magic intensely and give himself totally to great universal charity. Thus, by sacrificing himself absolutely for his fellow man and giving his blood and his life for them, he will be rapidly Christified. Psychic Development Every sensation is an elemental change in the state of the psyche. Sensations exist in each of the six basic dimensions of nature and man, and all of them are accompanied by elemental changes of the psyche. Sensations we experience always leave a trace in our memory. We have two types of memory, spiritual and animal. The first conserves memories of sensations experienced in the superior dimensions of space. The second conserves memories of physical sensations. Memories of sensations constitute perceptions. Every physical or psychic perception is really the memory of a sensation. Memories of sensations are organized into groups that associate or dissociate, attract or repel. Sensations polarize into two perfectly definable currents. The first obeys the character of the sensations. The second obeys the time of receipt of the sensations. The sum total of various sensations converted into a common cause are projected, externally, as an object. Then we say this tree is green, tall, small, has a pleasant or unpleasant smell, etc. When the perception is in the astral or mental worlds, we say this object or subject has these qualities, this color, etc. In the latter, the sum total of the sensations is internal, its projection is also internal and it belongs to the fourth, fifth, or sixth dimension, etc. We see physical perceptions with the physical apparatus, and psychic ones with the psychic apparatus. In the same way that we have physical senses of perception, we also have psychic senses of perception. Everyone who follows the path of initiation must develop these psychic senses. Concepts are always formed with the memories of perceptions. Thus, concepts emitted by the great adept founders of religions are due to the transcendental memories of their psychic perceptions. Formation of perceptions leads to formation of words and the appearance of language. Formation of internal perceptions leads to formation of the mantric language and the appearance of the golden language spoken by adepts and angels. Existence of language is impossible when there are no concepts, and there are no concepts when there are no perceptions. Those who toss around concepts about the internal worlds without ever having perceived those worlds generally falsify reality, even though they may have good intentions. In the elemental levels of psychic life, many sensations are expressed with shouts, howls, noises, etc., which reveal joy or terror, pleasure or pain. This occurs in the physical world and also in the internal worlds. Appearance of language represents a change in the consciousness. So too when the disciple begins to speak in the universal cosmic language, a change in consciousness has been made. Only the serpent's universal fire and dissolution of the recurring ego can provoke such a change. Concept and word are one and the same substance. Concept is internal and word is external. This process is similar in all the levels of consciousness and in all dimensions of space. Ideas are only abstract concepts. Ideas are much larger concepts and belong to the world of spiritual archetypes. Everything existing in the physical world is a copy of those archetypes. During samadhi, the initiate can visit the world of spiritual archetypes in astral or superastral travels. The mystic contents of transcendental sensations and emotions cannot be expressed in common language. Words can only suggest them or allude to them. Really, only the regal art of nature can define those superlative and transcendental emotions. Regal art was known in every serpentine civilization. The pyramids of Egypt and Mexico, the ancient sphinx, old monoliths, sacred hieroglyphics, sculptures of the gods, etc., are archaic witnesses of regal art, which speak only to the consciousness and to the ears of the initiate. The initiate learns this regal art during mystical ecstasy. Space, with its properties, is a form of our sentient receptivity. We can verify this when, through development of the chakras, we are able to perceive all space in tetradimensional form instead of the tridimensional form to which we were previously accustomed. Characteristics of the world change when the psychic apparatus changes. Development of the chakras makes the world change for the initiate. With the development of the chakras, we eliminate subjective elements of perception from our mind. That which is subjective has no reality. That which is objective is spiritual, real. An increase in psychic characteristics comes with the awakening of the chakras by means of internal discipline. 
novelty in the psychic field, obscures the changes that are simultaneously processed in perception of the physical world. The new is felt but the initiate is not capable of logically and axiomatically defining the scientific difference between the old and the new. The result of such incapacity is a lack of perfect conceptual equilibrium. It is thus urgent to achieve conceptual equilibrium so the doctrinal exposition of initiates can correctly fulfill its purpose. Change of consciousness is the true objective of esoteric discipline. We need cosmic consciousness. This is the sense of consciousness of the cosmos. It is the life and order of the universe. Cosmic consciousness brings into existence a new type of intellectualism, illuminated intellection. This faculty is a characteristic of the Superman. There are three types of consciousness. First, simple consciousness. Second, individual self-consciousness. Third, cosmic consciousness. Animals possess the first. The intellectual animal called man has the second. Gods have the third. When cosmic consciousness is born in man, he feels internally as if the serpent's fire were consuming him. The flash of Brahmanic splendor penetrates his mind and consciousness, and from that moment he is initiated into a new and superior order of ideas. The Brahmanic delight has the flavor of nirvana. When the initiate has been illuminated by the Brahmanic fire, he enters the esoteric or secret circle of humanity. In that circle we find an ineffable family, constituted by those ancient hierophants known in the world as avatars, prophets, gods, etc. Members of this distinguished family are found in all advanced races of the human species. These beings are the founders of Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity, Sufism, etc., etc. Actually, these beings are few but, despite being so few, they are truthfully the directors and rectors of the human species. Cosmic consciousness has infinite degrees of development. The cosmic consciousness of a new initiate is inferior to that of an angel, and that of an angel is not the same as an archangel's development. In this there are degrees and degrees. This is Jacob's ladder. It is impossible to achieve cosmic consciousness without sanctity. It is impossible to achieve sanctity without love. Love is the path of sanctity. The most grandiose form of love's manifestation is attained during sexual magic. In those instances, man and woman are a single, terribly divine hermaphroditic being. Sexual magic offers all the internal conditions needed to receive the Brahmanic splendor. Sexual magic provides the devotee all the igneous elements necessary for the birth of cosmic consciousness. For cosmic consciousness to appear, a certain degree of culture is required, education of the elements in affinity with cosmic consciousness, and elimination of the elements contrary to cosmic consciousness. The most characteristic feature of those individuals prepared to receive cosmic consciousness is that they see the world as maya, illusion. They sense that the world, as people see it, is only an illusion, and they search for the great reality, the spiritual, the truth, that which is beyond illusion. For the birth of cosmic consciousness, it is necessary for man to surrender himself completely to the spiritual, to the internal. Sexual magic offers the initiate all the possibilities required to obtain the Brahmanic splendor and the birth of cosmic consciousness. It is urgent that sexual magic be combined with internal meditation and sanctity. In this way, we prepare ourselves to receive the Brahmanic splendor. Really, angels are perfect men. Whoever reaches the perfect state of man becomes an angel. Those who claim an angel is inferior to man are falsifying the truth. No one can reach the angelic state if he has not previously achieved the state of a perfect man. No one can achieve the state of a perfect man if he has not previously incarnated his soul. That is a sexual matter. The angel is only born within the true man. Cosmic consciousness is only born within the true man. Chapter 20 Resurrection and Reincarnation Beings who love each other can become immortal like gods. Joyful is the one who can eat the delicious fruits of the tree of life. No beloved ones, that there are two exquisite trees in Eden that even share the same roots. One is the tree of knowledge, the other is the tree of life. The first gives you wisdom, the second makes you immortal. Everyone who has worked in the great work has the right to eat of the delicious fruits of the tree of life. Indeed, love is the summum of wisdom. Those men and women who traverse the path of perfect matrimony finally gain the joy of entering nirvana. It is the oblivion of the world and men forever. It is impossible to describe the joy of nirvana. There, every tear has disappeared forever. There, the soul, divested of the four bodies of sin, 
submerges itself within the infinite joy of the music of the spheres. Nirvana is a sacred star-filled space. The masters of compassion, moved by human pain, renounce the great joy of nirvana and resolve to stay with us in this valley of great bitterness. Every perfect matrimony inevitably reaches adepthood. Every adept can renounce nirvana for the love of the great orphan. When the adept renounces the supreme bliss of nirvana, he can then ask for the elixir of long life. The blessed ones who receive this marvelous elixir die, but do not die. On the third day they rise. This has already been demonstrated by the adorable one. On the third day, the adept comes before the sepulchre, accompanied by holy women, who bring medicine and aromatic unguents. The angels of death and other ineffable hierarchies also accompany the adept. The adept calls out in a great voice, invoking his physical body, which sleeps within the holy sepulchre. The body is raised and can escape from the sepulchre by taking advantage of the existence of hyperspace. In the superior worlds, the physical body is treated by the holy women with medicines and aromatic unguents. After the body has returned to life, obeying supreme orders, it penetrates through the sidereal head of the soul master. Thus, this is how the master regains possession of his glorified body. This is the precious gift of Cupid. Every resurrected body normally lives within the superior worlds. Nevertheless, we must clarify that resurrected masters can make themselves instantaneously visible and tangible in any place, and then disappear. Count Cagliostro comes to mind. This great master fulfilled a remarkable political mission in Europe and astounded the whole of humanity. This great master was really the one who provoked the fall of the kings of Europe. In fact, we owe the Republic to him. He lived during the time of Jesus Christ, was a personal friend to Cleopatra, and worked for Catherine de' Medici. He was known during various centuries in Europe. He used various names such as Giuseppe Balsamo, Count Cagliostro, etc. The immortal Babaji, the Yogi Christ of India, still lives in India. This master was the instructor of the great masters who lived through the terrifying night of time. Nevertheless, this sublime elder looks like a young 25-year-old man. Let's remember Count Sinoni, a youth despite his thousands of years. Unfortunately, this Chaldean sage failed completely because he fell in love with an actress from Naples. He committed the mistake of uniting with her and spilling the cup of Hermes. The result was horrible. Zanoni died on the guillotine during the French Revolution. Resurrected masters travel from one place to another utilizing hyperspace. This can be demonstrated with hypergeometry. Astrophysics will soon discover the existence of hyperspace. Sometimes, after fulfilling a particular mission in a country, resurrected masters allow themselves the luxury of passing for dead. On the third day, they repeat their resurrection and leave for another country in order to work under a different name. So, in this way, two years after his death, Cagliostro appeared in other cities using a different name in order to continue his work. The perfect matrimony converts us into gods. Great is the joy of love. In fact, only love confers immortality upon us. Blessed be love, blessed be the beings who adore each other. Resurrection and Reincarnation Many students of occultism confuse resurrection with reincarnation. The Gospels have always been very poorly interpreted by occultist students. There are various types of resurrection, just as there are various types of reincarnation. This is what we are going to clarify in this chapter. Every true adept has a body of paradise. This body is of flesh and bone. However, it is flesh that does not come from Adam. The body of paradise is formed with the best atoms of the physical organism. Many adepts resurrect within the superior worlds after death with this body of paradise. Resurrected masters can visit the physical world with this body of paradise and make themselves visible and tangible at will. This is a type of ineffable resurrection. However, we affirm that resurrection with the mortal body of Adam, though more painful due to the return into this valley of bitterness, is therefore more glorious. All adepts of the secret path who form the guardian wall have resurrected with the body of Adam. There are also initiatic resurrections. The third initiation of fire signifies resurrection in the astral world. Everyone who passes through the third initiation of fire has to live the drama of Christ, life, passion, death, and resurrection within the astral world. Reincarnation of the Personality The personality is time. The personality lives in its own time and does not reincarnate. After death, the personality also goes to the grave. 
For the personality, there is no tomorrow. The personality lives in the cemetery, it wanders about the cemetery or submerges into its grave. It is neither the astral body nor the etheric double. It is not the soul. It is time. It is energetic, and it disintegrates very slowly. The personality can never reincarnate. It does not ever reincarnate. There is no tomorrow for the human personality, the ego. That which continues, that which reincarnates, is not the soul either because the human being still does not have soul. In fact, it is the ego that reincarnates, the I, the reincarnating principle, the ghost of the defunct, the recollections, the memory, the error, which is perpetuated. Lifespan The unit of life of any living creature is equivalent to one beat of its heart. Every living thing has a defined period of time. The life of a planet is 2 billion 700 million beats. That same quantity corresponds to the ant, the worm, the eagle, the microbe, to man, and in general to all creatures. The lifespan of each world and each creature is proportionally the same. Clearly, the beat of a world occurs every 27,000 years but the heart of an insect beats more rapidly. An insect that lives for only one summer evening has had in its heart the same number of beats as a planet except those beats have been more rapid. Time is not a straight line, as the erudite ignoramuses believe. Time is a closed curve. Eternity is another thing. Eternity has nothing to do with time, and what is beyond eternity, and time is known only by the great illuminated adepts, the masters of humanity. There are three known dimensions and three unknown dimensions a total of six fundamental dimensions. The three known dimensions are length, width, and depth. The three unknown dimensions are time, eternity, and what is beyond time and eternity. This is the spiral of six curves. Time belongs to the fourth dimension, eternity to the fifth dimension, that which is beyond eternity, and time to the sixth dimension. The personality lives in a closed curve of time. She is the daughter of her time and ends with her time. Time cannot reincarnate. There is no tomorrow for the human personality. The circle of time revolves within the circle of eternity. In eternity there is no time but time revolves within the circle of eternity. The serpent always bites its own tail. Time and personality end but with the turning of the wheel a new time and personality appear upon the earth. The ego reincarnates and everything is repeated. The last realizations, sentiments, preoccupations, affections, and words cause all the sexual sensations and all the amorous drama that give rise to a new physical body. All the romances of spouses and lovers are related to the last moments of those dying. The path of life is formed by the hoof prints of the horse of death. With death, time closes and eternity opens. The circle of eternity first opens and then closes when the ego returns to the circle of time. Recurrence the initiates of the fourth way define recurrence as the repetition of acts, scenes, and events. Everything is repeated. The law of recurrence is a tremendous reality. In each incarnation the same events are repeated. The repetition of acts is accompanied by its corresponding karma. This is the law that reconciles effects to the causes which gave rise to them. Every repetition of acts carries karma and sometimes dharma, reward. Those who work with the great arcanum, those who tread the straight, narrow, and difficult path of perfect matrimony are gradually liberated from the law of recurrence. This law has a limit. Beyond that limit we become angels or devils. With white sexual magic we become angels. With black sexual magic we become devils. The question of personality. The subject of personality, which is the child of its time and which dies in its time, deserves our attention. Indeed, it is completely clear that if the personality were to reincarnate, time would reincarnate and this is absurd because time is a closed curve. A Roman man reincarnated in these modern times of the 20th century, with the personality of the time of the Caesars, would in fact be intolerable. We would have to treat him as a delinquent because his customs would in no way correspond to those we have today. The Returns of the Ego The symbol of Jesus expelling the merchants from the temple with whip in hand pertains to a tremendous reality of death and horror. We have already said that the eye is pluralized. The I, the ego, is a legion of devils. Many readers will not like this assertion. Nonetheless, it is the truth, and we must say it even if we don't like it. During the work with the demon, during the work of the dissolution of the ego, parts of the I, subhuman entities, entities that possess part of our consciousness and our life, are eliminated, cast out of our inner temple. 
Sometimes these entities reincarnate in animal bodies. How many times might we have encountered discarded forms of ourselves living in animal bodies while at a zoo? There are people who are so animalistic that if everything animal was removed from them, nothing would remain. These types of people are lost cases. The law of recurrence has ended for these people. The law of reincarnation has ended for them. These types of people can reincarnate into animal bodies or enter definitively into the abyss. There they continue disintegrating slowly. Advantages of Resurrection The one who renounces nirvana out of love for humanity is able to conserve his physical body for millions of years. Without resurrection, the adept would find himself needing to change bodies constantly. This would be an evident disadvantage. With resurrection, the adept does not need to change his body. He can conserve his vehicle for millions of years. The body of a resurrected adept is totally transformed. The soul within the body transforms the body totally, converting it into soul too, until the adept becomes entirely soul. A resurrected body has its fundamental seat in the internal worlds. It lives in the internal worlds, and only makes itself visible in the physical world by means of willpower. Thus, a resurrected master can instantaneously appear or disappear wherever he wishes. No one can apprehend or incarcerate him. He travels within the astral plane to wherever he wishes. The most interesting thing for the resurrected adept is the great leap. When the time comes, the resurrected master can take his body to another planet. The resurrected master can live with his resurrected body on another planet. This is one of the great advantages. Every resurrected adept is able to make things of the astral visible and tangible by transferring them into the physical plane. This can be explained because the master has his fundamental seat in the astral even though he can manifest himself physically. Cagliostro, the enigmatic Count Cagliostro, after his departure from the Bastille, invited his friends to a banquet. There, in the midst of the feast, he invoked many deceased spirits, who also sat at the table to the amazement of the guests. On another occasion, as if by magic, Cagliostro made a precious golden dinner service appear from which his guests ate. The powerful Count Cagliostro transmuted lead into gold and made pure diamonds of the highest quality through the vivification of carbon. The powers of every resurrected master are a true advantage. A great friend, a resurrected adept who currently lives in the Great Tartary, told me the following, Before swallowing soil, one is nothing but a fool. One thinks one knows a lot but knows nothing. One only really comes to be good, once one has swallowed soil, before this, one knows nothing. He also said to me, Masters fall because of sex. This reminds us of Count Zanoni. He fell when he ejaculated the semen. Zanoni was a resurrected master. He fell in love with an actress from Naples, and he fell. Zanoni died on the guillotine during the French Revolution. Whoever wants to achieve resurrection has to follow the path of perfect matrimony. There is no other path. Only with sexual magic can we attain resurrection. Only with sexual magic can we liberate ourselves from the wheel of reincarnations in a positive and transcendental manner. Loss of the Soul In the preceding chapters, we said the human being still has not incarnated his soul. Only with sexual magic can we engender the internal vehicles. These vehicles, as with plants, sleep latent within the hard darkness of the grain, the seed, which is deposited in the seminal system. When the human being has the Christic vehicles, he can incarnate his soul. Whoever does not work with the grain, whoever does not practice sexual magic, cannot germinate his Christic bodies. The one who does not have Christic bodies cannot incarnate his soul either, he loses his soul, and in the long term he is submerged within the abyss where he disintegrates slowly. Jesus, the great master, said, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Whoever does not incarnate his soul loses it. The one who does not have Christic vehicles does not incarnate it. Whoever does not work with the grain does not have Christic vehicles. Whoever does not practice sexual magic does not work with the grain. The resurrection of the dead is only for men with soul. In fact, only men with soul are true men in the complete sense of the word. Only true men can achieve the great resurrection. Only men with soul can endure the funeral trials of the thirteenth arcanum. These trials are more horrifying than death itself. Those who do not have a soul are mere sketches of men, phantoms of death. That is all. The vehicles of men without soul are ghostly vehicles. They are not the authentic vehicles of fire. In reality, 
men without soul are not true men. In fact, the human being is still a non-realized being. Very few are they who have soul. The great majority of beings who are called humans still do not have soul. Of what use is it for man to accumulate all the riches of the world if he loses his soul? The resurrection of the dead is only for men with soul. Real immortality is only for men with soul. Love and Death To many readers, it may seem strange that we relate love with death and resurrection. In Hindu mythology, love and death are two faces of one deity. Shiva, the god of the universal sexual creative force, is at the same time the god of violent death and destruction. Shiva's wife also has two faces. She is Parvati and Kali at the same time. As Parvati, she is supreme beauty, love, and happiness. As Kali or Durga, she can transform herself into death, disgrace, and bitterness. Shiva and Kali together symbolize the tree of knowledge, the tree of the science of good and evil. Love and death are twin brothers who never separate. The path of life is formed by the hoof prints of the horse of death. The error of many cults and schools lies in their being unilateral. They study death but do not want to study love when, in fact, they are two faces of one deity. The diverse doctrines of the East and the West really believe they know love when, in fact, they do not. Love is a cosmic phenomenon in which the history of the earth and its races are simple accidents. Love is the mysterious magnetic and occult force the alchemist needs in order to fabricate the philosopher's stone and the elixir of long life, without which resurrection is impossible. Love is a force that I can never subordinate because Satan can never subjugate God. The learned ignoramuses are mistaken about the origin of love. The foolish are mistaken about its effect. It is stupid to suppose the only objective of love is reproduction of the species. Truly, Love unfolds and develops in a very different plane, which the swine of materialism radically ignore. Only an infinitesimal force of love is used to perpetuate the species. What happens to the rest of the force? Where does it go? Where does it develop? This is what the learned ignoramuses ignore. Love is energy and cannot be lost. The surplus of energy has other uses and purposes which people ignore. The surplus of the energy of love is intimately related with thought feeling, and will. Without sexual energy these faculties could not develop. The creative energy is transformed into beauty, thought, feeling, harmony, poetry, art, wisdom, etc. The supreme transformation of creative energy produces, as a result, the awakening of consciousness and the death and resurrection of the initiate. Indeed, all creative activity of humanity comes from the marvelous force of love. Love is the marvelous force that awakens man's mystical powers. Without love, resurrection of the dead is impossible. It is urgent to again open the temples of love in order to celebrate the mystical festivals of love anew. Only with the enchantments of love does the serpent of fire awaken. If we want the resurrection of the dead, we first need to be devoured by the serpent. The one who has not been devoured by the serpent is worthless. If we want the verb to become flesh in us, we need to practice sexual magic intensely. The verb is in sex. The lingam yoni is the foundation of all power. We first need to raise the serpent on the staff and then be devoured by the serpent. In this way we become serpents. In India, adepts are called nagas, serpents. In Teotihuacan, Mexico, there is a marvelous temple of serpents. Only the serpents of fire can resurrect from among the dead. An inhabitant of the two-dimensional world, with his two-dimensional psychology, would think that all phenomena that occur in his plane would have their cause and effect their birth and death, there. Such phenomena would be identical to those beings. Those two-dimensional beings would take all phenomena that came from the third dimension as exceptional findings in their two-dimensional world. They wouldn't accept being told about a third dimension because for them only their flat two-dimensional world would exist. Yet, if these flat beings resolve to abandon their two-dimensional psychology to deeply comprehend the causes of all the phenomena of their world, they would then be able to come out of it and discover in amazement a great unknown world, the three-dimensional world. The same would happen with the matter of love. People think that love is only to perpetuate the species. People think love is only vulgarity, carnal pleasure, violent desire, satisfaction, etc. Only those who are able to see beyond these animal passions, only the one who renounces this type of animal psychology can discover, in other worlds and dimensions, the grandiosity and majesty of that which is called love. People dream profoundly. 
People live asleep and dream of love but they haven't awoken to love. They sing of love and believe love is that which they dream about. When man wakes up to love, he becomes conscious of love, he recognizes he was dreaming. Then and only then is the true meaning of love discovered. Only then does one discover what he was dreaming about. Only then does one come to know that which is called love. This awakening is similar to that of the man who, being in the astral body outside of his physical body, realizes he has awakened to consciousness. People in the astral walk around dreaming. When someone realizes he is dreaming, he says, This is a dream. I am dreaming. I am in the astral body. I am outside of my physical body. The dream disappears as if by enchantment, and the individual remains awake in the astral world. A new and marvelous world appears before the one who was dreaming before. His consciousness has awoken. Now he can know all the marvels of nature. Awakening to love is like this, too. Before that awakening, we dream about love, we live in a world of passions, sometimes delicious romances, heartbreaks, vain oaths, carnal desires, jealousy, etc., etc., and we believe it is love. We are dreaming, and we don't know it. Resurrection of the dead is impossible without love because love and death are two faces of the same deity. It is necessary to awaken to love to attain resurrection. It is urgent to renounce our three-dimensional psychology and crude facts to discover the meaning of love in the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh dimensions. Love comes from the superior dimensions. Whoever does not renounce his three-dimensional psychology will never discover the true meaning of love because love does not originate in the three-dimensional world. If the flat being does not renounce his two-dimensional psychology, he will believe the only reality of the universe is lines, lines changing colors in a plane, etc. A flat being wouldn't know that the lines, and the changing colors of certain lines, could be the result of a wheel of multicolored spokes spinning around, perhaps a carriage. The two-dimensional being wouldn't know the existence of that carriage, and with his two-dimensional psychology, he wouldn't believe in that carriage. He would only believe in the lines and the changing colors seen in his world, without knowing they were only effects of superior causes. Those who believe love is only of this three-dimensional world are just the same, and they only accept crude facts as the one true meaning of love. People like this cannot discover the true meaning of love. People like this cannot be devoured by the serpent of fire. People like this cannot resurrect from among the dead. All poets, all lovers, have some of love but none really know what love is. People only dream about that which is called love. People have not awoken to love. Chapter 21 The Ninth Sphere In the great ancient civilizations that have preceded us in the course of history, the descent into the Ninth Sphere was the maximum test for the supreme dignity of the Hierophant. Hermes, Buddha, Jesus, Dante, Zoroaster, etc., and many other great masters had to pass through that difficult ordeal. Remember, dearest disciples, the Ninth Sphere is sex. Many are they who enter the Ninth Sphere. However, it is very rare to find anyone who can victoriously pass that difficult ordeal. Most students of the occult live flitting from school to school, lodge to lodge, always curious, always in search of novelties, on the lookout for any new lecturer who arrives in the city. When any of those students resolve to work with the Arcanum A. Zedef, when any of those students decide to descend to the Ninth Sphere in order to work with the fire and the water, he does so as usual, searching, always curious, always foolish. The occultist student turns everything into little schools and theories. If he enters the Ninth Sphere, he does so as if he's entered another little school, always stupid, always curious, always foolish. It's difficult to find a serious and determined aspirant of the truth on the path of perfect matrimony. Sometimes students appear who are apparently very mature and serious. However, in the long run, they show what they are really made of. Sad truth, but it's the reality of this life. The ordeals of the ninth sphere are very fine and subtle. The doctor advises the devotee to fornicate because, otherwise, the doctor says, he will become ill. The wife's close friends stir up fear in her. The so-called brothers of different organizations frighten the student. Magicians of darkness, disguised as saints, advise the devotee to spill the semen in a saintly manner. Pseudo-sages teach the aspirant negative sexual magic with the spilling of the semen. The manner of teaching, the sublime and mystic tinge the tenebrous ones, disguised as saints, give to their doctrine, 
succeeds in misleading the devotee and diverting him from the path of the razor's edge. Then the student falls into black magic. When the student goes astray, he believes he is wiser than the masters of Gnosis. Indeed, the failures of the ninth sphere, those who do not succeed in passing the very long and hard ordeals of this arcanum, in fact become terribly perverse demons. Worst of all is that no demon believes himself to be bad or perverse. Every demon believes himself to be saintly and wise. When beginning the practices of sexual magic, the organism is affected. Sometimes, the sexual and parathyroid glands become inflamed, the head aches, one feels a certain dizziness, etc. This frightens the curious butterflies of the little schools who then flee in terror, looking as always for refuge in some new little school. This is how these poor fools spend their lives, always going from flower to flower. The day comes when these poor fools die, having achieved nothing. They have miserably wasted their time. Thus, when death arrives, these fools continue as a legion of demons. The ninth sphere is definitive for the aspirant to realization. It is impossible to intimately self-realize without having incarnated the soul. No one can incarnate the soul if one has not engendered the Christ astral, the Christ mind, and the Christ will. The present internal vehicles of man referred to by theosophy, are only simple mental forms everybody must dissolve when they try to achieve intimate self-realization. We need to be born, and being born is, has been, and will always be an absolutely sexual problem. It is necessary to be born, and for that, one must ascend to the ninth sphere. That is the maximum ordeal for the supreme dignity of the Hierophant. That is the most difficult ordeal. It is very rare to find someone who can pass that difficult ordeal. Normally, they all fail in the ninth sphere. It is necessary that the husband and wife love each other deeply. People confuse desire with love. The whole world sings of desire and confuse it with that which is called love. Only those who have incarnated their soul know what love is. The eye does not know what love is. The eye is desire. Everyone who incarnates his soul is therefore a Buddha. Every Buddha must work in the ninth sphere to incarnate the internal Christ. The Buddha is born in the ninth sphere. The Christ is born in the ninth sphere. First, we must be born as Buddhas, and then as Christs. Blessed be love. Blessed are the beings who truly love one another. Blessed are those who emerge victorious from the ninth sphere. Fearmongers. Many pseudo-esotericists have committed unspeakable genocides. When fearmongers act against the Kundalini, indeed, it is a true genocide. It is an indescribable crime against humanity to tell people in published books that the awakening of the Kundalini is dangerous. Those who spread fear against the Kundalini are worse than war criminals. The latter committed crimes against people, but the pseudo-esotericists who spread fear commit crimes against the soul. Whoever does not awaken the Kundalini cannot incarnate his soul. Whoever does not awaken his Kundalini remains without soul. He loses his soul. It is false to say the kundalini can awaken without moral progress, and therefore, one must wait until such progress is made. Development of the kundalini is controlled by the merits of the heart. We give concrete instructions about the kundalini, and every true serpentine culture knows the path in depth. It is false to say the kundalini can go different ways when white sexual magic is practiced. It is only when black sexual magic is practiced that the kundalini descends to man's atomic infernos and becomes Satan's tail. So, that absurd affirmation of the fearmongers that the kundalini can leave the medullar canal, tear tissue, produce terrible pains, and cause death is false. Those affirmations of the assassins of souls are false because each of the seven serpents has its specialized masters who watch over the student. The student is not abandoned in the work. When the student awakens the first serpent, he is attended by a specialist, and when the second serpent is awakened, he is helped by another, and so on. These specialists lead the serpent through the medullar canal. No student is abandoned. The specialists have to answer for the student. The specialists live in the astral world. The kundalini awakens negatively only when the semen is spilled. Whoever practices sexual magic without spilling the semen has nothing to fear. Nobody can actualize the superior aspects of the kundalini without perfect sanctity. It is then false to say there are disastrous possibilities in the premature actualization of the kundalini. Such an affirmation is false because premature actualization of the fire cannot occur. The kundalini can only be actualized based on sanctifications. 
The kundalini does not rise even one vertebra if the conditions of sanctity required for that vertebra have not been conquered. Each vertebra has its moral conditions of sanctity. It is false and stupid to say the kundalini can stimulate ambition, pride, or intensify all the base animal qualities and passions of the animal ego. Whoever uses these fear-mongering tactics to keep students from the real path is truly ignorant, because the kundalini awakened with white sexual magic cannot progress even one degree if true sanctity does not exist. The kundalini is not a blind force. The kundalini is not a mechanical force. The kundalini is controlled by the fires of the heart and can only be developed based on sexual magic and sanctity. We have to acknowledge that the serpentine culture in Mexico was, and continues to be, formidable. Every Aztec sculpture is a marvelous book of occult science. We have gone into ecstasy contemplating Quetzalcoatl, with the serpent entwined about his body, and the lingam yoni in his hands. We have been amazed, contemplating the giant serpent devouring the magician. We have been filled with singular veneration, seeing the tiger with a phallus hanging about its neck. Indeed, the word is in the phallus. In the Aztec culture, there are no firmongers. Each book of stone, each indigenous lamina, invites us to awaken the kundalini. It is urgent to first awaken the kundalini, and then to be devoured by the kundalini. We need to be swallowed by the snake. We need the kundalini to swallow us. We need to be devoured by the serpent. When one is devoured by the serpent, he also becomes a serpent. Only the human serpent can incarnate the Christ. Christ can do nothing without the snake. The authentic Aztec and Mayan cultures, the Egyptian and Chaldean, etc., are serpentine cultures that cannot be comprehended without sexual magic and the kundalini. Every archaic culture is serpentine. Every authentic and true civilization is serpentine. Civilization without the wisdom of the serpent isn't really civilization. Ascent and Descent of the Kundalini Those pseudo-esotericists who affirm that the kundalini after having ascended to the crown chakra or lotus of a thousand petals, descends again into the church of Ephesus or coccygeal center, and remains stored there, are lying terribly. The kundalini only descends when the initiate lets himself fall. The initiate falls when he spills the semen. The work to raise the serpent, after having fallen, is very arduous and difficult. The Lord of Perfection said the disciple must never let himself fall, because the disciple that falls then has to struggle a great deal to regain what was lost. Hindus state that within the Medullar Canal there is a channel called Sushumna, and within this channel there is another called Vajrini, and within this, a third called Sutrini, which is as fine as a spider's thread, on which the chakras are threaded like the knots on a bamboo pole. This is how the sacred books of India speak, and we know the Kundalini rises through Sutrini solely and exclusively with the Maithana, sexual magic, Arcana May Zedef, we practice internal meditation to achieve ecstasy, but we know very well that the kundalini does not awaken with meditation because the kundalini is sexual. It is false to affirm that the awakening of the kundalini is achieved through meditation. Meditation is a technique for receiving information. Meditation is not a technique for awakening the kundalini. Pseudo-esotericists have done much damage with their ignorance. In India, there are seven fundamental schools of yoga, and all of them speak of the kundalini. These schools of yoga are of no use if tantrism is not studied. Tantrism is the best of the East. Maithana, sexual magic, is practiced in every authentic school of esoteric yoga. That is tantrism. The tantras give fundamental value to yoga. In the center of the lotus of the heart is a marvelous triangle. This triangle is also in the coccygeal chakra and in the chakra between the eyebrows. In each of these chakras is a mysterious knot. These are the three knots. These knots enclose a profound meaning. Here we have the three foundational changes in the work with the serpent. In the first knot, Church of Ephesus, we abandon the system of spilling the semen. In the second knot, Church of Thyatira, we learn to truly love. In the third knot, Church of Philadelphia, we gain true wisdom and see clairvoyantly. The Kundalini must untie these three mysterious knots in its ascent. Pseudo-esotericists marvel that primeval Hindu yogis hardly mention the etheric chakras or plexuses, and instead concentrate all their attention on the chakras of the spine and the kundalini. In fact, the primeval Hindu yogis were tantricists and practiced maithana. They were true initiates of the wisdom of the serpent. 
They knew very well that the key to our redemption is found in the spinal cord and in the semen. They comprehended that the awakened kundalini opens the spinal chakras, and that these in turn activate the chakras of the plexuses. The main things, then, are the spinal chakras and the serpent. All the great sages and patriarchs of the ancient serpentine civilizations knew this very well. In the three triangles, base, cardiac, and frontal, the deity is represented as a sexual lingam. This says so much, but the erudite ignoramuses always search for evasions and excuses in order to alter the truth. It is not fair for pseudo-esotericists to continue deceiving, consciously or unconsciously, this poor suffering humanity. We have studied the great serpentine civilizations in depth, and we therefore speak clearly so those who want to be saved can truly save themselves. We are here to speak the truth, and we speak it even though pseudo-occultists and infrasexuals declare themselves to be our worst enemies. The truth must be told, and we tell it with great pleasure. It is necessary to work with the kundalini, and untie the three knots. Those three knots are the three triangles that transform our lives with chastity, love, and wisdom. The Sexual Spasm The White Lodge has totally and absolutely prohibited the sexual spasm. It is absurd to reach the spasm. Those who practice sexual magic must never reach the spasm. Those who set out to avoid seminal ejaculation without giving up the pleasure of the spasm may suffer disastrous consequences to their organism. The spasm is very violent, and if the organism is violent to itself, the results come right away, impotence, damage to the nervous system, etc. All those who practice sexual magic must withdraw from the act long before the spasm. Doctors know very well the reasons why those who practice sexual magic must withdraw before the spasm. You must practice only once a day. Never practice twice a day. Never in our lives should we spill the semen. Never, never, never. This order of the White Lodge must be understood so that, if the spasm unfortunately comes against our will, the disciple will withdraw from the act and immediately lie down in dorsal decubitus, face up. He will then forcibly refrain with the following movements. Instructions 1. Make the supreme effort a woman makes who is giving birth, sending the nervous current toward the sexual organs while also making an effort to close the sphincters or exits through which the seminal liquor usually escapes. This is a supreme effort. 2. Inhale as if you were pumping or making the seminal liquor rise toward the brain with the breath. As you inhale, vocalize the mantra ham. Imagine this energy rising to the brain and then passing to the heart. 3. Now exhale the breath, imagining the sexual energy being fixed in the heart. While exhaling, vocalize the mantra sa. 4. If the spasm is very strong, refrain, refrain, and continue inhaling and exhaling with the help of the mantra ham sa. Ham is masculine, sa is feminine, ham is solar, sa is lunar. One must expel the air rapidly through the mouth, producing the sound sa in a soft and delightful way. One must inhale with the mouth half open, mentally chanting the mantra ham. The basic idea of this esoteric exercise is to invert the respiratory process, making it truly positive, since in the present state the negative, lunar sa aspect predominates, which leads to seminal discharge. By inverting the respiratory process through this breathing practice, the centrifugal force becomes centripetal, and the semen then flows inward and upward. Addition the instructions we've given in the preceding paragraphs in case of spasm can also be applied, in general, to every practice of sexual magic. Every practice of sexual magic can conclude with this marvelous exercise. Work in the ninth sphere means struggle, sacrifice, effort, willpower. The weak flee from the ninth sphere horrified, terrified, frightened. Those who are devoured by the serpent become serpents, gods. In very grave cases, when the sexual spasm ensues with imminent danger of seminal ejaculation, the initiate must immediately withdraw from the act and lie on his back on the hard floor, holding his breath. To do this, he must seal his nostrils, squeezing them with the index finger and thumb. This effort must be accompanied by concentration of thought. The neophyte will concentrate intensely on the pulsations of the phallus, which are a repetition of the heartbeat. He will try to curb these sexual pulsations to avoid spilling the semen, and if he is forced to inhale oxygen, it must be done with short and rapid inhalation, continuing with the maximum retention of breath. Chapter 22 Sexual Yoga Three types of tantrism exist in India. First, 
white tantrism, second, black tantrism, and third, gray tantrism. In white tantrism, sexual magic is practiced without the spilling of semen. In black tantrism, there is spilling of semen. In gray tantrism, one does and does not spill the semen. Sometimes they spill it, sometimes they do not spill it. This type of tantrism leads the devotee to black tantrism. Within black tantrism, we find the Ban and Drukpa of the Red Hats, terrible and perverse black magicians. Clarification by Master Samuel, Aun Wewer concerning the Ban. In Oriental Tibet, the Ban monks are very radical when it comes to self-realization, which is why Blavatsky thought they were black magicians. We have all repeated this mistake, and now we feel obligated to rectify it. I am not saying the Drukpa are saints or meek lambs. They are black magicians because they teach black tantrism but the Ban, even though they use a red cap, are not black magicians as Blavatsky mistakenly supposed. Samuel, Aun Wewer, The Devil and Lucifer Continuation of Chapter These malignant people have disgusting procedures in order to reabsorb the semen through the urethra after having miserably spilled it. The outcome is fatal because the semen, after having been spilled, is charged with satanic atoms which, upon re-entering the body, acquire the power to awaken the kundalini negatively. It then descends to man's atomic infernos and becomes Satan's tail. This is how the human being forever separates himself from his divine being and sinks evermore into the abyss. Everyone who spills the cup of Hermes is properly recognized as a black magician. In India, sexual magic is known by the word Maithana. It is also known as Urvarita Yoga, and those who practice it are called Urvarita Yogis. In all truly serious and responsible yoga schools, sexual magic is practiced in an extremely secret manner. When a yogi couple, man and woman, have been well prepared, they are taken to a secret place where they are instructed about the Maithana, sexual magic. Couples unite sexually to work in the great work under the supervision of a guru, master. The man, seated upon a rug on the floor in Buthic posture, with his legs crossed oriental style, enters into sexual contact with the woman. She sits on the man's legs in such a way that her legs envelope the man's trunk. It is clear that by sitting upon him, she absorbs the phallus. Thus, the man and woman are sexually connected. Yogi couples remain in this state for hours without spilling the semen. It is the obligation of the yogi to not think during the practice of sexual magic. In those moments, both man and woman are in a state of ecstasy. The couple is thus deeply in love. The creative energies rise victoriously through their respective channels to the chalice of the brain. Animal desire is rejected. Then the couple withdraws from the act without having spilled the semen. The way sexual magic is practiced in the Oriental style may be very uncomfortable for Westerners. Nevertheless, it is recommended for those people who cannot manage to refrain from spilling the cup of Hermes. Gnostics can sexually train themselves with this practice in order to learn how to refrain and avoid the spilling of semen. Gnostic couples do not need the physical supervision of a master. However, they could invoke the masters of the astral to help them. The couple must be alone. It is necessary that animal desire does not prevail during the practice of sexual magic. Remember that desire is diabolic. The eye is desire. The eye is diabolic. Love cannot exist where there is desire because love and desire are incompatible. It is necessary to know that desire produces deception. Whoever desires, believes himself to be in love, feels himself to be in love, could swear he is in love. That is the illusion of desire. How many times have we seen couples who claim they adore each other? After marriage, the house of cards falls, and the sad reality remains. Those who believe they were in love hate each other deep down, and once desire is satisfied, failure is inevitable. Then we only hear complaints and regrets, reproaches and tears. Where was the love? What happened to love? It is impossible to love when there is desire. Only those who have incarnated their soul truly know how to love. The eye does not know how to love. Only the soul knows how to love. Love has its own atmosphere, its flavor, its happiness. It is only known to the one who has killed animal desire. Only the one who has incarnated his soul knows and experiences it. Love is nothing like that which people call love. What people believe love to be is only a deceptive desire. Desire is a deceptive substance that combines marvelously in the mind and heart to make us firmly believe that something we feel, which is not love, is love. Only the horrible reality that presents itself after the consummation of the act and the satisfaction of desire shows us clearly that we were the victims of a deception. We believed we were in love, and we actually were not. 
The human being does not yet know that which is called love. Actually, only the soul knows and is able to love. Man still has not incarnated his soul. Man still does not know what it is to love. Satan does not know what love is. The only thing the human being currently has incarnated is Satan, the I. The human being does not know how to love. Love can only exist from heart to heart, from soul to soul. Whoever has not incarnated his soul does not know how to love. Satan cannot love, and this is what the human being has incarnated. The perfect matrimony is the union of two beings, one who loves more, and the other who loves better. Love is the best religion the human being can profess. Desire is a substance that breaks down into many substances. These substances of desire manage to deceive the mind and the heart. The one who despairs because his wife has left him for another man was not actually in love. True love demands nothing, asks nothing, desires nothing, thinks nothing, only wants one thing, the happiness of the beloved. That is all. The man who loses the one he loves only says, I am happy you found your happiness. If you found it with another man, I'm glad you found it. Desire is another thing. The passionate man who has lost the woman he loved, because she left him for another, can even go so far as to kill, and to kill himself too. He falls into the most horrible desperation. He has lost the instrument of his pleasure. That is all. Actually, true love is only known by those who have incarnated their soul. Humanity still does not know that which is called love. Really, love is like an innocent child. It is like the swan of white plumage. Love is like the first games of childhood. Love does not know anything because it is innocent. When we dissolve that horrible phantom that continues after death, the I, that which is called love is born within us. When we reach that state, we recover our lost innocence. Currently, the human being has only incarnated an embryo of the soul. At times, it emits some sparks of love. The mother who adores her child is a very good example of that which is called love. The embryo of the soul can be strengthened with the blessed flame of love. Sometimes, man and woman feel the radiations of love that flow from the embryo of the soul, but immediately suffocate them with the violent and terrible passions Satan gives to man and woman alike. If we cultivate those divine vibrations of love, we can then fortify and strengthen the embryo of the soul, so that later we may intensely live that which we call love. Love strengthens the embryo of the soul. When the embryo grows stronger, we achieve the incarnation of the soul. Rare are those human beings who manage to feel the divine loving vibrations that radiate from the embryo of the soul. What humanity normally feels are the forces of desire. Desire also sings and turns into ballads and infinite endearments. Desire is the most deceptive poison that exists in the entire cosmos. Anyone who is a victim of the great deceiver would swear he is in love. Men and women, I invite you to love. Follow the footprints of those, few in the world who have known how to love. Gods and goddesses love each other within the nuptial enchantment of paradise. Blessed are the beings who truly love each other. Only love can convert us into gods. Endocrinology Although it may seem incredible, it is certain and absolutely true that science is closer to transmutation and sex yoga than many students of yoga. Endocrinology is bound to produce a true creative revolution. Scientists already know that the sexual glands are not sealed capsules. They absorb and secrete hormones. Hormones of secretion are called conservators because they perpetuate the species. The endocrine hormones are called vitalizing because they vitalize the human organism. The process of hormonal increasing is transmutation, the transformation of one type of energy matter into another type of energy matter. Mythana, sexual magic, is intensified sexual transmutation. The Gnostic absorbs, transmutes, and sublimates the totality of the sexual energy matter. The rich and abundant sexual hormones inundate the circulatory system of the blood and reach the different glands of internal secretion, stimulating and inciting them to work intensely. Thus, with intensified sexual transmutation, the endocrine glands are super-stimulated, producing, as is natural, a greater number of hormones, which animate and modify the entire liquid nervous system. Already, science recognizes sexual transmutation in every individual of normal sexuality. Now it is only a question of advancing a little further to recognize the intensified sexual transmutation of supersexual individuals. Whoever biologically studies the 32 major signs of the Buddha will reach the conclusion that the secondary sexual characteristics of the Buddha were really those of a superman. These secondary sexual characteristics of the Buddha indicate, point to, a very intense sexual transmutation. 
There can be no doubt that the Buddha practiced Maithana, sex yoga, sexual magic, the arcana may ZF. Buddha taught white tantrism, sexual magic. However, he gave that teaching to his disciples secretly. Zen and Chan Buddhism teach Maithuna, and couples practice this sex yoga. Secondary Sexual Characteristics There are primary sexual characteristics and secondary characteristics. The primary ones are related to the sexual functions of the creative organs, and the secondary ones to the distribution of fats, formation of muscle, hair, speech, body shape, etc. Obviously, the shape of a woman's body is different from a man's, and vice versa. It is also very true that any damage to the sexual organs modifies the human organism. The secondary sexual characteristics of a eunuch are those of a degenerate. The secondary sexual characteristics of an individual of intermediate sex, or a sodomite, reveal an invert, an infrasexual. What could we deduce from an effeminate man? What about a masculine woman? What kind of primary characteristics would correspond to people with secondary sexual characteristics opposite to those of their own sex? There is no doubt that infrasexuality exists in such people. Sexual Yoga, Maithana, the Arcana May ZF, sexual magic, is a type of supersexual functionalism that, in fact, modifies the secondary sexual characteristics, producing a new type of man, a superman. It is absurd to suppose that the superman can result from beliefs, theories, sectarianisms, fanaticism, schools, etc. Really, the superman does not come from what one believes or stops believing, from the school one belongs to or stops belonging to. The secondary sexual characteristics are only modified by changing the primary characteristics. With sex yoga, with maithana, the authentic yogi initiates are able to modify the secondary sexual characteristics in a positive, transcendental, divine way. Psychology and Endocrinology Psychology appeared to be at a standstill. Fortunately, the science of endocrinology appeared. Psychology took on a new life. There have already been various attempts to study the lives of the great men based on their biological types. It is said, for example, that the decline of Napoleon coincided with the declining process of his pituitary gland. Psychological characteristics are determined by the endocrine glands and the primary sexual characteristics. Biopsychological type is definitive and can no longer be denied. It is dependent on the primary sexual characteristics. Really, biopsychological type belongs to the secondary sexual characteristics and is totally determined by the primary sexual characteristics. On this basis, we can affirm that if we want the biopsychological type being, we must work with the primary sexual characteristics. Only with sexual magic, maithana, or sex yoga do we succeed in producing the biopsychological type of master, the superman, the mahatma. Infrasexuality. In this chapter, we have made statements that infrasexuals mortally hate. They really consider themselves to be supersexual, super transcendent. Infrasexuals believe themselves to be more perfect than the third logos, and have no trouble affirming that sex is something gross, filthy, materialistic. Infrasexuals ignore that sex is the creative force of the Holy Spirit, without which they will never reach intimate self realization. Unfortunately, they insult the third logos and his marvelous sexual force. For the infrasexual, the divine sexual force of the Holy Spirit is something sinful, gross, and material. Infrasexuals have the vain illusion of self-realization through lectures, philosophies, beliefs, respiratory exercises, the bellows system, etc. It is clear they will never transform their secondary sexual characteristics with these things, and the result is failure. Evolution and Involution Nowadays, many philosophical doctrines based on the dogma of evolution are spreading in both the Eastern and Western worlds. Evolution and involution are mechanical forces that simultaneously process themselves in all of nature. We do not deny the reality of these two forces. We explain them. Nobody can deny the creative and destructive, evolutive and involutive, generative and degenerative processes. What happens is the mechanical force of evolution is attributed with things that it does not have. Neither evolution nor involution can liberate anyone. The idea that, with evolution, everybody will achieve liberation, the goal, is a fantasy of deluded people. Jesus the Christ spoke clearly and never promised salvation to all. The great master emphasizes the tremendous and terrible difficulty involved in the struggle to enter the sanctum regnum, the kingdom of magic and esotericism. For many are called, but few are chosen. Of a thousand who seek me, one finds me, of the thousand who find me, one follows me. 
of the thousand who follow me, one is mine. Here, we are not dealing with a matter of believing or disbelieving, of considering oneself chosen, or of belonging to such and such a sect. This question of salvation is very serious. You have to work with the grain, with the sexual seed. Nothing comes from nothing. It is necessary to work with the grain. It requires an effort from the grain itself, a total revolution. Only from the sexual grain is the internal angel born. Only the internal angel is admitted into the kingdom of esotericism. Maithana, sex yoga, sexual magic, is urgent. The forces of involution and evolution are simply mechanical forces, forces which liberate no one, which save no one. That's all. Many organisms are the result of involution, and many others of evolution. The indigenous and anthropophagous races are not evolving. They are really in involution. They are the degenerated products of powerful civilizations that preceded them in the course of history. All these tribes say they descend from gods, demigods, titans, etc. All these races conserve traditions that tell of the wonders of their glorious pasts. The lizard is a degenerated crocodile. The archaic ancestors of ants and bees were titans who existed before mankind. The current humanity is a degenerated product of preceding races, as the secondary sexual characteristics of the people attest. Manly women who fly airplanes and fight in war are infrasexuals, as are effeminate men who perm their hair and paint their nails in beauty salons. Those authors who assume that this is evolution, a return to divine hermaphroditism, etc., are mistaken. The authentic hermaphrodite is not of intermediate sex. The hermaphrodite of the submerged continent of Lemuria was complete, having both sexual organs totally established and developed. They were not infrasexuals. They were not of intermediate sex. Today it is only possible to find the divine hermaphrodite in the spirit and soul that is fused and perfect. The completely feminine soul and the completely masculine spirit are fused in initiation. An angel is a divine hermaphrodite. No angel is of intermediate sex. It is necessary to place ourselves upon the path of the revolution of consciousness. This path moves away from the laws of evolution and involution. Indeed, it is the straight, narrow, and difficult path of which the great Kabir Jesus spoke to us. Yogic Exercises We do not condemn yogic exercises. They are very useful and contribute to interior development. Nevertheless, all yoga that does not teach the Maithuna and the white tantric sathanas is incomplete. The great yogis of the East and West attain self-realization with sex yoga. The New Age yogis, the Agni yogis, will have to make a profound study of endocrinology and give public teachings about sex yoga. The tantric postures of the Kama Kalpa are very exaggerated, and many of them degenerate into black tantrism. We only recommend the tantric posture of this chapter. Chapter 23 the flying serpent. With tears in my eyes, it rips my heart out to have to speak of things that should not be spoken of, because it is like casting pearls before swine. But this poor suffering humanity needs it, and though I find myself in distress, I must say something about the flying serpent, the serpent bird. In the Papal Vu of the Mayans, the bird and the serpent are featured as the sexual creators of the universe. Tepu and Gukimat sent a sparrow hawk to the immense ocean of great life to bring back the serpent whose marvelous blood they kneaded with yellow and white maize. The Papal Vu states that the god Zakal formed the flesh of people with this dough of white and yellow maize mixed with the blood of the serpent. The bird represents the universal spirit of life. The serpent represents the sexual fire of the third logos. The blood of the serpent represents the waters of Genesis, the great universal sperm, the ens seminis or Christonic semen, in the waters of which is the seed of all life. These waters are the blood of the earth according to the Mayan philosopher. The goddess Coatlicue is the mother of life and death, the end seminis. Truly, the sexual fire of the third logos makes the waters of life fertile in order for the universe to emerge. In the Mayan theogony, two gods intervened in creation, one who gives life and form to man, and the other who gives him consciousness. The third logos makes the waters of life fertile. And when they have been fertilized, the second logos intervenes, infusing consciousness into every organism. The ineffable gods are the vehicles of action for all the logoic forces. The sparrowhawk, Chui, the makaw, mo, the kestrel, sense and back, the tapir, sea mink axe, and the serpent, can, are the basic components of the Mayan geogenic myths. These symbols are used exoterically and esoterically. In the exoteric or public field, they symbolize tribal facts, historical incidents, etc. In the esoteric or secret aspect, this matter is highly scientific,
profoundly philosophical, sublimely artistic, and tremendously religious. Among the Maya, the terrestrial paradise is Tamoanchan, the sacred place of the serpent bird. Tamoanchans are, in fact, initiates of the serpent. The myth of the Tamoanchans is the myth of the serpent bird. The Tamoanchans are descended from the Toltec, Almec, and Maya. The Aztecs, after much hardship, reached the lake of Texcoco, symbol of Christonic semen, where they found the bird and the serpent, the eagle and the snake. The Aztecs are the ones who have the high honor of having founded the great Tenochtitlan, based on the wisdom of the serpent. The feathered serpent clearly represents the serpent bird. The feathered serpent was identified with Quetzalcoatl, the Mexican Christ. Quetzalcoatl is always accompanied by the sacred symbols of the eagle and serpent. The feathered serpent says everything. The eagle of the spirit and the serpent of fire transform us into gods. The Quetzal of the Mayans is the feathered serpent, the serpent bird. The caduceus of Mercury. The caduceus of Mercury symbolizes the spinal medulla with its two serpents representing the channels of Ida and Pingala through which solar and lunar atoms ascend to the brain. These are the musical sharps and flats of the great Fa, which resounds in all creation. Akasha ascends like flaming fire through the medullar canal and its two poles of energy flow through Ida and Pingala. From the medullar canal and its two channels, which are entwined like serpents around the spine, a circulation begins, departing from the central duct to then be distributed throughout the whole organism. Ida and Pingala depart from the sexual organs. Ida is to the left of the medullar canal and Pingala to the right. In women, this order is reversed. The channels terminate in the medulla oblongata. This pair of cords are semi-etheric, semi-physical, and correspond to the superior dimensions of space, the igneous wings. When the solar and lunar atoms unite at the base of the spinal column, the igneous serpent of our magical powers awakens. The serpent ascends slowly amidst the ineffable delights of the perfect matrimony. The serpent enjoys the enchantment of love. When the serpent reaches the height of the heart, we receive the igneous wings, the wings of the caduceus of mercury. Then, the serpent has feathers. This is the quetzal, the serpent bird, the feathered serpent. Every initiate who transforms himself into the serpent bird can fly to the superior worlds. He can enter the different regions of the kingdom, travel in the astral body at will, travel with the super astral vehicles, travel with his physical body within the fourth dimension. He is a serpent bird. The serpent bird can escape from a sealed tomb, can walk upon the waters, as was demonstrated by Jesus the Christ, can pass through a rock from one side to the other without being harmed at all as was proven by Buddha's disciples, can fly with his physical body through the air, etc. Far on. Ida is feminine and Pingala is masculine. Here are the sharps and flats of the great Fa, which resounds in nature. Fa corresponds to solar atoms, Ra to lunar atoms, onto the flaming fire that ascends through the central canal. It is necessary to learn how to sound these sharps and flats with the powerful mantra Far on in order to travel in the astral body consciously and positively. With the mantra of these sharps and flats, we can travel in the astral body. In Egypt, when the initiate received the igneous wings, he was decorated in the temple with a pair of wings fixed to his tunic at heart level. When Jesus of Nazareth spread his igneous wings, he was personally decorated by the Pharaoh of Egypt. The position in which Jesus lay down to travel in the astral was like that of Chuck Mool, but with the head very low and without pillows, the soles of the feet upon the bed, the legs bent, and the knees raised. In this way, the great Hierophant would fall asleep playing on his marvelous lyre, the spine. The complete mantra Pharaon is divided into three syllables as follows, Pharaon. The Fa is that of the musical scale. The Ra is a deep sound. It must be vocalized with a rolling R. An reminds us of the mantra Am of India. Only in this case, instead of having the consonant M, it has the consonant N, An. In general, we can give the mantra Pharaon all the intonation that resounds in the whole of creation with the great Fa. We advise you to vocalize mentally. The disciple must fall asleep singing this mantra with the imagination and willpower concentrated upon the pyramids of Egypt. It requires practice and much patience. The Flying Serpent White magicians and black magicians use the flying serpent to travel in the astral body or with the physical body in the jinn state. In profound meditation, White magicians know how to pray and to supplicate the bronze serpent to be transported to any place on earth or in the cosmos, and the flying serpent transports them. Black magicians pray to the tempting serpent of Eden, and it takes them to the abyss, or to the halls of witchcraft, or to the witch's sabbath, etc. 
the bronze serpent rises through the medullar canal. The tempting serpent descends from the coccyx down toward the atomic infernos of nature. This is Satan's tail. Devils have their power in the tail. Blessed be the Divine Mother Kundalini. Blessed be those who fly with the power of the Adorable Mother. Wretched be they who move with the power of Santa Maria, the tempting serpent of Eden, the descending Kundalini. Unhappy are those who fly with the tenebrous power of Santa Maria. The abyss and the second death are for them. The Jinn state. A point is a cross-section of a line. A line is a cross-section of a plane. A plane is a cross-section of a body. A body is the cross-section of a tetradimensional body, that is to say, of four dimensions. Each body is tetradimensional, it has four dimensions. The fourth coordinate or fourth vertical is the basic foundation of all mechanics. Intermolecular space corresponds to the fourth dimension. In this three-dimensional world of length, width, and height we never see a complete body. We only see sides, planes, angles, etc. Therefore, perception is incomplete and subjective. In the fourth dimension, perception is objective. There we see bodies from the front, from the back, from above, from below, from within, from without, that is to say, completely. In the fourth dimension, all objects simultaneously appear complete. There, perception is objective. With the power of the flying serpent, we can take the physical body out of the world of three dimensions and pass it into the fourth dimension. In more advanced states, we can take the physical body to the fifth or sixth dimension. Serpents that fly. When we visited the Department of Magdalena in the Republic of Colombia, we were surprised to discover flying serpents. In the jungles of this region, there are sorcerers who know how to send flying serpents to their hated victims. The procedures used by these sorcerers are very uncommon. Generally, these types of sorcerers are dedicated to the practice of curing victims of venomous snake bites, which is so common in the tropics. There are many sorcerers who heal people bitten by snakes. Also, there is much competition in the craft, and the mysterious war between these sorcerers is tremendous. They live at war because of matters of their craft, which doctors usually use the fourth dimension to teletransport certain types of artificial serpents to the residence of their enemies. The procedure is simple and marvelous at the same time. The element the witch doctor utilizes to make the serpents is plant fiber from the exterior bark of the trunk of the plantain tree or banana plant. This fiber, when made into a small cord about 1 to 2 meters in length, becomes an artificial snake. The witch doctor makes seven knots in the plant fiber of this trunk to symbolize the seven churches of the snake, and then he walks about reciting his secret magical prayers. The final climax of the magical operation is the instant in which the sorcerer, full of frenzy, flings the plant fiber into space. It is transformed into a serpent upon entering the fourth dimension. The worst thing is that this flying serpent falls back into the third dimension, but inside the distant home of the hated enemy. Usually, the person is a competitor in the craft. If the victim has his body well prepared, clearly the serpent can do no harm to it. But if the victim's body is not prepared, the serpent will bite right into the heart of the victim, and he will immediately be struck dead. Normally, the witch doctors prepare their body with special herbs to defend themselves against their enemies. The plant fiber they use for those criminal acts is known by the indigenous name of Mahagua de Platano. There is no doubt these sorcerers use the power of the tempting serpent of Eden, the snake that descends, to commit these criminal acts. If those sorcerers can do remarkable things such as transforming plant fiber into a flying serpent, how much more can a white magician do with his flying serpent? The flying serpent of the white magician is the kundalini. The white magician is really the serpent bird, the serpent who flies. The seven centers of the snake are omnipotent. The serpent with wings is something formidable. With the power of the serpent bird, the magician can become invisible at will, can transport himself through the air within the fourth dimension, appearing and disappearing before astonished people. He can unleash thunder and hurricanes, calm tempests, resurrect the dead, transmute lead into gold, cure the sick by the laying on of hands, raise himself from the tomb on the third day, and conserve his body for millions of years. The serpent bird is immortal, omnipotent, wise, amorous, and terribly divine. Guardians of the mystery temples are serpents of fire. With the power of the serpent bird, we can transport ourselves to other planets of the infinite. The doubles. In all our books, we have taught different systems to travel in the astral body. Many people have learned to travel, and many have not learned. Some have read a key from our books, have understood it, put it into practice, and have then immediately learned how to travel in the astral body. Many others have practiced with one system or another without having obtained anything. 
In practice, we have been able to prove that people who are very intellectual, full of bookish culture, the library bookworms, do not manage to travel at will in the astral body. On the other hand, people who are very simple, humble peasants, poor servants of families, can do so wonderfully. This has made us think a great deal about the matter, and we have carefully investigated the problem. The fact is that travel in the astral body is not something intellectual. Rather, astral travel corresponds more to sentiment and to superior emotion. These qualities are related to the heart and not to the brain. The intellectual polarizes himself and the brain in an exaggerated fashion and, in fact, abandons the world of the heart. The result of his lack of equilibrium is loss of the psychic powers of the soul. Unfortunately, one faculty cannot be acquired without the loss of another. Whoever develops the intellect does it at the expense of the psychic faculties. This problem is serious because we can in no way approve of ignorance and illiteracy. It is logical that an intellectual culture is necessary. Ignorance leads to very serious errors. An illiterate and ignorant occultist can become a mythomaniac or slanderer, and in the worst cases, an assassin. In the astral world, we find the perverse doubles of saintly people. Opposite the angel Anel is his perverse double, the terrible demon Lilith. Opposite Elohim Geber is the terrible demon Andromelech. Opposite every good citizen is a citizen of evil. The worst of this matter is that, the appearance of the double is exactly the same as the model of light. If an adept teaches white magic, his double, the black adept, besides having similar physiognomy, manners, posture, etc., teaches black magic. This is very serious because the ignorant occultist can very easily confuse one thing for another and, in fact, become a slanderer of good people, and we repeat, even an assassin. If an ignorant occultist finds his wife in the astral world, cohabiting with one of his friends, and if he is unfortunately a schizophrenic or neurasthenic, he can assassinate his friend and his wife. His ignorance won't allow him to comprehend that what he saw was a pair of doubles cohabiting, or an act from a past reincarnation etc. Somebody who is jealous and supposes his wife is unfaithful, with some known or unknown person, can then project his thought forms and see them in the astral world. If the subject is a neurasthenic or an ignorant schizophrenic, but knows how to travel in the astral body, he can take everything he saw seriously and then commit murder, confused by his jealousy and visions. Because he is ignorant, he does not comprehend he has seen his own mental forms projected unconsciously. All this leads us to the conclusion that intellectual culture is necessary. Now the interesting thing is to know how to reconquer the lost psychic faculties. A man with a brilliant, illuminated intellect and all his psychic faculties in full activity is really, in fact and by his own right, a true illuminated one. The occultist needs to establish perfect equilibrium between mind and heart. When the mind has become excessively frozen in the brain, traveling at will in the astral body becomes completely impossible because there is imbalance. So, it is urgent that intellectual occultists re-establish equilibrium between mind and heart. Fortunately, there is a technique to re-establish the lost equilibrium. This technique is inner meditation. For those intellectuals who write to us alleging that they have not been able to travel in the astral body with the clues we have taught, we prescribe a good daily dose of inner meditation. It is urgent that they drink the wine of meditation from the cup of perfect concentration. The Karda the karta is the magnetic center of the heart. This center is marvelously described in verses 22 to 27 of the Sat Chakra Nirupana. Let us see. The heart lotuses of the color of the banduka flower, red, and on its twelve petals are the letters, katadhar, with the bindu over them, of the color of vermilion. In its pericarp is the hexagonal vayu mandala, of a smoky color, and above its surya mandala with the trikana lustrous as ten million flashes of lightning within it. Above it the Vayu Bija, of a smoky hue, is seated on a black antelope, forearmed, and carrying the goad and kusha. In his, Vayu Bija's, lap is three-eyed Isha. Like Hamsa, Hamsaba, his two arms are extended in the gestures of granting boons and dispelling fear. In the pericarp of this lotus, seated on a red lotus is the Shakti Kakini. She is forearmed, and carries the noose, Pasha, the skull, Kapala, and makes the boon, Vara, and fear dispelling, Abhaya signs. She is of a golden hue, is dressed in yellow raiment, and wears every variety of jewels, and a garland of bones. Her heart is softened by nectar. In the middle of the trikona is Shiva in the form of Vanalinga with the crescent moon, and Bindu on his head. He is of a golden color. He looks joyous with a rush of desire. 
Below him is the Javatma like Hamsa. It is like the steady tapering flame of a lamp. Below the pericarp of this lotus is the red lotus of eight petals, with its head upturned. It is in this red lotus that there are the culpa tree, the jeweled altar surmounted by an awning, and decorated by flags and the like, which is the place of mental worship. The Hindu description of this chakra is marvelous. It mentions the number of its petals, the principle of air, Vayu, Shiva, the sexual force with its lingam, and the crescent moon, etc., etc., showing the heart as the altar of mental worship, the marvelous center of meditation. Many volumes could be written upon this transcribed Hindu paragraph. The Karda is the magnetic center related to astral travel. Whoever wants to conquer the power of traveling in their astral body at will should totally change his type of vibration. This is only possible by developing the Karda. Astral travel is rather emotional and sentimental. The cold intellect has nothing to do with travel in the astral body. The brain is lunar. The heart is solar. To travel at will in the astral body, one needs superior emotion, a certain type of emotionality, sentiment, a very special super sensibility, and sleepiness combined with meditation. These qualities are only achieved with the development of the Karda. The Shiva Samhita, speaking about the Karda says, the yogi acquires immeasurable knowledge, knows the past, present, and future, acquires clairaudience, clairvoyance, and can travel the airs wherever he pleases. He sees the adepts and the yogini goddesses, obtains the faculty called Kechari, and triumphs over the creatures that move in the air. Whosoever meditates daily on the hidden Banalinga undoubtedly attains the psychic powers called Kechari, moving in the air, in the astral body or also the power of placing the body in the jinn state, and Bushari, going at will all over the world. Practice The devotee should concentrate on his heart, imagining thunder and lightning there, billowing clouds lost in the twilight, driven by strong hurricanes. The Gnostic should imagine many eagles flying in that infinite space, which is within, very deep within his heart. Imagine profound forests of nature full of sun and life, singing birds, and the sweet and gentle chirping of the crickets of the forest. The disciple should fall asleep imagining all this. Imagine now that in the forest there is a golden throne on which the goddess Kakini, a very divine woman, sits. The Gnostic should fall asleep meditating on all this, imagining all this. Practice for one hour daily. If you practice two or three or more hours daily, even better. You can practice seated in a comfortable armchair, or lying down on the floor, or on your bed with your arms and legs open to the right and left in the form of a five-pointed star. Sleepiness should be combined with meditation. You must have a lot of patience. With infinite patience these marvelous faculties of the Karda are obtained. It is best that those who are impatient, those who want it all quickly, those who do not know how to persevere throughout life, withdraw because they are not good for this. Powers are not obtained by playing around. Everything has a price. Nothing is given to us for free. The Temple of the Serpent Bird The heart is the temple of the serpent bird. It is necessary to know how to love. The serpent bird officiates in the temple of the tranquil heart. It is urgent to be devoured by the serpent. Whoever is devoured by the serpent becomes, in fact, a serpent bird. Only with sexual magic and the heart's love is the serpent, which will later devour us, awakened. When the serpent reaches heart level, the igneous wings are received. Then one is transformed into a serpent bird. It is urgent to know how to lead a married life. Fights between husband and wife are of Satan. He fights against the serpent bird. He wants to damage the great work. It is necessary to comprehend the necessity of tolerating the defects of our husband or wife because no one is perfect. The work in the flaming forge of Vulcan is more valuable than all the defects of our spouse. It is stupid to throw away all the work to give Satan his pleasure. The temple of the feathered serpent is in the heart, and we must not profane it by sinning against love. The path of perfect matrimony is wisdom and love. We must love consciously. We must love our worst enemies, returning good for bad. In this way, by knowing how to love, we prepare ourselves for the festival of the tranquil heart. In his emerald tablet, Hermes Trismegistus said, I give you love in which is found the whole summum of wisdom, another type of fearmonger. There are many pseudo-occultists and pseudo-esotericists who spread fearmongering rumors against the voluntary travel in the astral body. It is false and harmful to the great work of the Father to make people fearful of traveling in the astral body. Indeed, traveling in the astral body is not dangerous because every human being travels in the astral body during the hours of normal sleep. Unfortunately, People go around in their astral body with their consciousness asleep. 
People do not know how to travel in their astral bodies at will. There is no danger whatsoever in becoming conscious of one's own natural functions, which are eating, drinking, marrying, and traveling in the astral body. All these functions are completely natural. If traveling in the astral body were as dangerous as the Firmungus state, by now there would be no one living on earth because everyone travels in the astral body, and still worse, they do so with their consciousness asleep. Nevertheless, nothing happens. And so, at this moment, the planet Mercury is coming out of a cosmic night. As it leaves its state of repose, the hierarchies of this planet will become more and more active. The lords of Mercury propose to teach the inhabitants of Earth, in a practical way, the art of entering and leaving the physical body at will. In the future, all humans must consciously travel in the astral body. This then is a law of nature, a cosmic commandment, and everything opposed to this law is a crime. Indeed, those who spread this kind of fear are unconsciously acting as black magicians when they propagate this special type of fear. The special objective of the universal spirit of life is to become conscious of itself in all the dimensions of space. In principle, the universal spirit of life is unknown to itself. It is happy, but it does not have consciousness of its own happiness. Happiness without consciousness of oneself is not happiness. The universal spirit of life descends into matter to become conscious of itself. The great reality emerges from its own bosom in the dawn of the whole universe and contemplates itself in the living mirror of nature. That is how it comes to know itself. In this way a vibratory mental activity is created through which the great reality contemplates its infinite images on the cosmic stage. This activity, moving from the periphery to the center, is called universal mind. We all live submerged in the infinite ocean of the universal mind. The intellectual activity of the universal mind emanates from a centripetal force. Every action is followed by a reaction. The centripetal force, on finding its resistance in the center, logically reacts and creates a centrifugal activity called cosmic soul. This vibratory soul becomes a mediator between the center and the periphery, between the universal spirit of life and matter, between the great reality and its cosmic images. The great master Paracelsus stated, The soul is the product of the centrifugal action of universal activity, impelled by the centripetal action of the imagination of the universe. In this day and age, the human being has only an embryo of a soul within his astral ghost, but this embryo must be strengthened and self-awakened. The awakening of cosmic consciousness within man is the most grandiose event in the universe. In these moments, the Great White Lodge is intensely occupied with the awakening of human consciousness. The adepts struggle intensely to teach the human being to travel at will in the astral body. They want people to awaken. Therefore, all that goes against this great law is a crime. The whole objective of the descent of spirit into matter is to create soul and to become self-conscious. When we direct mental power towards the interior of our own intimate center, the resistance we will find internally will cause a reaction and the more vigorous the centripetal force we apply, the more vigorous will be the resulting centrifugal force. Thus, we fabricate soul. Thus, we invigorate the embryo of the soul, and finally one day, once we have been born as serpent birds, we will completely absorb and assimilate the totality of soul within our astral body. The awakening of consciousness is urgent. Whoever learns to travel in the astral body at will can study at the feet of the great masters of wisdom. In the astral world we find our guru who will instruct us in the great mysteries. We need to abandon fear to have the joy of visiting the lands of paradise. We need to abandon fear to have the joy of entering the temples of the land of the golden light. There we will sit at the feet of the great masters of the white lodge. There we will gain strength for the difficult path. It is necessary that we strengthen ourselves on the path to take a rest and receive direct instruction from the lips of our guru. He, as a loving father, always waits for us in the astral body to console us. The adepts are true flying serpents. Chapter 24 Secret Egypt The great mysteries of Gnosis existed there in ancient Egypt, in the sunny land of Chem. Then, whoever entered the initiatic colleges, after having been submitted to the most difficult trials, received the terrible secret of the great arcanum, the key of sexual magic, by word of mouth. Everyone who received this secret had to take an oath of silence. Whoever swore and then violated his oath was taken to a rocky paved courtyard of death. There, before a wall covered with strange hieroglyphs, he was inevitably put to death. His head was cut off, his heart was torn out, his body was burned, and his ashes were thrown to the four winds. In fact, 
Everyone who received the great arcanum during the sacred ceremony immediately went to work with the Vestal of the temple. There were many Vestals prepared to work in the great work with the celibate initiates. The married initiates practiced in their homes with their priestess wives. The Vestals were duly prepared for the priesthood of love. They had great female masters who prepared them, and they were submitted to great ordeals and penances. Actually, they were the sacred prostitutes about which many authors speak. Today, it would be impossible to have Vestals of this type in the Lemigials. The world has become so corrupted that the result would be to further corrupt that which is already corrupted. We would, in fact, become abject accomplices to the crime. All those celibate initiates who have shown in the history of the centuries practice sexual magic within the pyramids with such vestals. Jesus also had to practice sexual magic in the pyramid of Kephren. There he recapitulated all his initiations. Many will be shocked by our statement. We cannot criticize these Puritans. Really, it was the Catholic priesthood that dehumanized Jesus. Unfortunately, this has been so well ingrained into people's minds that even occultists continue with the false idea of a castrated, mutilated Jesus. The reality is that Jesus was a complete man in the fullest sense of the word, fully a man. In occult masonry of the ancient Pharaonic Egypt, there were three basic degrees, apprentice, journeyman, and master. These three degrees are related with the ethereal forces that flow through and around the spinal column of each human being. Madame Blavatsky refers to them in The Secret Doctrine, as follows. The Trans-Himalayan school locates Sushumna, the chief seat of these three nadis, in the central tube of the spinal cord, and Ida and Pingala, the two witnesses of the apocalypse, on its left and right sides. Ida and Pingala are simply the sharp and flats of that, fa, of human nature, which, when struck in a proper way, awakens the sentries on either side, the spiritual manas and the physical kama and subdues the lower through the higher. It is the pure akasha that passes up Sushumna, the medullar canal, its two aspects flow in Ida and Pingala, the pair of sympathetic cords that entwine the spinal medulla. These are the three vital airs, and are symbolized by the brahmanical thread. They are ruled by the will. Will and desire are the higher and lower aspects of one and the same thing. Hence the importance of the purity of the canals. From Sushumna, Ida, and Pingala, a circulation is set up and from the central canal passes into the whole body. Ida and Pingala play along the curved wall of the cord in which is Sushumna, the medullar canal. They are semi-material, positive and negative, sun and moon, and start into action the free and spiritual, igneous, current of Sushumna. They have distinct paths of their own, otherwise, they would radiate all over the body. In that ancient elemental Egypt, which grew and matured under the protective wings of the elemental sphinx of nature, the ceremony of initiation was something terribly divine. When the Venerable Master wielded the sword in the act of admission, the canals of Ida and Pingala, the two witnesses, and the canal of Sushumna, along with the forces that circulated through them, received a tremendous stimulus. In the first degree, this stimulus only affected the feminine lunar current of Ida, in the second degree, Pingala, the masculine current and in the third, the igneous current of Kundalini, which flows ardently through the medullar canal of Sushumna, received the stimulus. With this third degree, the Kundalini was awakened. We want to clarify that these three stimuli were related with the work of sexual magic the initiate performed with the Vestal of the Temple. That stimulus would be useless if the candidate was a fornicator. This is for people who are practicing sexual magic intensely. Yid arises from the base of the spinal column to the left of Sushumna and Pingala to the right. These positions are reversed in women. The cords end in the medulla oblongata. All this is symbolized by the caduceus of Mercury with its two spread wings. The two wings of the caduceus of Mercury signify the power to travel in the astral body, the power to travel in the mental body, the power to travel in the causal, conscious, and spiritual vehicles. The fire grants those who follow the path of the razor's edge the power to leave the physical body at will. Kundalini has the power of awakening the human being's consciousness. With the fire, we remain completely awakened in the superior worlds. All those who have awakened in the superior worlds live absolutely conscious outside of the physical body during the hours of sleep. Whoever awakens the consciousness can never again dream. They become, in fact and rightfully, absolutely conscious citizens of the superior worlds. They work with the White Lodge while their physical body sleeps. They are the collaborators of the great white universal fraternity. 
We clarify Ida and Pingala are not physical. No physician would find them with a scalpel. Ida and Pingala are semi-ethereal, semi-physical. The great mysteries of ancient Egypt, as well as the mysteries of Mexico, Yucatan, Eleusis, Jerusalem, Mithra, Samothrace, etc., are all intimately related and are in fact absolutely sexual. Ask, and it shall be given you, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. The great initiates always answer. The guardians of the elemental sphinx of nature always respond. Everyone who practices sexual magic must ask for the fire. Beg the guardians of the sphinx, invoke the god Agni. This god can restore the igneous power in each of the seven bodies. There are five great initiations of the sacred fire. The first means the departure of the one who has already entered the current leading to nirvana. The fifth means the entry into the temple erected on the summit of the mountain. With the first, we leave the well-trodden path. With the fifth, we enter the secret temple. Chapter 25 Fatality When the Dark Age arrived, the initiatic colleges were closed. That was the fatality. From then on, the great black lodges, which were born during the archaic darkness of ancient times, indeed became more active. The limit of light is darkness. Next to every temple of light exists another of darkness, and where the light shines brightest, the darkness becomes denser. The initiatic colleges of Egypt, Greece, India, China, Mexico, Yucatan, Peru, Troy, Rome, Carthage, Chaldea, etc., had their dangerous antipodes, their fatal antitheses, tenebrous schools of black magic, fatal shadows of the light. Those schools of black magic were the shadows of the initiatic colleges. When the aforementioned colleges were closed, those fatal schools became very active. It is not strange to find among those dens of the Black Lodge terminology, sciences, and rituals similar to those used in the initiatic colleges. This confuses devotees of the path. By nature, the devotee is a lover of the rare, the exotic, the distant, and the impossible, and when he finds a black magician of this type talking about the Egyptian, Mayan, Aztec, Inca, Greek, Chaldean, Persian mysteries, etc., he then naively believes he's caught God by the beard and places himself in the hands of the black magician, believing him to be white. This type of magician of darkness abounds wherever initiatic colleges existed. They are the antitheses of those colleges, and they speak like masters, always boasting of the initiates of those colleges. They never say anything that might arouse suspicion. They show kindness and humility, defend goodness and truth, adopt tremendously mystical attitudes, etc. Under such conditions, it is clear the naive and inexperienced devotee abandons the path of the razor's edge and delivers himself fully into the hands of those wolves in sheep's clothing. That is the fatality. Those schools of black magic abound everywhere. Let's remember the dissident sect of the Mayans. Their adepts were expelled from the Mayan White Lodge. They are black magicians. This school is established between the Yucatan and Guatemala. Presently, this school of Mayan black magic has active agents in Mexico and Guatemala. Nonetheless, who would dare to doubt those tenebrous ones who say they are Mayan princes and great priests? Those nobles still speak with much reverence about the supreme god Teoti, creator and maintainer of the world. They become ecstatic remembering Bacab, the Mayan trinity, and Kamaxli, punisher of the evil ones, etc. Under these circumstances it is very difficult to detect such tenebrous people. When the devotee entrusts himself to them, they take him to their temples where they initiate him. Clearly the devotee becomes a black magician in the most naive way. A devotee in these circumstances would never accept being called a black magician. The abyss is full of sincerely mistaken people, and people with very good intentions. Thus, on the banks of the Nile, as well as in the sacred land of the Vedas, there appear many tenebrous ones of this type. Really, they are now very active, fighting to swell their ranks. If the student wants a key to uncover these people of the shadow, we shall give it with great pleasure. Speak to the person about white sexual magic, without spilling of semen. Mention scientific chastity to him. Tell him you never spill your semen. That is the key. You can be sure that if the suspected character is really a black magician, he will try every means to convince you sexual magic is harmful to your health, is detrimental, and will suggest the idea of spilling the semen. Be careful, good disciple, of such people who advise you to spill the cup of Hermes. They are black magicians. Do not let them seduce you with their sweet words, exotic manners, or strange names. Every devotee who spills the cup of Hermes inevitably falls into the abyss of fatality. Be vigilant. Remember, 
The path of perfect matrimony is the path of the razor's edge. This path is full of dangers, both within and without. Many are they who begin, but it is very difficult to find someone who does not leave the path. The case of an initiate from the time of Count Cagliostro comes to mind. This student practiced sexual magic intensely with his wife, and of course, naturally acquired degrees, powers, initiations, etc. Everything was going very well until the day he had the laxness to tell another occultist friend about his intimate affairs. This friend was scandalized, and armed with great erudition, advised the initiate to abandon his practice of sexual magic without ejaculation of the semen. The teachings of the mistaken friend misled the initiate. Henceforth, he dedicated himself to the practice of sexual magic spilling of the cup of Hermes. The result was disastrous. The kundalini of the initiate descended to the magnetic center of the coccyx. Degrees and powers, sword and cape, sacred tunics and mantles were lost. This was a true disaster. This was the fatality. It is good to know that black magicians love to fortify the mind. They claim man can only resemble God through the mind. Magicians of darkness mortally hate chastity. Devotees of the path who abandon the path of perfect matrimony in order to become disciples of the Black Lodge can be found in the millions. What happens is that devotees of occultism are attracted by what's rare, the novel and mysterious, and when they find one of these rare magicians, they immediately deliver themselves into his hands, like any vulgar prostitute of the mind. That is the fatality. Whoever wants to be born as a cosmic angel, whoever wants to transform himself into an angel with powers over fire, air, water, and earth, whoever wants to transform himself into a god, indeed must not let himself become trapped by all of these dangerous temptations. It is very difficult to find people who are sufficiently firm and constant to never abandon the path of perfect matrimony. The human being is extremely weak. That is the fatality. For many are called, but few are chosen. If we succeed in elevating a few beings to the angelic state, we will be satisfied. Love, the only path of salvation. Enemies of love are called fornicators. They confuse love with desire. Any magician who teaches ejaculation of the semen is a black magician. Every person who spills the seminal liquor is a fornicator. It is impossible to reach intimate self-realization while one has not yet killed animal desire. Those who spill the cup of Hermes are incapable of loving. Love and desire are incompatible. Whoever spills the cup of Hermes is a victim of animal desire. Love is incompatible with desire and fornication. Sufism. The most ineffable of Mohammedan mysticism is Persian Sufism. It has the merit of fighting against materialism and fanaticism, as well as against the literal interpretation of the Quran. Sufis interpret the Quran from the esoteric point of view, just as we Gnostics interpret the New Testament. What is most disconcerting to Westerners is the strange and mysterious mixture of the erotic with the mystical in the Eastern religions and Sufi mysticism. Christian theology considers the flesh to be hostile to the spirit, but in the Muslim religion, flesh and spirit are two substances of the same energy, two substances that must mutually help each other. This is only understood by those who practice positive sexual magic. In the East, religion, science, art, and philosophy are taught as an erotic and exquisitely sexual language. Muhammad fell in love with God, say the mystic Arabs. Select for thyself a new wife every spring of the new year, because last year's calendar is no good, says a Persian poet and philosopher. Those who have carefully studied the Song of Songs by the sage, Solomon, find that delicate mixture of the mystical and the erotic, which scandalizes infrasexuals so much. A true religion cannot renounce the erotic because it would be its death. Many myths and ancient legends are based on the erotic. In fact, love and death constitute the base of every authentic religion. The Sufis, Persian poets, wrote about the love of God in expressions applicable to beautiful women. These scandalized the infrasexual fanatics. The idea of Sufism is the amorous union of the soul with God. Indeed, nothing can better explain the amorous union of the soul with God than the delectable sexual union of man and woman. That is the brilliant idea of Sufism. If we want to talk about the union of God with the soul, we must do so in the erotic language of love and sex. Only in this way can we express what we have to say. The symbolic language of the Sufis has marvelous expressions. Among them, sleep signifies meditation. Actually, meditation without drowsiness damages the mind. This is known by every true initiate. One must combine drowsiness with meditation. This is known by the Sufis. The word perfume symbolizes hope of divine favor. Kisses and embraces signify, 
among other things, the rapture of piety, wine means spiritual knowledge, etc. Sufi poets sang of love, women, roses, and wine, and nonetheless many of them lived the lives of hermits. The seven mystical states described by the Sufis are something extraordinary. There are certain chemical substances closely related with the mystical states. Nitrous oxide and ether, especially nitrous oxide when it is dissolved sufficiently in air, stimulate the mystical consciousness to an extraordinary degree. We have to remember that this present humanity is subconscious. People like this are incapable of knowing the superior dimensions of space. It is urgent to awaken the consciousness, and this is only possible during ecstasy. If we analyze ecstasy with dialectic logic, we discover that it is sexual. The same sexual energies that are expressed in erotic pleasure, when transmuted and sublimated, awaken the consciousness, and then produce ecstasy. Fatality is the loss of ecstasy, the fall into subconsciousness again. This happens when we spill the cup of Hermes. A great master said, with the sexual impulse, man finds himself in the most personal relationship with nature. Comparison of the sensation a man experiences with a woman, or vice versa, with the consent of nature, is indeed the same sensation as that offered by the forest, the prairie, the sea, the mountains, save that in this case it is even more intense since it awakens more internal voices, provokes the sound of more intimate chords. This is how we reach ecstasy. Ecstasy, the mystical experience, has its principles based on dialectic logic. This logic can never be violated. Let's reflect, for example, on the unity of experience. This principle exists among the Eastern mystics as well as those of the West, among the Hierophants of Egypt, as well as the Sufi sages, and among the Aztec magicians. During ecstasy, the mystics speak in the same universal language, use the same words, and feel united with all creation. The sacred scriptures of all religions show the same principles. This is dialectic logic, superior logic. This proves mystics from all the world's countries drink from the same fountain of life. The conditions for the world's causes, another of the principles of dialectic logic, demonstrate with exactitude, precision, and complete agreement of facts, the reality and truth of ecstasy. Mystics of all religions of the world totally agree in their statements about the conditions for the world's causes. The concordance is perfect. The unity of life is another of the principles of dialectic logic. Every mystic in ecstasy perceives and feels the unity of life. The mathematics of the infinite and of dialectic logic can never fail. Whoever spills the cup of Hermes loses the ecstasy. His visions are no longer within dialectic logic. Nonetheless, he believes himself to be super-transcendent. He violates the principles of dialectic logic and falls into the madness of absurdity. That is the fatality. Every Gnostic student must avoid black tantra and those who teach black sexual magic if they do not want to fall into the abyss of fatality. During this Kali Yuga, dissidents of the past archaic schools are very active. Black magicians are carrying out a tremendous campaign in this age, with the purpose of imposing false knowledge in the epoch that is commencing. They want the Black Lodge to triumph. Infra Sex and Yoga The seven schools of yoga are ancient and grandiose, but they could not escape the goals of the tenebris. At present, there are many infrasexual people who look for proselytes by establishing yoga schools. Those individuals mortally hate the path of perfect matrimony, they abhor white sexual magic. Some of them teach black tantrism, that is the fatality. True yoga is based on white sexual magic. Yoga without sexual magic is an infrasexual doctrine, specific to infrasexuals. In the Kama Kalpa and Tantric Buddhism one finds the legitimate foundations of yoga. The Ahamsara and Maithuna are in fact the bases of a true yoga. Ahamsara, dissolution of the eye, and Maithuna, sexual magic, therein lies the true synthesis of yoga. Those who have been members of a Zen Buddhist monastery know very well that the Maithuna and dissolution of the returning ego constitute the fundamentals of self-realization. It is now opportune to remember the case of the Christ Yogi Babaji. He was not celibate. Those who believe that Mataji is his sibling are mistaken. Mataji is his priestess wife. With her, he attained intimate self-realization. Indian Buddhism, like Zen and Chan Buddhism, is tantric. Without white tantra, yoga is a failure. That is the fatality. Chinese and Japanese Buddhism are completely tantric. There is no doubt that Chan and Zen Buddhism really march on the path of intimate self-realization. In secret Tibet, sexual yoga is grandiose. The great masters of Tibet practice sexual magic. A great friend of mine wrote to me from India saying, In Hindu and Tibetan Tantra, 
positive sexual yoga, Maithana, is practiced without seminal ejaculation. After preparation in which the couple learns, under the direction of an expert guru, to perform the practices of Laya Kriya together, they proceed to the tantric sadhana, during which the husband must introduce the viral member into the vagina. This operation takes place after an exchange of caresses between the couple. The male sits cross-legged in an asana, posture, and the woman absorbs the phallus. The couple remains in conibium for a long time without moving, trying to prevent the ego and analytical consciousness from intervening, letting nature act without interference. Then, without expectation of orgasm, erotic currents enter into activity, provoking ecstasy. In this instant, the ego dissolves, withdraws, and desire is transmuted into love. Intense currents similar to electromagnetism, which produce static effects, traverse both bodies. A sensation of ineffable bliss takes possession of the entire organism, and the couple experiences the ecstasy of love and cosmic communion. Here ends the account of my friend whose name I do not mention. This account is hated by infrasexuals involved in yoga. They want to work with yoga to increase the number of infrasexual fanatics. That is the fatality. Yoga without sexual magic is like a garden without water, or a car without gasoline, or a body without blood. That is the fatality. Aztec magic. In the cobbled courtyards of the Aztecs, naked men and women spent long periods of time kissing and caressing each other and practicing sexual magic. When the initiate committed the crime of spilling the cup of Hermes, he was condemned to death for having profaned the temple. The delinquent was beheaded. That is the fatality. Chapter 26 Totemism The ignorant swine of dialectic materialism criticize totemism. They laugh at it without comprehending it. We Gnostics comprehend the grandeur of totemism and know its doctrine rests upon the basic principles of occultism. Totemists profoundly know the law of reincarnation, as well as the laws that govern the evolution of all living species. They know karma is the law of cause and effect. They comprehend that everything that lives is subject to karma. The great initiates of totemism have investigated, with their clairvoyant powers, the intimate life of all creation, and they base the principles of their doctrine on these scientific investigations, which are totally unknown to the ignorant swine of materialism. Totemists know scientifically that every mineral atom is the physical body of an intelligent elemental. Totemists know this mineral elemental evolves until later becoming the soul of a plant. The souls of vegetables are the vegetable elementals, which Paracelsus knows how to manage for his healing purposes. With plants, one can provoke tempests and earthquakes. With plants, we can cure sick people from a distance. Plant elementals are omnipotent because they have developed the kundalini since they never fornicate. Totemists know evolving plant elementals later become animal elementals. The great magicians know about animal elemental magic, and they often perform marvels with the animal elementals. Totemists know that when animal elementals are very evolved, they then become human beings. Every well-advanced animal elemental is reborn within a human body. Totemists priests wisely state that if the human being does evil, he may involute, regressing until he becomes an animal again. This is true. Every perverse human being reverts to the animal state. He can be reborn as an animal many times but then he is converted, he transforms into an animal in the astral plane. So, this claim of totemism is true. It is also very true that perverse people can really be reborn in the bodies of ferocious animals. Other cases exist in which the purest soul of a saint reincarnates into some species of animal in order to help it and elevate it to a superior level of consciousness. Therefore, the principles of totemism are exact. Totemists know the law of karma profoundly and know that the fate of every human being is the outcome of karma from past lives. In tribes where totemism reigns, they traditionally venerate a particular plant or mineral elemental they know through direct experience. As a rule, this elemental would have given great service to the tribe. When the totem is a tree, they carve human figures into the trunk of that species. Now we have an explanation for all those myths and strange fables that speak of strange beings, half-man, half-animal, like the centaurs, the minotaurs, the sphinx, etc. Those strange images of totemism are true treasure troves containing gems of wisdom that are totally unknown to the swine of materialism. Those swine of materialism only know how to laugh. Victor Hugo said, The one who laughs at what he does not know is an ignoramus who walks on the path of idiocy. In totemism, it is forbidden to kill the animal considered the totem. 
This animal has been anointed from among those of its species because it reunites determined secret characteristics only clairvoyance can recognize. The wise Totemis priests venerate the animal or plant elemental that serves as a vehicle for the divinity. This creature is much cared for, and its death is only possible with a very sacred liturgy and several days of general mourning. This is not understood by ignorant civilized people because they have divorced themselves from great nature. However, the totem priests do understand it. We find traces of totemism in all religious cults. Hindus venerate the white cow, Chaldeans, the humble lamb, Egyptians, the ox, Arabs, the camel, Inca, the llama, Mexicans, the dog and the hummingbird. Primeval Gnostic Christians worship the lamb, the fish, and the white dove as symbols of the Holy Spirit. Specific plant or animal elementals have always been revered. We have to recognize that these elemental creatures are omnipotent because they have not left Eden. The great plant elementals are true angels who work for all humanity in the etheric plane or region of magnetic fields. Plant elementals reproduce by means of sexual magic. Sacred copulation exists among the plant elementals, and the seed passes to the womb without the necessity of ejaculating the semen. Each animal is the body of an elemental. Each plant is the physical body of an elemental. These elementals are sacred and perform marvels in Eden. The most powerful elementals are venerated through the totem. When the human being learns how to reproduce without spilling the semen, he enters Eden. There he knows the elemental creatures of the totem. These creatures are innocent. Within themselves, animal elementals are naive. Some waste the semen stupidly, but they are not to be blamed since their divine spark is still naive. That spark has not yet reincarnated. It is a creature that still does not have its own self-consciousness. It has not taken possession of its vehicles. It retains its fires. Only its shadow, its ego in a potential state, takes bodies. The plant elemental is purer, more beautiful. They reproduce like the gods. Perfect matrimony exists among them. We also find perfect matrimony among the mineral elementals. They love each other and reproduce, have children, have their own language and customs. They do not waste the seminal liquor, they are complete. They are more perfect than the animal elementals because, unlike the latter, they never waste their seminal liquor. In Eden, elementals live happily. Everyone who follows the path of perfect matrimony, in fact, enters Eden. In fact, whoever has completely developed the sacred fire enters Eden. Complete development of the Kundalini allows us to visit Eden with the etheric body. Eden is the etheric plane, a region of intense blue where only happiness reigns. Those who have learned to love live in Eden, the totem gods. Gods exist, and Christianity worships them with the names of angels, archangels, seraphim, virtues, thrones, etc. The ignorant swine of materialism believe that man created the gods of fire, air, water, and earth out of fear. This concept of the learned ignoramuses of materialism is totally false. Soon there will appear a special lens through which we will be able to see the aura, the astral body, the astral world, the disincarnated egos, and the gods of the astral. Then all the stupid claims of the learned ignoramuses will be reduced to dust. The human being will once again adore and revere the ineffable gods. They existed even before the world appeared. Elementals. Paracelsus states that we need to fasten the elementals of nature to the chariot of science in order to fly through the air to ride on the eagle, to walk on water, to travel to the most distant places of the earth within a few moments. There are elementals that can help us with astral travel. Let's remember the elemental of that tree known in different countries as Boricero, angel's trumpet, flower of the night. This elemental can draw the human being into his astral body. It is enough for the Gnostic student to always have one of these trees in his home. It is necessary to gain the affection of the tree's elemental. During the night, the Gnostic student will concentrate on the tree's elemental. He will vocalize the syllable, come, many times, and then fall asleep begging the elemental of the tree to draw him from the physical body and into the astral body to whatever remote part of the world of the infinite cosmos. It is certain this plant elemental will help all those who truly know how to ask with faith and love. This tree is known as Floripondio in Peru, Higanton in Bolivar, Colombia. Many people triumph with these practices immediately because they are hypersensitive. But on the other hand, there are also people who are not hypersensitive. Such people need to practice a great deal in order to attain victory. Chapter 27. Sacred Phallicism 
Every religion has a sexual origin. Veneration of the lingam yoni and pudendum is common in Africa and Asia. Secret Buddhism is sexual. Sexual magic is taught practically in Zen Buddhism. Buddha taught sexual magic in secrecy. Many phallic divinities exist. In India, Shiva, Ani, and Shakti are phallic divinities. Legbar in Africa, Venus, Bacchus, Priapus, and Dionysus in Greece and Rome were phallic divinities. The Jews had phallic gods and sacred forests consecrated to sexual worship. Sometimes the priests of these phallic cults allowed themselves to fall miserably, and they fell to wild bacchanalian orgies. Herodotus relates, all women of Babylon had to prostitute themselves with the temple priests of Melita. Meanwhile, in the temples of Vesta, Venus Aphrodite, Isis, etc., in Greece and Rome, the priestesses exercised their holy sexual priesthood. In Cappadocia, Antioch, Pamplos, Cyprus, and Byblos, with infinite veneration and mystical exaltation, the priestesses celebrated great processions carrying a great phallus as God or the generative body of life and seed. The Bible also has many allusions to phallic worship. The oath from the time of the patriarch Abraham was taken by the Jews by placing their hand beneath the thigh, that is, on the sacred member. The Feast of the Tabernacles was an orgy similar to the famous Saturnalia of the Romans. The rite of circumcision is totally phallic. The history of all religions is filled with symbols and phallic amulets, such as the Hebrew mitzvah, the Christian maple, etc. In ancient times, sacred stones with phallic forms, sometimes similar to the virile member, other times similar to the vulva, were profoundly venerated. Stones of flint and silica were considered sacred because with them, the fire secretly developed as a divine privilege in the spinal column of the pagan priests, was produced. In Christianity, we find a great deal of phallicism. The circumcision of Jesus, the feast of the three wise men, Epiphany, the Corpus Christi, etc., are phallic festivals inherited from the holy pagan religions. The dove, symbol of the Holy Spirit and of the voluptuous Venus Aphrodite, is always represented as the phallic instrument used by the Holy Spirit to fecundate the Virgin Mary. The very word sacrosanct is derived from sacrum, and therefore its origin is phallic. Phallic worship is terribly divine. Phallic worship is scientifically transcendental and profoundly philosophical. The Aquarian Age is at hand, and therefore the laboratories themselves will discover the energetic and mystical principles of the phallus and uterus. The sexual glands are governed by Uranus, and contain formidable forces that laboratory science will discover in the new era. The scientific value of the ancient phallic cults will then be publicly recognized. The entire potential of universal life exists within the seed. The materialistic science of this day and age knows nothing but to sardonically criticize that which it does not know. In the cobbled courtyards of the Aztec temples, men and women sexually united to awaken the Kundalini. The couples remained there for months and years, loving and caressing each other, practicing sexual magic without spilling the semen. However, those who spilled the semen were condemned to death. Their heads were cut off with an axe. Thus, they pay for the sacrilege. In the Eleusinian mysteries, naked dances and sexual magic were the very foundation of the mysteries. Phallicism is the foundation of profound realization. All the principal tools of masonry are used for working with stone. Every master mason must chisel his philosopher's stone well. This stone is sex. We must build the temple of the Eternal One upon the living stone. Sex and Serpent A certain initiate, whose name I do not mention, writes the following, with complete control of the serpent force, one can achieve almost anything. One can move mountains, or walk on water, or levitate, or allow oneself to be buried in the earth in a sealed chamber from which one would emerge alive at any specified time. Old priests knew that under certain conditions the aura could be seen, they knew that the kundalini could be awakened through sex. The kundalini force is coiled down low, a terrific force, like a clock spring in the way it is coiled. Like a clock spring suddenly uncoiled it can do damage to those who commit the crime of spilling the semen. This particular force is located at the base of the spine, part of it actually within the generative organs. People of the East recognize this. Certain Hindus use sex in their religious ceremonies. They use a different form of sex manifestation, sexual magic, and a different sex position to achieve specified results, and they do achieve those results. The ancients, centuries and centuries ago, worshipped sex. They went in for phallic worship. 
There were certain ceremonies and temples which raised the Kundalini which gave one clairvoyance, telepathy, and many other esoteric powers. Sex used properly, and in a certain way in love can raise one's vibrations. It can cause what the Easterners call the flower of the lotus to open and to embrace the world of the spirit. It can cause the Kundalini to surge and to awaken certain centers. But sex and the Kundalini should never be abused. One should complement and supplement the other. Those religions which say that there should be no sex between husband and wife are tragically wrong. These religions, then, which say that one should have no sexual experiences are trying to stifle individual evolution and the evolution of the race. This is how it works. In magnetism one obtains a powerful magnet by arranging the molecules of the substance to face in one direction. Normally in a piece of iron, for example, all the molecules are in any direction like an undisciplined crowd. They are haphazardly arranged, but when a certain force is applied, in the case of iron, a magnetizing force, all the molecules face in one direction, and so one has the great power of magnetism without which there would be no radio or electricity, without which there would be no road or rail transport, or air travel either. In the human, when the kundalini is awakened, when the serpent fire becomes alive, then the molecules in the body all face in one direction because the kundalini force, in awakening, has pulled the molecules in that direction. Then the human body becomes vibrant with life and health, it becomes powerful in knowledge, it can see all. There are various methods, tantric positions, of awakening the kundalini completely. The Kamakulpa contains all those sexual positions, but this should not be done except with those who are suitably evolved because of the immense power and domination of others which a complete awakening would give, and power can be abused and used for ill. But the kundalini can be partly awakened, and completely, and can vivify certain centers by love between a married couple. With the true ecstasy of intimacy the molecules of the body become so arranged that many of them face in one direction, and so these people become people of great dynamic power. When all the false modesty and all the false teachings about sex are removed, then once again will man reach his true being, once again will man be able to take his place as an astral traveler. Phallic worship is as ancient as the world. Sex must help the kundalini, and the kundalini must help sex. Neither sex nor the kundalini should be abused. Sexual magic must be practiced only once a day. Man and woman are not just merely a mass of protoplasm, of flesh stuck upon a bony framework. Man is, or can be, a much greater thing than that. Here on this earth we are mere puppets of our spirit, that spirit which temporarily resides in the astral, and which obtains experience through the flesh body which is the puppet, the instrument of the astral. Physiologists and others have dissected man's body, and they have reduced everything to a mass of flesh and bone. They can discuss this bone or that bone, they can discuss various organs, but these are all material things. They have not discovered, nor have they tried to discover, the most secret things, the intangible things, things which the Indians, the Chinese, and the Tibetans knew centuries and centuries before Christianity. The spine is a very important structure indeed. It houses the spinal cord, without which one is paralyzed, without which one is useless as a human. But the spine is more important than that. Right in the center of the spinal nerve, the spinal cord is a tube which extends to another dimension, dimensions 4, 5, 6, etc. It is a tube upon which the force known as the Kundalini can travel when awakened. At the base of the spine is what the Easterners call the serpent fire. It is the seed of life itself. In the average Westerner this great force is dormant, asleep, almost paralyzed with disuse. Actually, it is like a serpent coiled at the base of the spine, a serpent of immense power, but which, for various reasons, in other words, because of filthy fornication, cannot escape from its confines for the time being. This mythical figure of a serpent is known as the Kundalini, and in awakened Easterners, the serpent force can arise through the channel in the spinal nerve, rise straight up to the brain and beyond, beyond into the astral. As it rises its potent force activates each of the chakras, or centers of power, such as the umbilicus, throat, and various other parts. When those centers are awakened, a person becomes vital, powerful, dominant. Phallicism, awakening of the kundalini, sexual magic, is not dangerous when practiced with rectitude and love. Sexual magic should only be practiced between husband and wife. Those who abuse and practice with other women outside the home inevitably fail.
infrasexual schools. There are many infrasexual schools in the world that mortally hate phallic worship and sexual magic. Lovers of wisdom must avoid those schools if they do not also want to become infrasexuals. It is necessary to remember that infrasexuality hates normal sex and supersex. In all ages, infrasexuals have blasphemed against the third logos, considering sex to be taboo, sinful, cause for shame, dissimulation, etc. Infrasexuals have schools in which they teach people to hate sex. Infrasexuals consider themselves to be mahatmas, hierophants, etc. Lovers of wisdom are often confused by infrasexuals. They have such mystical and ineffable attitudes, so anchoritic and pietistic, that if one does not have a certain degree of comprehension, one can very easily be led astray onto the path of infrasexuality. Initiation and the Serpent It is impossible to receive the initiations of major mysteries without phallic worship and without sexual magic. Many single students receive initiations of the minor mysteries in their superlative and transcendental consciousness when they are chaste. Nevertheless, the initiations of major mysteries cannot be attained without sexual magic and the kundalini. The minor mysteries are but the probationary path, a chain that has to be broken, the kindergarten of esoteric studies, the first primer. Only phallic worship can lead the human being to intimate self-realization. Chapter 28 The Fire Cult The fire cult from ancient Persia was grandiose. The fire cult is very ancient. It is said this cult predates the Achaemenid dynasty and Zoroaster's epic. Persian priests possessed a very rich esoteric liturgy related with the fire cult. The ancient Persian sages never neglected the fire. They had the mission of always keeping it alight. The secret doctrine of Avesta states that there are different types of fire, the fire of lightning that flashes in the terrible night, the one that works inside the human organism producing calories and directing the processes of digestion the one that is concentrated in the innocent plants of nature, the fire that smolders within the mountains and is spewed out by Earth's volcanoes, the one in the presence of Ahura Mazda forming his divine halo, and the everyday fire the profane used to cook their food. The Persians used to say that, in cases when boiling water is spilled, or when a living being is burned, God has ceased the benefits he granted unto his privileged people. Indeed, fire has many modifications, but of all the fires, the most powerful is the one that blazes in the presence of Ahura Mazda, the solar logos, forming his divine halo. That fire is the result of transmutation of the sexual secretions. That fire is the Kundalini, the igneous serpent of our magical powers, the fire of the Holy Spirit. Whoever wants to find the fire of Ahura Mazda must search for it within the interior of his philosophical earth. This earth is the human organism itself. Persian priests cultivated this fire in places of complete darkness, subterranean temples, and secret places. The altar was always an enormous metal chalice with its base upon the philosopher's stone. The fire was always nourished with fragrant and dry wood, especially the delectable branches of sandalwood. The old priests always blew upon the fire with bellows so as not to profane it with the sinful breath of the human mouth. Fill your chalice with the sacred wine of light. Remember, dear reader, that the secret and philosophical living fire blazes within your own philosophical earth. Now you will comprehend the occult mystery of the ritual of fire. Two priests always tended the fire. Here we have the binary. They each used tongs to lay the wood chips, and a spoon to scatter the perfumes on them. There were, then, two tongs and two spoons. In all this, we can see the binary. With this, we can see that only the number two can tend the fire. It is necessary that man and woman, in perfect binary, light and care for Ahura Mazda's divine fire. In the Bundahishan, a kind of ritual gospel, it is stated that a well of sacred water was in a special chamber where the priest performed ablutions in advance of presenting himself before the altar of fire. Only the one who drinks the pure water of life can light the fire. Only the one who washes his feet in the waters of renunciation can light the fire. Only the one who conserves the water can ritualize with the fire. That water symbolizes the end seminus. Archaeological ruins, of complex temples and antechambers where the fire was worshipped, exist everywhere in Persia. These ruins can be found today in Persepolis, Isfahan, Yazd, Palmyra, Susa, etc. Fire is terribly divine. Fire must never be absent from the homes of those who follow the path of perfect matrimony. A candle lit with profound devotion is always equivalent to a prayer, and it attracts a tremendous flow of divine energy from above. Every prayer to the Logos must be accompanied by fire. 
Thus, the prayer is powerful. The time has arrived to return to the cult of fire. Gnostics must journey to the mountains and, there within the profound bosom of Mother Nature, build bonfires, light the fire, and pray and meditate. In this way we can attract powerful currents of divine energy from above that will help us in the great work of the Father. The human being must light his forty-nine fires by means of sexual magic. Thus, when our thoughts are aflame, we can create like the ineffable gods of the cosmos. The holy gods are true ministers of fire. The holy gods are tongues of flaming fire. The whirling dervishes. The sacred dances of the whirling dervishes in Persia, as well as in Turkey, etc., constitute a fire cult. It's a shame that the authorities of Ankara, boasting of much civilization, have prohibited the public dances of the whirling dervishes. The dervishes marvelously imitate movement of the solar system's planets around the sun. The dances of the dervishes are intimately related with the spine and the sexual fires. We must never forget that the serpent enjoys music and dance, as Egyptian and Indian snake charmers have already demonstrated. They play their marvelous flutes, and the enchanted serpents dance. It is now opportune to remember the ritual fire dances from all the ancient temples. Let's remember the naked dances of the Eleusinian mysteries, the sacred dancers of India, Egypt, Mexico, Yucatan, etc. When the Akashic records fall into the hands of scientists, and the whole world can watch the fire dances of archaic times on television, we will return to those dances, which will inevitably replace the profane dances. Egyptian Darkness A few years ago, some monks of bad faith from the Athos Monastery, famous in Greece and Russia, dedicated themselves to selling Egyptian darkness in bottles, making a great deal of money out of it. It is absurd to sell Egyptian darkness as black powder in bottles. The reality of Egyptian darkness cannot be sold as black powder. Egyptian darkness is an archaic, allegorical phrase. When the Egyptians covered themselves with their mantle and closed their eyes to the physical world, they remained in darkness to the world but in splendorous light to the spirit. Nowadays, there are many sages within the Egyptian darkness. Nevertheless, they shine with the sacred fire in Armen Ra. There are many Egyptian sages who were buried alive in a state of catalepsy. They sleep soundly in their tombs until the day and hour they must awaken according to the plans of the White Lodge. There is one whose body has been asleep since 3,000 years before the time of Jesus Christ. Another has been sleeping since 10,000 years before Jesus Christ, and so on. They sleep, their bodies lie in Egyptian darkness, nevertheless, their souls live consciously in the superior worlds, working intensely for humanity. When the right day and hour arrives, each of these adepts will be assisted by their brothers and sisters. They will be taken out of their sepulchral home and awakened. These Egyptian adepts will initiate a new era of spiritual activity. They conserve within their memory all the archaic knowledge. It is interesting to know that the bodies of these adepts, duly bandaged and protected in their funerary caskets, sleep without eating or drinking. All their organic functions are in suspension. Strange and mysterious chemical substances protect them. Formidable, elemental guardians guard their tombs, and no archaeologist will find them. To leave the tomb after thousands of years, to maintain oneself without eating or drinking for so many centuries, is only possible with the fire cult, with the power of the fire. All these adepts practice sexual magic intensely. Only the serpent of fire can give the adept these kinds of tremendous powers. Java. In the Hall of Memories, the Akasha, the history of that angel named Java is written. Saturninus of Antioch, the great Kabbalist, states that Java is a fallen angel, evil genie, the devil. Java is a terribly perverse demon. Java is that demon who tempted Christ in the wilderness and took him to the mountain to say, Itababo, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. Java called the Jewish people, my chosen people. The Jews have intentionally confused Java with the Lord Jehovah. Java was a Lemurian hierophant. Java had a priestess wife. Java was an angel with a human body. Master Java was a warrior of the light, a great priest of the ray of force, and due to his high priestly dignity, he had the legitimate right to use helmet, armor, shield, and sword made of pure gold. The priestess wife of Java was by all means a lady adept. In archaic times, the warrior and priestly castes developed independently of each other. Nevertheless, there were exceptions, as in the case of Java who was both priest and warrior. The Lucifers of the ancient earth moon floated within the Lemurian atmosphere. These Lucifers were searching for proselytes, and they found them. 
Java was one of their proselytes. Java became a disciple of those tenebrous sublunar beings and practiced black sexual magic with spilling of the cup of Hermes. This is the science of the red cap Ban and Drukpa. The result was fatal. His igneous serpent fell. It descended toward the atomic infernos of man, and Java became a terribly perverse demon. This history is described in the Akasha. Java became a member of a Lemurian temple of Black Tantra. His priestess wife never accepted sexual magic with spilling of the cup of Hermes. Java fell with another woman. The efforts Java made to convince his priestess wife were useless. She didn't want to enter the Black Temple. That marriage ended. The Lady Adept did not want to enter the Black Path. Now, this Lady Adept is an ineffable angel of the superior worlds. The fire cult is very delicate. The gods of fire help protect all those who follow the path of perfect matrimony. The Ages of the World Division of humanity's history into gold, silver, copper, and iron ages is a tremendous reality. The planetary fire involutes and evolves, passing through the above-mentioned stages. There is no doubt the fire of our planet Earth has produced very little profit in the three preceding rounds, and on the ancient Earth moon. This fire is full of karma. That is the cause for the failure of humanity on the planet Earth. Cycles unfold alternately. An age of great mystical inspiration and unconscious productivity is followed by another of tremendous criticism and self-consciousness. One provides the material for analysis and criticism of the other. In the field of spiritual conquests, Buddha and Jesus represent the highest conquests of the spirit. Alexander of Macedonia and Napoleon the Great represent conquests in the physical world. These figures were reproductions made by the fire, reproductions of human types that existed 10,000 years before. Images reflected from the previous 10th millennium were reproduced by the mysterious powers of the fire. As above, so below. That which has been will come again. As things are in heaven, so are they on earth. If the fire of our planet earth had totally developed on the ancient earth moon, and in the three preceding rounds, our earth would be a true paradise at this time of our life. Unfortunately, our planetary fire is full of cosmic karma. The great problem. The whole of humanity, the sum total of all human units, is Adam Cadman, the human lineage Homo sapiens, the Sphinx, in other words, the being with the body of an animal and the head of man. The human being participates as a component part in many lives, great and small. The family, community, religion, country are living beings of which we form a part. Within us there are many unknown lives, many eyes that quarrel among themselves, and many eyes that are unknown to each other. All of them live within man, just as man and all mankind live within the great spiritual body of Adam Cadman. These eyes live within man. Just like man and all mankind live in cities, towns, and religious congregations, etc. Just as all inhabitants of a city do not know each other, so too, the eyes that live within the city of nine gates, man, do not know each other. This is the big problem. So-called man does not yet have a true existence. Man is still an unrealized being. Man is similar to a house occupied by many people. Man is like a ship on which many passengers, many eyes, travel. Each eye has its ideals, its projects, desires, etc. The eye that is enthusiastic about the work in the magisterium of the fire is later displaced by another eye that hates the work, and if the aspirant began to work in the forge of Vulcan with much enthusiasm, we later see him disillusioned, leaving the work, and seeking refuge in any little school that offers him consolation. Even later, another eye intervenes to take him out of there, too. That is the biggest problem. Furthermore, there are tenebrous visitors inside man. Just like many people enter a city, including people who are unpleasant, individuals with bad habits, so too is this unfortunate tragedy repeated in the city of Nine Gates, man. Tenebrous inhabitants who suggest evil ideas and stimulate animal desires enter this city. Unfortunately, man is 97% subconscious, and indeed he is unaware of all that happens in his interior. When these tenebrous inhabitants totally control the human brain, Man does things he would not normally do even for all the money in the world. Therefore, it is not strange that even saints have raped and murdered in one of those fatal moments. The magisterium of the fire is extremely difficult due to the quantity of invisible people who inhabit and visit the city of nine gates. Each of these mysterious people, each of these eyes, thinks differently and has its own customs. Now we can understand the many problems in a home. The man who today is enthusiastic about a woman, Tomorrow abandons her. The woman who today is loyal to her husband, 
tomorrow goes off with another man. That is the big problem. In the human psyche, there is a continuous change of perspective from one object to another. Within the mind, there is a continuous film of impressions, events, feelings, desires, etc., and each of these things perfectly defines the eye of a given moment. Many people live in the city of nine gates. That is what is so serious. That is the big problem. The fire cult is very difficult because many people live in the city of nine gates who hate that cult. The physical body is only one section of the tetradimensional body, the lingam surira, or vital body. The human personality is, in turn, another tetradimensional section of the human body. Beyond this is the ego, the pluralized I, like an upper section of the human personality. The personality dies, however, its memory remains in the ego. The poor intellectual animal still knows nothing about the soul and the spirit. It is still very far from the common level of humanity. The body, the personality, and the ego are still unknown to each other because the human being is subconscious. The man of the common level knows even less about the soul and the spirit. In fact, the three inferior aspects of the human being, body, personality, and ego, can only know each other under the influence of narcotics, or in a trance, or in mediumistic or hypnotic states, or during sleep, or through ecstasy. Man is the mystery of the sphinx. The animal with a human head is man. So long as one has not yet resolved the problem of the sphinx, one can fall into the abyss of perdition. Everyone who is working in the magisterium of the fire must beg daily to his father who is in secret for a lot of help. It is urgent to appeal to our inner God to repeat within our inner consciousness the miracle accomplished by Jesus when he expelled the merchants from the temple with the terrible whip of willpower. Only the beloved can expel those intrusive eyes from the temple of our consciousness. Those merchants of the temple sabotage the great work. It's those villains who extinguish the fires of the temple. That is the big problem. Indeed, this is the path of the razor's edge. This path is full of dangers, within and without. For many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 22 verse 14 The Four Gospels The Four Gospels are intimately related with the magisterium of the fire. It is absurd to interpret the Four Gospels literally. The Gospels are completely symbolic. The birth in the manger of Bethlehem symbolizes the Venustic initiation. Christ is always born in the stable of man, among the animals of desire in order to save the world. The star the wise men saw is seen by all mystics during ecstasy. That star is the central sun, the Christ sun, formed by the army of the voice. It is the star that announces the initiation. It is the star that guides the devotees of the fire. Initiation always begins with the miracle of Kana, transmuting the water of life into the wine of light of the alchemists. That miracle is performed in the perfect matrimony. We have to raise the igneous serpent of our magical powers up to the Golgotha of the Father, the brain. In the magisterium of the fire, the true devotee has to live the whole drama of initiation. The four gospels are written in code, and only initiates can understand them. The Hierophant Jesus was not the first who lived the drama of the Passion, nor was he the last. This drama has been lived by all those who have Christified themselves. Whoever investigates the sacred scriptures of all the archaic religions will discover with astonishment that this drama existed many millions of years before Jesus Christ. All the great avatars lived the same drama of the Passion. They occupied the place of Jesus. The great master of perfection lived the whole drama as it is written, but we must not interpret the four Gospels literally. Let's remember that the town of Bethlehem did not even exist in the time of Jesus. The four Gospels constitute a practical guide for the devotees of the fire cult. Those who do not know the Arcanum A Zedef cannot comprehend the four Gospels of fire. The Mother Kundalini Christ is always the son of the Divine Mother Kundalini. She always conceives her son through the work and grace of the Third Logos. She is always virginal, before birth, during birth, and after birth. Among the Egyptians, the Virgin is Isis. Among the Hindu, Kali, in her positive aspect among the Aztecs, Tenantzin. She is Rhea, Sibylle, Maria, Adonia, Insoberta, etc. It would be impossible to incarnate the word without the development, evolution, and progress of Kundalini. This prayer is written in a Gnostic ritual, O Hadit, winged serpent of light, you are the Gnostic secret of my being, the central point of my connection, the sacred sphere and the blue of the sky are mine. O Ao Kakof Na Kongsa, worshippers of the fire, priest and priestess, can use this prayer during the practice of sexual magic. 
The mantras of this prayer have the power to sublimate the sexual energies, the heil of the Gnostics, to the heart. When the initiate invokes the Divine Mother Kundalini, either to help him place his physical body into the jinn state, or for any other miracle of high magic, she appears as a most pure virgin, as a most adorable mother. In her are represented all of our beloved mothers from all our reincarnations. Mother Kundalini is the snake of fire that rises through the medullar canal. We need to be swallowed by the snake. We need to be transformed into the snake itself. Those pseudo-esotericists who suppose the serpent awakens completely and totally developed are very mistaken. The Kundalini needs to develop, evolve, and progress until it reaches its complete development. Sex should help the Kundalini. The Kundalini should help sex. We must not abuse sex or the Kundalini. The seven serpents have their marvelous double in the seven serpents of light. First the fire, then the Brahmanic splendor of the Venustic initiation. We first need to climb the septenary scale of fire, and then the septenary scale of light. We first need to resurrect in the fire, and then in the light. The Divine Mother Kundalini, with the golden child of sexual alchemy in her loving arms, guides us through the formidable path of the razor's edge. Our adorable Isis, whose veil no mortal has lifted, can forgive all of our past karma if we really repent for all of our errors. The serpent of fire totally transforms us. The serpent converts us into tremendously divine gods of the cosmos. Chapter 29 The Edda We can consider the German Edda the Germanic Bible. This archaic book contains the occult knowledge of the Nordics. The accounts about the genesis of the world, described in the Edda, are as follows. In the beginning, there were two unique regions, one of fire and light where the absolute and eternal being, Alphadr, ruled, and the other, a region of darkness and cold called Niflheim, ruled by Surt the Black. Between one region and the other, there was chaos. The sparks that escaped from Alphadr fertilized the cold vapors of Niflheim, and Amir, father of the race of giants, was born. The cow, Adhumla, from whose udder flowed the four rivers of milk, was created in the same way in order to nourish him. Satiated, Amir fell asleep, and from the sweat of his hands a giant couple was born, male and female, and from one of his feet, a monster with six heads. In this genesis of creation, we discover sexual alchemy. The fire fecundated the cold waters of the chaos. The masculine principle, Alphadr, fecundated the feminine principle, Niflheim, dominated by Surt, the darkness, to bring forth life. That is how Emer, father of the giants, inner god of every human being, the master, is born. He is nourished with the raw matter of the great work. This substance is the milk of the cow, Adhumla, the sacred white cow of India. In the Genesis of Moses, the four rivers of Eden are mentioned, the four rivers of milk. These four are the flaming fire, the pure water of life, the impetuous air, and the perfumed elemental earth of the sages, the four tattvas. In every alchemical operation, the four elements come into activity. These cannot be absent from the sexual alchemy of creation. Amir falls asleep, and from his sweat, a giant couple is born, male and female, the gigantic and sublime primeval divine hermaphrodite of the sacred island. In the Genesis of Moses, Adam falls asleep, and God takes Eve from one of his ribs. Before this moment, Eve was inside Adam, and was Adam himself. This was a hermaphrodite. From the feet of this giant hermaphrodite, the polar race, the six-headed monster was born, the star of Solomon, the sexual alchemy of the human being, which through many centuries ends up separating or dividing the giants, transforming them into human beings of separate sexes. The division into opposite sexes is the beginning of the great tragedy. Thus, from the hermaphroditic giant, the six-headed monster is born. The human being will again become a divine hermaphrodite. Man will return to Eden accompanied by his divine Eve. In those moments when man and woman are sexually united, they are a single hermaphroditic being. Indeed, we are gods during those moments of supreme sexual voluptuousness. This is the supreme moment of which the initiate knows how to take advantage in order to execute his magical phenomena. The birth of the human being into separate sexes was a grandiose event of anthropogenesis, which was accomplished through many millions of years. After giving this marvelous description of the creation of the world, the Germanic Edda describes the separation into opposite sexes as follows. Immediately, the gods decided to create the first human pair. The man was formed from an ash tree, and they called him Ask. 
The woman was formed from an alder, and they called her Embla. Odin gave them the soul, Vili gave them understanding, V gave them beauty and the senses. And the gods, satisfied with their work, retired to rest, and to enjoy themselves in their mansion at Asgard, located in the center of the universe. The accounts from the Edda about the destruction of the world is the Germanic apocalypse. Nature itself starts to become disordered. The seasons cease to alternate. The terrible winter, Fimbul winter, dominates and lasts for three years, because the sun has lost its strength. There is no faith among men. Peace between brothers, relatives, and children of the same tribe is not observed. The sacred duty of the Germans to respect the dead, of cutting and burning their nails, is neglected. At the consummation of the centuries, Hrimner, the frost giant, and his innumerable companions have to embark on a colossal ship in order to destroy the gods, and their happy and resplendent abode, Valhalla, and the universe. This terrible, reproachful ship, which is made only of the nails of the dead, never cut by any merciful soul, advances and grows in spite of the smallness of the material, until the corruption reaches its limit. Then the monsters, whom the gods had managed to enchain, break the chains which bind them. The mountains sink, the jungles are uprooted, the wolves, who since the beginning of the world have howled at the sun and moon, trying to devour these two stars, and who have sometimes almost had them within their claws, now reach them and consume them once and for all. The wolf, Fenrir, breaks his bonds and assails the world with open jaws, reaching sky with one jaw and earth with the other, and would open them even wider, but there is no room. The Midgard serpent floods the whole earth, because man has become a fornicator. The frost giants come from the Levant in their ship of nails. At high noon, the powers of the destructive fire draw nearer. Loki, Surt, and the sons of Muspelheim come to fight the final decisive battle of the Asses. The divinities of Valhalla prepare to receive the enemy. Their watchman Heimdall, posted at the entrance to the bridge that leads to their dwelling, sounds the clarion. And the gods, in union with the souls of the heroes who have died in battle, go out to receive the giants. The battle begins and ends with the destruction of both armies, the death of the gods and the giants. The incandescence of those of the fire spreads over the world so all is consumed in an immense purifying holocaust. An in-depth analysis of the Edda's Genesis and Apocalypse reveals to us that the key point of both is the issue of sex. The world is sexually created. The primeval hermaphrodite becomes sexually divided. He is a god when he does not spill the semen. He becomes a demon when he spills the semen. The world is created sexually, and this world is destroyed when human beings become terrible fornicators, when the great whore, humanity, has reached the breaking point of her corruption, that is when the Midgard serpent floods the whole earth. Indeed, when the human being becomes accustomed to spilling the semen, the great whore, whose number is 666, is born. Fornication is what corrupts the human being. With fornication, the human being becomes terribly perverse, and then the world is destroyed. The unknown monsters of nature, elements man does not know, and which the gods had in chains, are unleashed through atomic weapons. Jungles are uprooted, the wolves of karma howl horribly. The wolf, Fenrir, breaks his bonds and attacks the world with open jaws touching sky and earth. Karma is terrible, and there will be a collision of worlds. In archaic times there was a similar collision. The earth was closer to the sun but it was hurled away to its present distance. Now the same cataclysm will be repeated by the law of karma. So, as the Germanic Edda states, all shall be consumed in an immense purifying holocaust. No type of genesis can exist without sexual alchemy. No type of apocalypse can exist without sexual degeneration. Every genesis and every apocalypse is based on the phallus and the womb. The fire creates and the fire destroys. Indeed, the destructive powers of the fire are already underway. Atomic wars will definitively unleash powers that will consume the earth. This race will soon be destroyed by fire. The hour to comprehend the necessity of totally penetrating the path of perfect matrimony has arrived. Only those who resolve to follow this path can save themselves from the abyss and the second death. God shines upon the perfect couple. Human Salvation In the name of truth, we have to recognize that the problem of human salvation is a true Chinese puzzle, very difficult to solve. Jesus emphasizes the tremendous difficulty of entering the kingdom of esotericism and attaining eternal salvation. 
It is urgent to fabricate soul if indeed what we want is to save ourselves. We have already stated the human being only has an embryo of soul incarnated. We have also stated that we need to fortify this embryo and later incarnate cosmic soul. Now it is good to clarify that to incarnate soul basically means to be assimilated, devoured by the tiger of wisdom. We need the tiger of wisdom to devour us. This tiger is the intimate, our real being. The Aztecs state that the first race which existed in the world was devoured by tigers. The temple of the tigers existed in the Yucatan. Quetzalcoatl snatched the human heart with his tiger claws. The tiger cult was never absent from any of the mystery temples of America. The order of the tiger knights was very sacred in Aztec Mexico. It is interesting to remember that during human sacrifice, the hearts of maidens were offered to the gods. All this contains an esoteric meaning which the learned ignoramuses of this century do not understand. Obviously, we do not approve of human sacrifices. Such sacrifices were barbaric. Millions of children and maidens were sacrificed to the gods. These were horrifying scenes of pain. That is abominable. However, we only reflect on the fact of offering the bleeding heart to the gods. That fact is tremendous. The intimate needs to swallow the heart of man, that is to say, to assimilate it, absorb it, devour the human personality who has fabricated that which is called soul. It is tremendously true that the intimate is like a tree with many leaves. Each leaf is a human personality. The intimate does not have one single personality, as pseudo-esotericists believe. The intimate has various personalities, and what is most astonishing is that he can have them incarnated in different parts of the world. When a person does not fabricate soul, it is logical that he is lost, and tumbles into the abyss. However, this is of no importance for the intimate. This is like a leaf that falls from the tree of life, one leaf without any importance. The intimate continues attending to his other personalities, struggling for them to fabricate soul in order to devour them as a tiger of wisdom. Therefore the value of the person, the intellectual animal called man, is less than the ash of a cigarette. However, fools feel themselves to be giants. Unfortunately, Within all the pseudo-esoteric currents, a great number of mythomaniacs exist, individuals who feel themselves to be masters, people who enjoy when others call them masters, individuals who believe themselves to be gods, individuals who presume to be saints. The only one who is truly great is the spirit, the intimate. We, the intellectual animals, are leaves the wind tosses about, leaves of the tree of life, that is all. Man is a hybrid mixture of plant and phantom. A poor shadow that can only achieve immortality if it fabricates that which is called soul. Humanity has failed. Most of humanity, almost all of it, still does not have soul. The great majority of humans are dead leaves, which the hurricane of fatality drags to the abyss. They are leaves that have come off the tree of life. The Germanic Edda states that the wolf, Fenrir, breaks his terrible bonds. Karma falls upon the whole of humanity. The divinities of Valhalla will fight the enemy. The Midgard serpent floods the whole earth, and this world is a failure. Germanic mythology is Nordic. The wisdom comes from the north. The first race was devoured by the tigers of wisdom. That was an immortal race. The second race was swept away by strong hurricanes. The third race was converted into birds, the fourth into menfish, the fifth into goats. The cradle of humanity is in the north. The Germanic Edda is Nordic wisdom. The forefathers of the Aztecs lived on the sacred island of the north. Occult wisdom came from the north to Lemuria, and from Lemuria it passed to Atlantis. After the Atlantean submersion, the wisdom remained on those lands that formed part of the Atlantean continent. India never formed part of the Atlantean continent. It is absurd to think all ancient wisdom comes from India. If we want to find the wisdom of the serpent, we will find it in Mexico, Egypt, the Yucatan, etc. Indeed, these countries formed part of Atlantis. It is urgent to study the Germanic Edda. It is urgent to know how to read between the lines. Then, afterward, one must investigate Easter Island, Mexico, the Yucatan, etc. The Germanic Edda, with its genesis and its apocalypse, is pure sexual magic. The root of our being is found within sex. We need to be devoured by the serpent. We need to be devoured by the tiger. First, the serpent devours us and then the tiger. Chapter 30. The Five-Pointed Star. The pentagram expresses dominion of the spirit over the elements of nature. 
We can command the elemental creatures that inhabit the regions of fire, air, water, and earth with this magical sign. Demons tremble and run away terrified in the presence of this formidable symbol. The pentagram, with its top point upward, serves to make the tenebris flee. The pentagram with its top point downward, serves to call the tenebris. Placed on the threshold with its top point inward, and its two lower angles facing outside, prohibits black magicians from entering. The pentagram is the flaming star. The pentagram is the sign of the word made flesh. According to the direction of its rays, it can represent God or the devil, the immolated lamb, or the male goat of Mendes. When the top ray of the pentagram is aiming up in the air, it represents the Christ. When the two lower points of the pentagram are aiming up in the air, it represents Satan. The pentagram represents the complete man. With its top ray up, it is the master. With its top ray down, and its two lower points up, it is the fallen angel. Every fallen bodhisattva is the inverted flaming star. Every initiate who allows himself to fall, in fact, becomes an inverted flaming star. The best electrum is a flaming star with the seven metals, which correspond to the seven planets. These are the following, silver for the moon, quicksilver for Mercury, copper for Venus, gold for the sun, iron for Mars, tin for Jupiter, and lead for Saturn. You can make medallions to hang around the neck, or rings to wear on the ring finger. You can also draw the flaming star on a very white lambskin to be kept in the bedroom. It can always be used at the threshold of the nuptial chamber. In this way we prevent the tenebris from entering the bedroom. The pentagram can also be drawn on glass, and this terrorizes ghosts and demons. The pentagram is the symbol of the universal word of life. The pentagram can be made to shine instantaneously with certain secret mantras. In the Gopalatarpani and Krishna Upanishads, we have found the mantra that has the power to instantaneously form the formidable flaming star in the astral plane, before which, demons flee in terror. This mantra has five parts, namely, Kleem, Krishnaya, Govindaya, Gopijana, Vallabhaya, Swaha. When vocalizing this mantra, the flaming star that makes the tenebris of Arkanum 18 flee in terror, forms instantly. These demons violently attack the initiate who is working in the great work. The devotees of perfect matrimony have to wage tremendous battles against the tenebris. Each vertebra of the spine represents terrible battles against black magicians. They fight to drive the student from the path of the razor's edge. The powerful mantra mentioned above has three perfectly defined stages. On chanting clean, which the occultists of India call the seed of attraction, we provoke a flow of Christic energy that instantaneously descends from the world of the solar logos to protect us, and then a mysterious door opens down toward us. Then, by means of the three following parts of the mantra, Christic energy is infused into the one who chants them. And finally, by means of the fifth part, the one who has received the Christic energy can radiate it with tremendous force to defend himself from the tenebris. They then flee in terror. The word always crystallizes in geometric lines. This is demonstrated by magnetic tape. Speech is recorded on the cassette. Each letter crystallizes into geometrical figures. Then you just have to make the tape vibrate in the tape recorder to broadcast the speech. God geometrizes. The word takes geometric forms. The mantras cited by us have the power to instantaneously form the flaming star in the supersensible worlds. Said star is a vehicle of Christic force. Said star represents the word. All those who are working in the flaming forge of Vulcan can defend themselves with this powerful mantra. Said mantra is vocalized syllable by syllable. With this mantra, one can conjure demons that control the possessed. It is urgent to learn how to instantaneously create the flaming star. With this mantra, we can create that star in order to combat the tenebris. The word. The learned ignoramuses who are so numerous in this century can laugh like idiots at what they do not know. Those people suppose our mantras are words without any value, and that their energy is lost in space. They ignore the internal value of words. The principal substance of the word is unknown to them, and that is why they laugh at our mantras. In every word, there is an external and an internal value. The principal substance of the word is precisely its internal value. The internal element of the word is not found in our three-dimensional space. The internal element of the word must be sought in superior space, with dimensions superior to ours. Our space appears before us only as a part of the superior space. That is how we reach the conclusion that we do not know all of space. 
The only thing we know is that small part which can be measured in terms of longitude, latitude, and height. The internal element of the word is formed geometrically within the superior dimensions of space. This is how, with the mantras given in this chapter, we can certainly form a pentagonal star, invisible to the physical eyes but perfectly visible to the sixth sense. Scientists know nothing about the fourth dimension of matter and space. They know nothing about the hypergeometry of that type of fourth-dimensional space. Defining space as the form of matter in the universe has the most serious shortcoming, which is to introduce the concept of matter, that is to say, the unknown, because matter really continues to be the unknown. All attempts to attain a physical definition of matter only lead to a dead end, x equals y, y equals x. This is the physicist's dead end. The psychological definitions of matter also lead to the same dead end. A sage said matter, like force, gives us no difficulty. We understand all about it for the very simple reason that we invented it. When we speak of matter we think of sensible objects. What is difficult for us to deal with is the mental exchange of concrete but complex facts. Strictly speaking, matter exists only as a concept. To tell the truth, the character of matter, even when treated just as a concept, is so obscure that most people are unable to tell us exactly what they mean by it. No one really knows what matter is. Nonetheless, the conservative and reactionary school of materialistic positivism is founded on that concept. Even if physicists don't like it, we have to affirm that matter and energy are officially accepted words to designate a long series of complicated facts whose substantial origin are unknown to science. Who has seen matter? Who has seen energy? We only see phenomena. No one has seen matter independent of substance. No one has seen energy separate from movement. Therefore, this demonstrates that matter and energy are only abstract concepts. No one sees matter separated from object. No one sees energy separated from movement. Matter and energy separated from things and phenomena are a mystery for the human being. The human being is 97% subconscious and 3% conscious. The human being dreams about the phenomena of nature and calls them matter, energy, etc. Before the universe existed, before all phenomena existed, there was the word. Indeed, the logos is resounding. At the dawn of life, the army of the voice celebrated the rituals of fire by singing in the sacred language. The great word crystallized into geometrical figures that were condensed by means of the raw matter of the great work, giving origin to all the phenomena of nature. The world and the consciousness are indeed the result of the word. Tridimensional space is a property of our material perception. When we improve the quality of representation, the quality of perception also improves, and we enter the superior dimensions of space where the tridimensional world no longer exists and remains in our memory only as a dream. Indeed, the world presented to our consciousness is only the mechanical aspect of all those combined causes that give origin to a definite series of sensations. The principal cause of all existence is found beyond the world and the consciousness. This principle is the Word. It is the Word that creates worlds. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John 1 verses 1 to 5. The word is fully symbolized by the five-pointed star. This is the flaming star. With it, we can defend ourselves against the tenebrous. Columns of angels and demons tremble before this marvelous star. Chapter 31. The Eskimos of the North. Some traditions state that the Eskimos of Greenland and Alaska have their origin in distant Thule. It is stated that the Eskimos are mixed with invaders from Polynesia, Tunguska, and Dean, the great Gnostic Rosicrucian master, Arnold Crumheller, speaks sublimely about distant Thule, the sacred island. Don Mario Rosso de Luna states that this island still exists. However, it is found in the Jinn state. We know that the first human race existed on this island. The polar race unfolded within a totally different environment from the present one. In that age, which dates back in time more than 300 million years, the earth was really semi-etheric semi-physical. It appeared like a curved blue ocean, like the firmament at night. In those times, human beings could float within the atmosphere. The human bodies were androgynous and ethereal. 
These bodies were elastic and subtle. They could either retain their gigantic form, of 10 or 20 meters in height, or reduce their size at will, and assume a pygmean height, or they could take the size of the present human body. We cannot say those people were hermaphrodites. This race was androgynous. The sexual energy operated differently, and they reproduced through the fissiparous sexual act. In a determined moment, the original organism divided into exact halves. This is similar to multiplying by cellular division. Each time this occurred, there was prayer and profound veneration of the divine. Although it may seem incredible, the first human race reached a very high degree of civilization. Houses, palaces, cities, and grandiose temples were built with the flexible and ethereal matter of this primeval earth. Naturally, the swine of materialism from this day and age will laugh at our assertions because they have never found the remains of such a civilization. It is impossible to find the remains of such an ancient civilization because the earth was ethereal in that age, meaning it was made of promatter. Only in the memories of nature can the great clairvoyance find all of the living history of the first race. This is the protoplasmic race. This is the human race's legitimate protoplasm. The great clairvoyance may well laugh at the protoplasm of the Darwins and Heckles. The fossil remains of human beings found in Earth's caves have nothing to do with the protoplasmic race. Those remains are of degenerate tribes descended from submerged Atlantis. Religion, science, and philosophy were totally united in the culture of the polar race. The inhabitants of distant Thule were bodhisattvas of masters from other Mahamanvantaras. Adam and Eve were a single being. In this day and age, Adam and Eve are separated and they suffer. Thus, they search for each other with an insatiable thirst to unite. Only during the sexual act are man and woman a single being. In those moments of sexual voluptuousness, both man and woman have the immense joy of being a single being. The cosmic rituals of that age are very interesting. The trained clairvoyant can discover pure occult masonry within their temples. Nevertheless, those rituals differed so greatly from the rituals that currently exist in the world that it would be impossible for a modern mason to concede that those rituals were Masonic. The lights of the temple were not fixed. As soon as a venerable master occupied the throne, he would just as quickly abandon it. Sometimes the first warden would occupy a throne, then suddenly he would leave it in order to change to the second warden's throne. The high dignitaries levitated in order to switch thrones amongst themselves. The colors black and white, were combined on their vestments to represent the struggle between spirit and matter. The construction of the temple was perfect. The symbols and work tools used were inverted to represent the drama projected through the centuries, that is, the descent of spirit into matter. Thus, we can contemplate with amazement the inverted scepters, chalice, etc. Everything inverted. At that time, life was descending toward matter. Therefore, it was then necessary to give this a symbolic expression. Their sacred processions were grandiose. With them, the great mysteries and supreme descent of spirit into matter were understood. This was a great event that was awaited over the course of the centuries. It was awaited with as much yearning as the return of man to the superior worlds is awaited today. The language of the protoplasmic race was the golden language, a universal and cosmic language, which produced all kinds of cosmic phenomena by the combination of sounds. Those who follow the path of perfect matrimony come to rediscover that primeval language within themselves. When the sacred fire reaches the level of the throat, we begin to speak in the most pure orthoepy of the divine language, which is like a golden river that flows delightfully beneath the forest, awaiting the sun. By chanting in this language, the fathers of the gods taught them the cosmic laws of nature. Runes were the script of the first race. The mallet of masonry comes from the arrow of the Egyptian god Ra, and this is a rune. In that epoch, the rituals of the polar temple were all runic. The movements of the officials were runic. This is the divine script. Let's remember that the swastika is a rune. The Hebrew letters are nothing other than modifications of runic letters. The cradle of occult wisdom was not Asia, as many believe. The true cradle of occult wisdom was the sacred island of distant Thule, about which Hrirakocha said so many beautiful things. In that age of the protoplasmic race, the sacred island was not in the north. Indeed, that island was a continent with its exact position on the equatorial line. Much later, with the revolution of the Earth's axis, that island was left in the north. The revolution of the Earth's axis has already been demonstrated by contemporary science. 
Presently, the poles are gradually diverging toward the equator. Present-day Eskimos, though mixed with other races, are not descendants of the first race. Rather, they are degenerated Atlanteans. Nevertheless, they preserve some very interesting traditions. These people have a family bond that binds them together. Each patriarch uses a special amulet consisting of a sign, mark, totem, or the name of a species of sacred animal, which he passes on to his descendants. Many thinkers may feel inclined to believe this race could have its origin in the primeval Nordics of the First Age because of the fact that they live near the North Pole. It is interesting to know that among the ancient Eskimos there was no special authority, chieftain, or king. They were ruled by a council of elders. The young males married women from other clans in perfect matrimony. However, the amulet served as a distinguishing sign in order to avoid marriages among relatives. In other times, polyandry existed. They killed every female child that was born before a male child. Fortunately, they have now abandoned that barbaric custom. In his book entitled The History of Human Marriage, E.A. Westermark states that Eskimos lend their wife to another man, or exchange her. Indeed, this is an adulterous custom, a horrible custom incompatible with the doctrine preached by our adorable Savior Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, every rule has its exception and we cannot believe that all Eskimos have this same barbaric custom. There is a bit of everything within the vineyard of the Lord. It is a custom for Eskimos to wrap their dead in skins and bury them beneath a mound surrounded by a fence. In the Aleutian Islands, they were bound with ropes and buried within the crevices of cliffs. Eskimos know the law of eternal return. They know the ego returns to a new womb. The fetishes or little dolls of the Eskimos symbolize the essence. They believe the essence is very little and diminutive. However, their priests do not ignore that with it the soul is fabricated. Pregnancy, the birth of children, puberty, and death are celebrated with special esoteric practices. Eskimos worship the feminine principle of God. They love their sublime elder Sedna, who lives in the depths of the ocean, and they send marine animals for her nourishment. Naturally, the learned ignoramuses who do not know anything about occult science laugh at the divine Eskimo religion. The best canticles and rituals of the Eskimos are for the Divine Mother. The symbolic journeys of the shaman, priest, in search of the ancient Sedna, in order to console her when she becomes upset, and the processions the community performs in order to reconcile her, remind us of the symbolic journeys of the Masonic candidate around the lodge. The journeys are the external symbols of the elevation of the candidate's consciousness through the superior worlds. Occult Masonry's five symbolic journeys are intimately related with the five initiations of major mysteries. When the profane ignoramuses see these journeys of the Eskimos, they do nothing but laugh and laugh at what they do not know. They laugh like idiots. They laugh at what they do not know. Eskimos know with perfect exactitude like a true initiate who has awakened his sixth sense also knows that genies, elves, gnomes, giants, salamanders of fire, undines, etc., exist. Fortunately, after having accepted hypnotism and baptizing it with the new name of hypnology, official science has to accept clairvoyance as a logical consequence. Only in this way is it possible for us to explain how a subject in a hypnotic state can see through a wall or report on what is happening thousands of kilometers away. What science rejects today, it accepts tomorrow. Today, those who laugh at Paracelsus and the Eskimos because of the elementals, gnomes, pygmies, salamanders, genies, undines, sylphs, etc., will have to laugh at themselves and blush in shame when these creatures are rediscovered by science. Who would have believed only five years ago in the glass snake? Now, in 1961, a famous scientist, one of those who previously described himself as incredulous, has just discovered the famous glass snake. This snake has the power to drop its tail at will in cases of danger, being able to easily regenerate it afterward. When the glass snake finds itself in danger, attacked by some animal, it coils up, becomes rigid, and throws itself upon the animal. It then instantly abandons its tail, and its head escapes in a flash. The animal is distracted by the snake's tail while the snake's head saves itself. Later, a new tail grows from the head. Thus, this is how everything is. Nature has many marvels. Therefore, it is necessary to learn how to respect all religions because they are but forms of a single universal religion. Tremendous truths and cosmic sciences are contained within every religion. 
These are unknowable for the learned ignoramuses of this barbaric age. All those who want to attain in death realization must work in their laboratory with sulfur, fire, azoth, air, man, water, and the bull, earth. These four elements form a cross. The alchemist who follows the path of perfect matrimony must transmute lead into gold within the profound caverns of the great mountain range, the spine. In this great mountain range live gnomes, guardians of all the treasures of the earth, great alchemists who transmute lead into gold. Gnomes work with the salamanders of fire, with sylphs of the air, and the voluptuous undines of the pure waters of life. The ardent salamanders fertilize the restless undines, and the happy and playful sylphs animate the fire of the laboratory's furnace, the chakra called the Church of Ephesus, so the water, semen, can evaporate from its container, the sex. The seminal vapors rise through the chimney to the distillery, the brain. There, the gnomes perform the great distillation, perfectly transmuting the remaining lead into gold. It is necessary to transmute the lead of the personality into the gold of the spirit. Only in this way can we again utter the most pure orthoepy of the divine language. Our motto is Thelema, willpower. We need to pass through the five great initiations of fire, symbolized by the three degrees of occult masonry. We need to return, to go back to the divine wisdom of distant Thule. Much has been said about this distant Thule, land of the gods. The forefathers of the Eskimos and Aztecs dwell there. Quetzalcoatl lives there. He came from Thule, and he returned to Thule. The Emperor Montezuma sent a group of ambassador magicians to that mysterious Thule. They went in the Jinn state, that is to say, they traveled within the fourth dimension. Distant Thule is the sacred land, the sacred island, the first continent that existed, and the last that shall cease to exist. That continent is found in the polar ice cap of the north, within the fourth dimension. The Aztec magicians sent by Montezuma arrived there in the Jinn state, carrying presents for the forefathers of the Aztecs. On their return, they brought a message from Montezuma and the Aztecs, which we could synthesize as follows, If you do not stop your passions, cruelties, and vices, you will be punished. White men will come from the sea, and will conquer and destroy you. All this was fulfilled with the arrival of the Spaniards in Mexico. All this about the fourth dimension, and about a sacred land within the fourth dimension at the North Pole, might make the learned ignoramuses laugh. Indeed, they have not studied all the dimensions of space. It is unfortunate that mathematics cannot define the dimensions of space. Every mathematical expression always corresponds to a realization of realities. This is how one thinks with formal logic. Fortunately, though, a dialectic logic exists that would permit us to use mathematics to define the six fundamental dimensions of the universe. Generally, the dimensions are represented by powers. The first, second, third, fourth, etc. This was precisely the base Hinton used to construct his famous tesseract theory, or tetradimensional solids. A4, a raised to the fourth power. This is the representation of dimensions in the form of powers. Many authors consider that mathematics have nothing to do with dimensions because there is no difference between the dimensions. This concept seems false to us. We believe the difference between dimensions is obvious, and that the entire universe is made up, according to the law of numbers, measurement, and weight. What happens is that, while the mind is bottled up in formal logic, we will limit the use of mathematics to the three-dimensional world. We urgently need dialectic logic to be able to consider the representation of dimensions by powers as something logical. This is only dialectically possible with dialectic logic. Metageometry studies superior space. Metageometry is destined to totally replace Euclidean geometry. Indeed, Euclidean geometry only serves to investigate the properties of a particular physical space. However, if we want to abandon the study of the fourth vertical, it is obvious that physics will be held back in its progress. The vital secret of all mechanics is found in the fourth coordinate. Metageometry has the merit of considering the three-dimensional world as a section of a superior space. A point from tridimensional space is only a section or slice of a metageometrical line. With formal logic, it is impossible to consider metageometric lines as distances between points in our space, and it is impossible to represent them by forming figures in our space. However, with dialectic logic, you have distances between points in space, and we can represent them with figures and qualities. It is not absurd to say the continent of the North Pole belongs to the fourth dimension. Neither would it be absurd, in light of dialectic logic, 
to affirm that this continent is inhabited by people who have physical bodies. We can even design a map of this continent, and it would be accepted by dialectic logic. Formal logic, on the other hand, in addition to considering our affirmations absurd, would lead us into error. Indeed, the tridimensionality of the world exists in our psyche, in our receptive apparatus. It is also there where we can all find the marvels of the superdimensional, if we develop clairvoyance, clairaudience, etc. That is to say, if we perfect our psychic apparatus. Only through the development of our powers of inner perception can we study the superior dimensions of nature. Materialistic positivism has built a wall of China around free investigation. Now, the learned ignoramuses condemn all which is against that wall as anti-scientific. Materialistic positivism is conservative and reactionary. We Gnostics are revolutionaries, and we totally reject reactionary and conservative ideas. Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher, considers space to be a property of the receptivity of the world through our consciousness. We carry within ourselves the conditions of our space, and therefore, within ourselves we will find the conditions that allow us to establish correlations between our space and superior space. When the microscope was invented, the world of the infinitely small was opened up to us. In the same way, with the awakening of the sixth sense, the world of the fourth dimension will be opened to us. Those who have developed the sixth sense can study the Akashic records of nature and discover for themselves the reality of the northern polar continent. The first race that existed in the world was of a dark color. This was the protoplasmic race, the androgynous race who reproduced themselves through the fissiparous sexual act, similar to reproduction by cellular division. The first race lived within the fourth dimension of space. The planet Earth itself was then submerged within the fourth dimension. That race had a gigantic civilization. The golden language was spoken, and they wrote with runic letters. These letters are of great esoteric power. In that epoch, the angel Uriel wrote a precious cosmic book with runic letters. We can only study this book in the Akashic Records. The kind of perception and representation that the people of the first race had was not as subjective as the perception and representation this present humanity has. These polar people had clear and perfect, objective representations and perceptions. They could see bodies completely and exactly. The people of this day and age can only see sides, angles, faces, surfaces, etc. Presently, nobody sees complete bodies. People of this day and age are degenerated. Therefore, they only have incomplete, subjective perceptions and representations that are completely degenerated and subjective. We need to return to the point of departure and regenerate our psychic apparatus through sexual magic and internal meditation in order to reconquer the objective representations and perceptions. It is urgent to eliminate all those subjective elements from our representations and perceptions. This is possible by improving the quality of the representations with the technique of meditation and by regenerating the psychic apparatus with sexual magic. The cradle of occult wisdom is in the north and not in the east as some orientalists suppose. Eskimos conserve many religious traditions that are worth investigating seriously. Archimedes stated, Give me a fulcrum and I will move the world. Archimedes searched for a lever in order to move the universe. This lever exists. Eliphaz Levi states that this lever is the astral light. We prefer to speak more clearly and declare that the lever of Archimedes is the Kundalini. Whoever develops the Kundalini can place his body of flesh and bone into the fourth dimension to transport himself to distant Thule, land of the gods. Whoever knows how to pray and beseech the mother Kundalini can sincerely beg her to put him within the fourth dimension and transport him to the sacred island. The Kundalini is the lever of Archimedes, the lever with which we can place ourselves within the fourth dimension to travel with our physical bodies. The invention of the lever immediately differentiated primitive man from the animal and was in fact linked with the actual appearance of concepts. If we psychically comprehend the action of the lever in depth, we then discover with amazement that it consists of the construction of a correct syllogism. Whoever does not know how to correctly construct a syllogism cannot totally comprehend the action of a lever. The syllogism in the psychic sphere is literally the same thing as the lever in the physical sphere. Truly, we can affirm that the beings who live on earth are divided into two groups, those who know the action of the lever and those who do not know this action.
Man needs the lever of Archimedes, the superastral serpent, in order to place himself within the fourth dimension and transport himself with his body to the land of the gods. The path that leads us to a superior order of things in the superior dimensions of space is found when mathematics has renounced the fundamental axioms of identity and difference. The great writer Pio stated, in the world of infinite and fluent magnitudes, a magnitude may be not equal to itself. A part may be equal to the whole, and of two equal magnitudes, one may be infinitely greater than the other. Truly, the former statement can seem a complete absurdity when we study this matter in the light of mathematics of constant and finite numbers. Nevertheless, it is certain, very certain, and utterly true that the mathematics of constant and finite numbers is in itself the calculus of the relations that exist between non-existent magnitudes, that is, the calculus of the absurd. Therefore, we can completely affirm that what appears as absurd from the point of view of this mathematics may indeed be true, even though people do not believe it. On one occasion, a famous penologist stated, to discover truth we have to renounce logic. In part, this lawyer spoke the truth, but partially he did not. Indeed, we have to renounce formal logic but not logic, because logic is the art of correct thinking. If we stop thinking correctly, clearly, we fall into the absurd. In his critique of pure reasoning, Immanuel Kant showed us the path of transcendental logic. Prior to Bacon and the famous Aristotle, in the archaic scriptures of the sacred land of the Vedas, formulae for a superior logic were already given. These formulae were written in very ancient books. This logic is dialectic logic. This is intuitive logic, the logic of ecstasy, the logic of the infinite. This logic existed long before deductive or inductive logic were formulated. When man dominates this marvelous key of the mind, called dialectic logic, he can then open the mysterious door of the world of natural causes without risk of falling into error. The axioms of dialectic logic can only be formulated during ecstasy. If we truly want to deeply comprehend the multidimensional world and visit the sacred land of the gods, situated in the northern polar cap, we urgently need to cast everything out of the temple of our mind, cast out all the intellectual idols that have become axioms. We need to unbottle the mind, liberate it from formal logic, which is only good for Moliere and his caricatures. The jinn lands, the marvels hidden within the thousand and one nights, the golden countries inhabited by the ineffable gods of dawn, become a tremendous reality when we find the lever of Archimedes. We jump into the fourth dimension supported by this mysterious lever. The hour to liberate the mind and awaken the Kundalini has arrived. The time has come for the human being to learn how to pass into the fourth dimension at will, every time he wishes to do so. If someone who has awakened the Kundalini supplicates to her in the moments of falling asleep, asking to be placed into the fourth dimension, and to be transported toward the sacred island of the North Pole, you can be sure, dear reader, that the miracle will inevitably occur. The only thing the initiate needs is to know how to get up from bed while preserving sleep. The snake will help him with everything when he also knows how to help himself. Help yourself, and I will help you. Chapter 32 The Divine Trinity The sacred scriptures of India affirm that the navel, heart, and throat are igneous centers of the human organism. They also add that, by meditating on these centers, we encounter the presence of the masters, Sarasvati, Lakshmi, and Parvati, or Gauri, in successive hierarchical order. These three masters work with the three profundities of our resplendent dragon of wisdom. These three masters direct the forces that come from the three aspects of the solar logos. Sarasvati works with the forces of the Father. Lakshmi works with the forces of the Son, and Parvati with the forces of the Holy Spirit. Sarasvati exercises power over the human mind. Lakshmi exercises power over the astral body. Parvati exerts power over the physical body. The apprentice has to perfect his physical body by accustoming it to the practice of sexual magic with his priestess wife. This work is very arduous and difficult. The companion needs to perfect his astral body until it becomes a useful instrument. The master needs to perfect his mental body with the power of fire that blazes in universal orchestration. The apprentice must invoke the master Parvati to help him control the sexual organs during the practice of sexual magic. The companion must invoke Lakshmi to teach him how to travel in the astral body. It is urgent to learn how to consciously and positively travel with the astral body. 
The master must invoke Sarasvati so that he may help him to Christify the mind. These invocations are made during sexual magic. It is necessary to invoke the forces of the Holy Spirit during sexual magic. It is urgent to call the forces of the Christ so they give rise to the birth of the Christ astral in the depths of our internal universe. It is indispensable to ask for assistance from the forces of the Father for our mind. We need to engender the Christ mind. The physical, astral, and mental vehicles must become fine instruments of the Spirit. It is indispensable to learn how to live in the astral body consciously. Let's remember that the mind is found within the astral. It is urgent to consciously visit the temples of the White Lodge. We can study at the feet of the Master in the astral world. We are going to teach the mantras for astral projection as taught by a sage in one of his books. These mantras are in the Sanskrit language. The yogis from India chant them in order to travel in the astral. They are as follows. Mantras for Astral Projection Hare Ram Hare Ram Ram Hare 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 Christ Hare Christ 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 Hare 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 Mura Mordup Koeptis Hare Kopal Govin Mukam Sanre Marge Prage Yodi Kalpi Basi Parvat Tulo Hero No Dane and by Danem. Shri Govind. Shri Govind. Shri Govind. Shri Govind. Ganesha Namap. The devotee must fall asleep with his head to the north or east. It is necessary for the devotee to first learn by heart these mantras from India. The devotee must lie down dorsal decubitus, face up. He begs, calls, and invokes with all his soul, the Master Lakshmi, to take him out in the astral body, consciously and positively. It is necessary to call Lakshmi in the name of Christ. Invocation. In the name of the Christ, by the glory of the Christ, by the power of the Christ, I call you, Lakshmi, 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 Amen. This invocation is repeated thousands of times, supplicating the Master Lakshmi to take you out of the physical body consciously, and to teach you to travel consciously in the astral body. After making this invocation, Recite the Sanskrit mantras thousands of times with your mind concentrated on the Christ. Calmly fall asleep while making the invocation. When you wake up, practice a retrospective exercise to remember where you were, where you walked, with whom you were speaking, etc. It is necessary to ask Lakshmi to teach you to go into the astral consciously. It's necessary to have patience as great as that of Saint Job in order to learn to travel consciously in the astral body. Let us remember that the degree of apprentice is seven years long, and that only after seven years do the first flashes of illumination begin. We give this caution so the student knows what to expect. It's best for the curious, the profane, and the profaners of the temple to withdraw. This science is not for the curious. As the devotee practices sexual magic with his priestess wife, as his conduct becomes more and more upright, as he becomes sanctified, the splendors and powers of the intimate, the spirit, begin to reflect in his astral and in his mental. Then comes illumination. This is the path. However, such illumination is only after the degree of apprentice. We are speaking in the terminology of occult masonry. Every true candidate prepared for illumination can be recognized and verified with the square and the compass. The devotee is prepared for illumination when the spirit and the human personality act in an orderly manner and in full harmony. Those who complain of not being illuminated cannot withstand the ordeal of the square and the compass. When the inferior quaternary loyally obeys the spirit, the result is illumination. As long as the inferior quaternary does not obey the spirit, that is to say, while the human personality does not know how to obey the spirit, illumination is impossible. The devotee must purify his bedroom daily with the smoke of special aromatic substances. Incense purifies the astral body. A good incense attracts the great masters whom we need for our work. We can mix incense with gum benzoin. Benzoin purifies the astral and dispels gross and sensual thoughts. Benzoin can be mixed with incense in a perfume sensor, or all can be burned within a brazier. This is the most practical way. The essence of roses can also be mixed with these perfumes to purify the environment. It is good to remember that roses have great power. The rose is the queen of flowers. It is necessary for the rose of the spirit to open its fragrant 
and delicious bud upon the cross of our body. We also recommend olibanum, frankincense, to create a devotional atmosphere in the nuptial chamber. Husband and wife should live in the midst of perfume and love. Incense and perfume burn delightfully in all Hindu, Parsi, Jain, Shinto, etc., temples. Incense and perfumes were never absent from the temples of Greece, Rome, Persia, etc. The devotee needs much purification and sanctification in order to reach illumination. Special Indication Jesus, the great Hierophant said, Help yourself and I will help you. Therefore, the Gnostic student must take into account these words of the Master. The mantras for travel in the astral body as we have taught in this chapter are marvelous. The invocation to the Master Lakshmi is magnificent, marvelous, but the Gnostic student must help himself. He must concentrate on the navel, he must fall asleep chanting the mantras mentally, and when he finds himself drowsy, when he feels that characteristic lassitude of sleep, imagine himself to be a breeze, a gas, something subtle, feel himself to be completely aerial and gaseous, and in that state, feeling like that, ethereal and subtle, forget the heaviness of the physical body, think that he can fly anywhere, because he no longer has weight of any kind. Forgetting the physical body, feeling like a cloud, aroma, breeze, divine breath, jump out of bed. Don't try to jump mentally, it's urgent for all of this to be translated into action, into concrete acts. Once outside the physical body, leave your house and direct yourself in your astral body to the Gnostic Church, or to whichever place you want. One can travel to other planets with the astral body. With the astral body, one can visit the most distant places of the cosmos, the temples of mysteries, etc. The devotee will be able to study the Akashic records of nature with the astral body and know all past, present, and future events. There is an Eastern prophecy that states, by the end of the 20th century, scientists will have special radio television devices to study the Akashic records of nature. Then all of humanity will be able to see the whole history of the earth and its races on a screen. The whole living history of great men like Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Hermes, Quetzalcoatl. Present technology struggles to perfect the radio in order to receive the discourses of Christ, Cicero, Orpheus, etc. Those waves exist because nothing stops vibrating in nature, and it is only a matter of perfecting the radio and the radio television. Likewise, the day in which certain special lenses will be invented to see the astral body and the astral plane is not too far off. The Great White Lodge is initiating these types of scientific inventions and discoveries. Chapter 33 The Christ The adorable god Christos, Christ, comes from archaic cults of the fire god. The letters P, Pyre, and X, Cross, signify the hieroglyph that generates the sacred fire. Christ was worshipped in the mysteries of Mithra, Apollo, Aphrodite, Jupiter, Janus, Vesta, Bacchus, Astarte, Demeter, Quetzalcoatl, etc. Never in any religion has there been a lack of the Christ principle. All religions are one. Religion is as inherent to life as moisture is to water. The great cosmic universal religion is modified into thousands of religious forms. Priests from all religious forms are completely identifiable with one another through the fundamental principles of the great cosmic universal religion. There is no basic difference between the Mohammedan priest and the Jewish priest, or between the pagan priest and the legitimate Christian one. Religion is one, singular, and absolutely universal. The ceremonies of the Shinto priest of Japan, or of the Mongolian lamas, are similar to those ceremonies of the shamans and sorcerers from Africa and Oceania. When a religious form degenerates, it disappears, and in its place, universal life creates new religious forms. Authentic primeval Gnostic Christianity comes from paganism. Prior to paganism, the cosmic Christ was worshipped in all cults. In Egypt, Christ was Osiris, and whoever incarnated him was an Osirified one. In all ages, there have been masters who have assimilated the infinite universal Christic principle. In Egypt, Hermes was the Christ. In Mexico, the Christ was Quetzalcoatl. In sacred India, Krishna is Christ. In the Holy Land, the great Gnostic Jesus, who was educated in the land of Egypt, was the one who had the joy of assimilating the universal Christ principle, and so was worthy of being rebaptized with the Sadi of the fire and the cross, Christ. The Nazarene, Jesus, Jesus, Zeus, is the modern man who totally incarnates the universal Christic principle. Before him, many masters incarnated that Christic principle of fire. 
The Rabbi of Galilee is a god because he totally incarnated the cosmic Christ. Hermes, Quetzalcoatl, Krishna are gods because they also incarnated the cosmic Christ. It is necessary to adore gods. They help their devotees. Ask, and it shall be given you. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7 verse 7. Sexual magic is the art of producing fire. Only with perfect matrimony can we produce fire, develop it, and incarnate the Christ. This is how we become gods. The Christ principle is always the same. The masters who incarnated are living Buddhas. Among them, there are always hierarchies. The Buddha Jesus is the most exalted initiate of the universal white fraternity. When a religious form has fulfilled its mission, it disintegrates. Jesus the Christ was, in fact, the initiator of a new era. Jesus was a religious necessity of that epoch. At the end of the Roman Empire, the pagan priestly caste had fallen into the most complete disrepute. The multitudes no longer respected the priests, and artists satirized the divine rituals and comedies, sarcastically nicknaming the divinities of Olympus and the Avernus. It is painful to see how these people depicted the god Bacchus as a drunken woman, and at other times, caricatured him as a pot-bellied drunkard mounted on a donkey. They represented the ineffable and blessed goddess, Venus, as an adulterous woman who went in search of orgiastic pleasures, followed by nymphs who were chased by satyrs led by Pan and Bacchus. During that epoch of religious decadence, the people of Greece and Rome no longer respected even Mars, the god of war. They sarcastically represented him trapped by Vulcan's invisible net in the moment of committing adultery with his wife, the beautiful Venus. The way they ridiculed the offended, the sarcasm, the irony, etc., clearly showed the decadence of paganism. Not even Jupiter Olympus, father of the gods, escaped profanation for he was sarcastically depicted in many satires, busily seducing goddesses, nymphs, and mortals. Priapus became the terror of husbands, and Olympus, ancient abode of the gods, became an unbridled bacchanal. The terrible Avernus, Inferno, ruled by Pluto, source of terror for innumerable centuries, no longer frightened anybody, and was then made into comedy with intrigues of all kinds, sarcasm and ridicule that made everybody laugh. The anathemas and excommunications of the priests, pontiffs, bishops, etc., were of no use then, the people no longer respected them. The religious form had fulfilled its mission, and its death was inevitable. Most of the priests then degenerated and prostituted themselves in the already degenerated temples of Vesta, Venus Aphrodite, and Apollo. It was around this time that many pagan priests became vagrants, comedians, puppeteers, beggars. Common people mocked them and ran them off with stones. This is how the religious form of Roman paganism ended. That form had completed its mission, and at that point all that remained was for it to die. The world needed something new. The universal religion needed to manifest in a new form. Jesus was the initiator of that new era. Indeed, Jesus the Christ was the divine hero of the new age. The Nicene Council, held in the year 325 AD, did not create a new hero, as materialistic swine suppose. In the Nicene Council, a doctrine and a man were officially recognized. The doctrine was primeval Christianity, today disfigured by the Roman Catholic sect. The man was Jesus. Many men had declared themselves avatars of the New Age, but none of them, except Jesus, had taught the doctrine of the New Age. The facts speak for themselves, and Jesus spoke with facts, that is why he was recognized as the initiator of the New Age. The doctrine of Jesus is Christic esotericism, the solar religion of all ages and centuries. The Gnosticism taught by Jesus is the religion of the sun, the primeval Christianity of the gods of the dawn. Indeed, the Nicene Council gave legal status to a new religious form that had long endured terrifying persecution and martyrdom. It is enough to remember the circus of lions in the times of Nero, when Christians were thrown into the arena to be devoured by those wild animals. Let's remember the times of the catacombs and the suffering of all those Gnostics. It was only fair that the Nicene Council, a solar doctrine and a man who had incarnated the cosmic Christ, were definitively recognized in a totally official manner. We clarify that the holy gods of the Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Iberian, Scandinavian, Gaelic, Germanic, Assyrian, Aramaic, Babylonian, Persian, etc., religions have not died. Those gods fulfilled their mission and thereafter withdrew. That's all. In a future Mahamavantara, those ineffable gods and their divine religions will return in their time and hour for a new manifestation. 
When a religious form disappears, it commends its universal ecumenical principles to the religious form that follows it. This is the law of life. Jesus has the divine attributes of Krishna, Buddha, Zeus, Jupiter, Apollo. All of them were born of a virgin. Indeed, Christ is always born of the virgin mother of the world. Every master practices sexual magic, and speaking in a symbolical sense, we can affirm that within the womb of the priestess wife, the Christ is born. The emblems, symbols, and dramas of the birth of the gods are always the same. The god Mithra was born on December 24th at midnight, like Jesus. The name of the birthplace of Jesus, Bethlehem, comes from the name of God of the Babylonians and Germans, who named their son God Bel or Belino. This was intended to signify the reality of a man who had incarnated the Son Christ. The goddesses, Isis, Juno, Demeter, Ceres, Vesta, Maya, were personified in the mother of the Hierophant Jesus. The Hebrew Mary was a great initiate. Every occultist knows this. All these goddess mothers can rightly represent the Divine Mother Kundalini, from whom the universal word of life is always born. All the saints, martyrs, virgins, angels, cherubim, seraphim, archangels, powers, virtues, thrones, are the demigods, titans, goddesses, sylphs, cyclops, and messengers of the gods themselves but now with new names. The religious principles are always the same. The religious forms may change, but the principles don't change, because there is only one religion, the universal religion. The ancient convents of nuns resurfaced in a new form but with the misfortune that the medieval priests, not knowing the great arcanum, only used the priestesses for fornication. If the priests had known the great arcanum, the priestesses would have fulfilled a great mission, and the priests would have attained profound realization. Then the Roman Catholic form would not have degenerated, and Christic esotericism would now be resplendent in all temples. Gnostic Christic esotericism will replace the Catholic form in the new age of Aquarius, and the human being will venerate the ineffable gods. Perfect matrimony is the religious path of the new age. It is impossible to incarnate the cosmic Christ without sexual magic. Love is the most elevated religion. God is love. The hour to deeply comprehend the profound meaning of that which is called love has arrived. Indeed, love is the only type of energy that can totally Christify us. Sex is the sunstone. Sex is the cornerstone upon which we must build the temple for the Lord. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Matthew 21 verse 42 This is precisely the stone rejected by infrasexuals who boast of being perfect. It is indeed something marvelous that this stone, considered taboo or sinful, or simply an instrument of pleasure, is placed as the cornerstone of the temple. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God, the magus regnum or kingdom of magic, will be taken from you, and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Matthew 21 verses 43 to 44. Sex is the foundation stone of the family, because the family would not exist without it. Sex is the foundation stone of man, because man would not come into existence without it. Sex is the foundation stone of the universe, because the universe would not exist without it. The sexual energy of the third logos flows from the center of every nebula and from the vortex of every atom. When that energy stops flowing from the center of Earth, this planet will become a corpse. The sexual energy of the third logos has three modes of expression. 1. Reproduction of the species. 2. Evolution of the human race. 3. Spiritual development. The kundalini is the same type of energy with which the third logos elaborates all the elements of Earth. In nature, there are three types of energy. First, that of the Father, second, that of the Son, third, that of the Holy Spirit. In India, the Father is Brahma, the Son is Vishnu, and the Holy Spirit is Shiva. The force of the Holy Spirit must return inward and upward. It is urgent that the sexual forces be sublimated to the heart. In this magnetic center, such forces are mixed with the forces of the Son in order to ascend to the superior worlds. Only the one who attains the complete development of the Kundalini is totally Christified. Only the one who is Christified can incarnate the Father. The Son is one with the Father, and the Father is one with the Son. No one reaches the Father but through the Son. Thus it is written, The forces of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend to later return inward and upward. This is law. The energies of the Holy Spirit descend to the sexual organs. Those of the Son descend to the heart, and those of the Father to the mind. 
we return with the energies of the Holy Spirit, and on that return, there are marvelous encounters. In the heart, we encounter the Christ, and in the mind, the Father. These encounters signify an inward and upward return. This is how we pass beyond the fourth, fifth, and sixth dimensions of space. Then we liberate ourselves completely. Much has been said about the Hierophant Jesus, but, in reality, nobody knows his personal biography. There is the tendency to castrate the Hierophant Jesus. Christian sects depict an infrasexual Jesus, effeminate, weak but sometimes angry like a capricious lady. Naturally, all of this is absurd. The fact is that nobody knows the personal life of Jesus because we do not have his biography. Only with the faculties of objective clairvoyance can we study the life of Jesus in the Akashic records of nature. The Akasha is a subtle agent that penetrates and permeates all of space. All the events of the earth and its races, the life of Jesus, etc., are written as an eternal and living film in the Akasha. This medium even permeates the air. By the end of this century, radio television science will have instruments adequate enough to see the Akashic records. Then, people will study the personal life of the Hierophant Jesus with this equipment. We already know that all movement is relative, and that there is only one constant, this is the speed of light. Light travels at a certain constant velocity. With their lenses, astronomers perceive stars that have already ceased to exist. What they see and even photograph of these stars is the memory, the Akasha. Many of these stars are so distant that the light coming from them could have begun its journey before the formation of the world. This slowness of light, this constant, may really make it possible to invent certain special instruments with which the past can be seen. None of this is impossible. With a very special telescope, with a very special radio television device, it's possible to capture sounds and light, events and happenings that have occurred on our Earth since the formation of the world. Science will achieve this very soon, at the end of this century. Then, it will be possible to write the biography of Jesus. In the astral body, Gnostics study the Akashic records whenever it is necessary. We know the life of the great master, and we know that Jesus was really a complete man in the fullest sense of the word. Jesus had a priestess wife because he was not an infrasexual. Jesus' wife was a complete lady adept, endowed with great secret powers. Jesus traveled through Europe and was a member of a Mediterranean mystery school. Jesus studied in Egypt and practiced sexual magic with his priestess inside a pyramid. That is how he recapitulated initiations and later achieved the Venustic initiation. Jesus traveled through Persia, India, etc. Thus, the great master was a full master in the complete sense of the word. The four gospels are indeed four texts of alchemy and white magic. Initiation begins with transmutation of the water of life, semen, into the wine of light of the alchemist. This miracle is performed at the wedding of Cana, always in wedlock. One begins to traverse the path of initiation with this miracle. The whole drama of the life, passion, and death of Jesus is as ancient as the world. This drama comes from ancient archaic religions of the past and is known in every corner of the world. This drama is applicable to Jesus and generally to all those who traverse the path of the razor's edge. That drama is not the personal life of one man. That drama is the esoteric life of all those who follow the secret path. That drama can be applied to Jesus, as well as to any other Christified initiate. Indeed, the drama of the life, passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus is a cosmic drama that existed long before the existence of the world. That drama is known in all the worlds of infinite space. The four Gospels can only be understood with the key of sexual magic and perfect matrimony. The four Gospels were only written to serve as a guide to the few who follow the path of the razor's edge. The four Gospels were never written for the multitudes. The work of adapting the cosmic drama to the New Age was marvelous. Secret groups of initiates took part in this work. They did a splendid job. When profane people study the Gospels, they misinterpret them. Jesus had the heroism to assimilate the Christic substance in all his internal vehicles. He achieved this by working with Henri Fire. This is how the Hierophant was able to be one with the Father. Jesus became a Christ and ascended to the Father. Everyone who assimilates the Christic substance physiologically, biologically, psychologically, and spiritually becomes a Christ. Therefore, Christ is not some kind of human or divine individual. Christ is a cosmic substance contained throughout the whole of infinite space. We need to form Christ within us. This is only possible within re-fire. Christ cannot do anything without the snake. 
The snake only develops, evolves, and progresses by practicing sexual magic. Whoever forms Christ becomes Christ. Only Christ can ascend to the Father. The latter is neither a human or divine individual. The Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit are substances, forces, transcendental and formidably divine energies. That is all. What happens is that people unfortunately have a marked tendency to anthropomorphize these superior types of forces. Jesus lived the drama of the Passion, but he was not the only one who lived it. Prior to him, some initiates like Hermes, Quetzalcoatl, Krishna, Orpheus, Buddha, etc., lived it. After him, a few others lived it. The drama of the Passion is cosmic. Christ and sexual magic are the synthesis of all religions, schools, and beliefs. Perfect matrimony does not harm anyone. All the priests of all religions, teachers of all schools, the worshippers of Christ, the lovers of wisdom, can traverse the path of perfect matrimony. The synthesis does not harm anyone, rather, it benefits all. This is the doctrine of the synthesis. This is the doctrine of the new era. We, the members of all schools, religions, sects, orders, etc., would do well to agree on the basis of perfect matrimony as the foundation for a new civilization based on the wisdom of the serpent. We need a new civilization based on perfect matrimony. The entire world is in crisis, and only with love can we save ourselves. We, the Gnostics, are not against any religion because this would be an absurdity. All religions are needed. All religions are diverse manifestations of the infinite universal cosmic religion. People without religion would be a serious and lamentable thing. We believe all schools and sects fulfill their mission by teaching, studying, discussing, etc. What is important, and it's fundamental, is that people follow the path of perfect matrimony. Love does not harm anyone, it doesn't hurt anyone. Gnosis is the flame from which all religions, schools, and beliefs come. Gnosis is wisdom and love. Those who believe they will achieve Christification in time and by means of evolution, reincarnating and gaining many experiences, are in fact mistaken. Those who think that way are carrying over the error from century to century, life to life. However, the reality is that in the end they will be lost in the abyss. We the Gnostics do not deny the law of evolution. We only state that this law does not Christify anyone. The laws of evolution and involution are purely mechanical laws of nature that proceed simultaneously in the whole great laboratory of nature. Many organisms, many species are a product of involution, and many other organisms and species are a product of evolution. Attributing to evolution aspects virtues and qualities it does not have, is serious. Evolution does not Christify anybody. Whoever wants Christification needs the revolution of consciousness. This is only possible by working with the grain. We must clarify that the work with the grain has three completely defined lines. First, to be born. Second, to die. Third, to sacrifice for the poor suffering humanity. To be born is a completely sexual problem. To die is a matter of sanctity. Sacrifice for humanity is Christ's centrism. The angel must be born within us. It is born from his sexual seed. Satan must die. This is a matter of sanctity. We must give our life so that others may live. This is Christ's centrism. The Hierophant Jesus really lived the drama of the Passion, just as it is written. Even though we are really miserable worms of the earth, we also need to live the whole drama of the Passion. Jesus was the son of a Roman soldier and a Hebrew woman. The great Hierophant was of medium stature and with fair skin, lightly tanned by the rays of the sun. The great master had black hair and a beard of the same color. His eyes were like two ineffable nights. The word Nazarene comes from Nazar, meaning man with a straight nose. Jesus did not have a curved, Jewish-type nose. The great master had a straight nose. This is characteristic of the white European race. Jesus was only Jewish on the side of the Hebrew Mary. However, on his father's side, he was of the white Celtic race. His father was a Roman soldier. The priestess wife of the master Jesus was also of the white race and had great esoteric powers as she demonstrated when traveling with the Nazarene through the Mediterranean countries and the lands of Europe. Jesus was a complete man. Jesus was not the castrated one that many religions depict. Jesus followed the path of perfect matrimony. Jesus formed the Christ within himself by practicing sexual magic with his wife. What we are stating will scandalize fanatics but when scientists have the Akashic records of nature in their power, people will see that we were right because they will be able to see for themselves the life of Jesus by means of ultra-modern television, 
it doesn't matter what name will be given to those devices in that age. The whole history of the world will be known through the Akashic Records, the lives of all the great beings, the complete history of Cleopatra and Mark Antony, etc. Time is passing and the facts will confirm our statements. While we were completing these 33 chapters of the perfect matrimony, we have been informed that the great master Jesus is in the western United States. The great master walks the streets anonymously and unknown. He dresses as any citizen, and nobody knows him. A tremendous flow of Christic energy comes from him, and is dispersed throughout all of America. The great master still conserves the same body he had in the Holy Land. Indeed, the great Hierophant Jesus resurrected on the third day from among the dead, and still lives with his physical body. Jesus achieved resurrection through the elixir of long life. Jesus received the elixir of long life because he was crucified. Jesus was crucified. Jesus was crucified because he followed the path of perfect matrimony. We close these 33 chapters by stating that in the center of the four ways called religion, science, art, and philosophy is found the supreme synthesis. This is the perfect matrimony. Conclusion My beloved brothers and sisters of the Gnostic movement, we have concluded these course of esoteric teaching, and I was thinking of ending these meetings in order to enter now into a recess. But I see that these meetings are a spiritual necessity for all of us, and that's why I believe it's best that we continue meeting on the 27th of each month. This is what I said on July 27, 1961, in the home of a distinguished man of science. At that time, I had finished the perfect matrimony and had simultaneously concluded a course of esoteric sexual teaching that I had delivered to a group of Gnostic Rosicrucian students. The reason I thought of terminating the esoteric meetings in Mexico was disenchantment. In the beginning, the meeting room was full of people. Everyone enjoyed studying the mysteries of sex and the path of perfect matrimony. Afterward, as time passed, people were no longer interested in perfect matrimony or sexual magic. After two years of meetings, the esotericists attending these meetings could be counted on the fingers of one hand. Under those circumstances, I considered that it was useless to continue giving lectures. My intention was to end the lectures and meetings that night. Nevertheless, something remarkable occurred that night. I was filled with an immense grandiose and sublime love. My heart was filled with pain upon remembering the thought of leaving them alone. It was then that I resolved not to terminate the meetings and to continue on with the few. When I returned to my home, I received a telepathic message from the temple of Chapultepec. I was commanded to leave the house and to immediately go to the forest of Chapultepec. I obeyed the command and left the house heading toward that marvelous forest, which the master Hui Rakocha speaks of in his novel, Rosy Cross. Chapultepec Castle was shining marvelously with its thousands of little lights. The avenues and central stairway were deserted, and the doors were hermetically locked. To enter the forest of Chapultepec during the midnight hours is difficult because guards and police are alert and vigilant. Therefore, it could happen that if some Gnostic Rosicrucian student were to venture into the forest, he could be mistaken for a thief. The zeal of the guards is great because there are immense treasures in Chapultepec Castle. Let's remember the dinnerware of Emperor Maximilian, all solid gold, and the colonial treasures contained in the palace halls. This is the most magnificent palace in Mexico. To narrate how I was able to enter the forest of Chapultepec at midnight is not important. The fact is that I entered, that is all. I walked along the avenue, turning at the hill of Chapultepec, continuing in the direction of the fountains constructed by President Madero. The path was deserted, and the night dark. I spent some time waiting for a prearranged signal. It seemed like a very long time to me, however, finally someone arrived who spoke on my behalf, and everything was arranged. The superior adept of the temple commanded me to enter, and without further ado, I went in. The temple is situated inside the hill of Chapultepec. In other times, this temple was visible to the Aztecs but afterward, with the arrival of the Spaniards, the temple entered the Jin state. The empire of light and faith of the Nahuas is within this temple. Two guardians, holding unsheathed swords, guard the entrance, and nobody is able to enter without superior orders. That was a night of immense happiness for me. The temple was filled with a light of immaculate whiteness. It was light imbibed with life and spirit, light that casts no shadows. This light was coming from a chalice-like monstrance. Wrapped within such a light, the soul feels filled with a truly indescribable happiness. An angel penetrated the temple with me, 
and took a seat. The superior adept of the temple showed us some very beautiful paintings filled with life and movement. These paintings are very abundant in the White Lodges. Franz Hartmann commented on these types of paintings in his book entitled, With the Adepts, which he saw in a Rosicrucian temple in Bohemia. The figures in these kinds of pictures are full of life and movement. This is called the royal art of nature. The superior of the temple, noticing our admiration for the paintings, addressed the angel and then me, saying, You are forbidden to touch these paintings. The angel faithfully obeyed the command. I frankly felt tempted to touch them, they were so beautiful. A severe reminder from the master, given in time, was sufficient. I have already told you, sir, that you are forbidden to touch these paintings. I excused myself by answering, certainly, I do not intend to touch them. That night, the temple shone with ineffable glory. It is impossible to describe such beauty with human words. The roof, the walls, were all made of solid gold. Nonetheless, something filled me with amazement. I had heard so much about theosophy, Rosicrucianism, Hermeticism, Yoga, etc., and now here, in the midst of a gymnastic Rosicrucian temple, was only a small group of ladies and gentlemen who, like me, had also been invited to the gathering in the temple. I remembered the lecture halls of some professors of occultism, always filled with thousands of people. I remembered the temples of the world, filled with thousands of human beings. I remembered lodges that called themselves Rosicrucian with their millions of affiliates. And now, here in the midst of an authentic temple of the White Lodge, the few who were present could be counted on the fingers of one hand. Then I understood everything. At first, many people came to our esoteric meetings. As time passed, the number who attended notably decreased, and now only a few thirsty for wisdom and love were coming to us. When I understood this, I spontaneously exclaimed, The temples, lodges, and schools of the world are always filled with many people because Satan enticed them. However, only few are those who come into the temples of true divine wisdom. This is how I spoke, with a voice that amazed me, and when I spoke, I noticed the superior of the temple was nodding in approval. Then he said, It is so, Satan enticed them. Immediately after having confirmed my words, the master commanded the angel to ascend to the choir of musicians and singers to sing. The angel obeyed, and after having ascended to the choir, he sang the history of the centuries in opera. The angel, from the doctrinal point of view, placed himself mentally in the time of the future fifth round of planetary evolution. In that future age, the physical chemical earth will be nothing more than a cadaver, a new moon. Then, all evolving life will develop within the ethereal plane, or ethereal region of our earth. The seven root races of flesh and bone will no longer exist, they will have become extinct. The angel sang with a voice so ineffable and sweet that it resembled Mozart's magic flute. My whole being went into ecstasy. To hear an angel sing is something you can never forget in your life. The angel, situated mentally in the future earth of the fifth round, narrated in opera the history of terrestrial evolution. He mentioned all the prophets who have been sent to the earth. With a melodious voice, he narrated the history of the seven root races of the world, the apocalypse of the present fifth root race, the continents that existed in the past and their general destruction, the great cataclysms of the earth, the great wars, the superhuman efforts that had been made by the great avatars to save humanity, the crucifixion of the martyr of Golgotha, etc. Subsequently, he lamented with pain the few who had been saved. Only a few had managed to be born as angels. The rest, the great majority of human beings, were swallowed up by the abyss. From the billions of souls that entered evolution and involution on the planet Earth, only a handful of creatures were fit for the angelic state. For many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 22 verse 14 When the angel reached this part of his ineffable opera, I felt profoundly moved and amazed. Frankly, I had believed that the case of only a few being saved, and the great majority being lost, could only occur on Earth and in the past Mahamantara of the earth moon, but that things would be different on the rest of the worlds. The angel disabused me of this error when he said, and what happened on earth will always be repeated on all the worlds of infinite space. When the angel finished his ineffable song, I understood why so many people had attended my meetings, and why only a few of the many who began remained with me. Now I am willing to continue with the few. I am no longer interested in having a room full of people. Indeed, Many are they who begin but few are those who last. Perfect matrimony is the path of the razor's edge. To affiliate oneself with a school, lodge, order, etc. is something very easy. 
to study yoga, hermeticism, philosophy, astrology, is very beautiful and easy, but to be born as an angel is something terribly difficult. The angel has to be born from the sexual seed. Precisely therein lies the difficulty. The wheat seed germinates easily. Indeed, many seeds are lost but the majority germinate and become ears of grain with which the multitudes are nourished. To saw corn seeds is also something easy. Many seeds are lost but the great majority are not. They germinate and produce corn. Angel seeds are the most difficult. Man carries this seed in his sexual glands and very rarely does it germinate. We have concluded this book, emphatically affirming that only with perfect matrimony can we achieve the germination of this seed and give birth to the fruit. This fruit is the angel. Here is where the problem and the difficulty lie. It so happens that people think belonging to this or that faith, to such and such religion, or to one or another sect, they are already saved. Naturally, this is false. A seed never germinates because of what a person believes or stops believing. An insect is never born because of what a human being thinks or stops thinking. A man is never born from the parchment of theory. This question is sexual, and in this, the angel is no exception. Members of all religions, schools, sects, and beliefs say, for many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 22 verse 14 People from all over the world repeat it, and presume, as is normal, that they are the chosen ones. Nobody considers himself lost. They believe that with their belief, theory, study, etc., they are already saved. However, this is false and absurd because the problem of being born cannot be the result of beliefs, theories, or concepts. The reality is different. To be born is a totally sexual problem. Sexual magic is taught in the esoteric heart of the great religions. Unfortunately, people do not investigate it, they do not inquire. That is the problem. People do not like sexual magic because it means the sacrifice of oneself, of one's animal passions. Rare is the one who can be truly steadfast in sexual magic. Many begin with curiosity but after a few days they can't take it anymore and then give themselves over to fornication. Those are the weak, who later go about saying that sexual magic is harmful. Those are the degenerated seeds that do not germinate. Sex is the path that leads human beings to final liberation. If someone thinks a different path might exist for the self-realization, he is obviously totally mistaken. This is the law for all continents, worlds, and spaces. We will talk now a little about Selene. Certainly, today the moon is a cadaver. However, before it died, it was a world that had very beautiful seas, lush vegetation, all kinds of people, etc. Unfortunately, the lunar multitudes became demons. Only a small handful of human creatures achieved practical adepthood. On our planet Earth, the outcome will be the same. Only a small group of people will be born as angels. We can affirm without fear of error that the humanity of Earth will be swallowed up by the abyss. Theosophists are mistaken when they affirm that all human beings will reach liberation. This concept is not accepted by the White Lodge because it is false. Those who think they will be saved by believing in something or other are mistaken. This concept is false. Those who believe they can be saved with the Bellows system of pranayama and philosophy are mistaken. Nobody can save himself without being born, and nobody can be born without sex. I have concluded this book with immense sorrow for humanity. It is lamentable that the abyss swallows up so many people. I write with pain because I know humanity does not accept perfect matrimony. I conclude this book perfectly convinced that those who truly know how to take advantage of it are very few. People do not like these things. Everyone thinks they can save themselves with their particular belief, religion, order, or school and there is no way of convincing them they are mistaken. In the future fifth round, all those who do not accept perfect matrimony will become demons, inhabitants of the abyss. In the future fifth round, those who accept perfect matrimony will be angels. We are at the end of the Aryan race. We are beginning to live the apocalypse of St. John. Millions of human beings are entering the abyss. These poor people enter the abyss convinced they are doing very well. They believe they are already the chosen ones, and that their beliefs have saved them. That is what they believe, and there is no way to prove the contrary to them. This is how they submerge themselves into the abyss where, after many millions of years, they disintegrate slowly until becoming cosmic dust. That is the second death. We conclude this book by stating, only the one who becomes an angel is saved. The angel must be born within us. To be born is an absolutely sexual problem, and the only path is perfect matrimony.